Action and the Atlantic Council, it's great to have you virtually and in person. This one-day symposium will bring thought leaders across the space together and help us bridge the gaps between national security, defense, and autonomy. Please welcome to the stage the co-founders of Applied Intuition, CEO Kasser Yunus, and CTO Peter Ludwig. Good morning. I'm good morning. I'm Kasser Yunus, co-founder and CEO of Applied Intuition. And I am Peter Ludwig, co-founder and CTO of Applied Intuition. On behalf of the Applied Intuition team, located in Silicon Valley, Los Angeles, Detroit, Munich, Stockholm, Tokyo, Seoul, and right here in Washington, D.C., welcome to Nexus 22. We're thrilled to join you at, uh, at the National Press Club uh, in the heart of our nation's capital. For those of you who don't know, Applied Intuition is a technology company focused on accelerating the development of autonomous systems for all use cases, including defense, automotive, and aviation. We are a company of engineers and researchers who are working at the forefront of some of the most sophisticated autonomous systems on the planet. We're here today to bring together diverse voices uh, at the nexus of autonomy and defense. The conversation is an important one because our security environment and our adversaries are evolving rapidly. We must develop, test, and field technologies with enough speed for our institutions to succeed in this new environment. There is no one clear answer to these challenges, and today we will hear different perspectives. Our keynote speakers, panelists, and moderators are some of the most influential voices in the ecosystem. Our attendees include congressional staffers, think tanks and academia, defense department officials, intelligence community, defense contractors, and leading technology companies. We would like to thank our partners at the Atlantic Council's Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security, who work to develop nonpartisan strategies to address the most important security challenges facing the United States and the world. A few housekeeping tips. This event is public and on the record. Uh, we encourage you to post questions throughout each of the panel's uh, discussions by emailing them to asknexus22 at gmail.com. Our moderators will try to ask as many of your questions as possible. Virtual attendees can also submit questions through the Hopin platform. And finally, don't forget to follow the conversation on Twitter via the hashtags Nexus22 and Forward Defense. Without further ado, it's our pleasure to open Nexus22 with a video message from Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, former White House National Security Advisor and Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm H.R. McMaster. It's great to be with you. You know, the exponential growth we're seeing in data is already contributing to security, defense, economic development, and a range of efforts from you know, the reduction of carbon emissions to natural disaster response. To take full advantage of, of that opportunity, these opportunities associated with the data available requires asking the right questions, accessing accurate, authoritative, and transferable data, and of course, applying analytical tools to generate situational understanding and help us make decisions and take action. That is why I'm enthusiastic about what artificial intelligence capabilities can do to overcome some of the most critical challenges we are facing and, and help us build a better future. Some more specific applications include obviously early warning of hostile actions by enemies and adversaries who possess long-range missile and rocket capabilities such as we are seeing in Russia's indiscriminate bombardment of residential areas. But this capability also applies to, to North Korea and Iran. It applies to Houthi rebels in Yemen, to Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, or Hamas in Gaza. These capabilities can help us understand better sources of carbon emissions that are accelerating global warming so we can prioritize actions to save the planet for future generations. We need artificial intelligence and the analytical tools associated with it to provide warning of and track the development of natural disasters from tsunamis to, to hurricanes to tornadoes to droughts and, and wildfires. Of course, we need to, to track, respond to, and provide relief to humanitarian catastrophes, such as the catastrophe in Ukraine, but also the humanitarian catastrophe in, in Afghanistan today. Uh, we need, uh, of course, to, to identify aggression early 
to deter it. And of course, this applies to our inability to deter conflict in Ukraine, but also the need to deter conflict in, in other areas like Taiwan. And of course, we have to be able to respond to it quickly and to, to maintain situational understanding, identify patterns of adversary and enemy activity, and, and perhaps more importantly, to anticipate pattern breaks. Of course, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is a case in point, uh, as is the intensification of ISIS actions, for example, across northern Iraq and eastern Syria, or how about jihadist terrorist activities in, in the Maghreb? And of course, we need to be able to share data and the situational understanding it underpins in an unclassified format and with many partners, uh, and potentially in a GPS-denied environment. So this is a great conference. I hope that the conversations uh, that you're going to have uh, can help all of us understand better the promise of AI-related technologies and especially how to apply them to overcome challenges, exploit opportunities, and build a better future. Thanks for the opportunity to, to be with you. Have a great conference. Thank you, General McMaster, for that insightful perspective. It's a helpful preview of some of the main themes we'll be diving into today. To start it off, I'm pleased to introduce our first panel of the day, discussing what U.S. strategic competitors are doing to accelerate defense technologies, including autonomy, and how the threat landscape is evolving. Please welcome to the stage Josh Rogan, a columnist at the Washington Post, who will moderate this panel. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you. My name is Josh Rogan. I'm with the Washington Post. It's my real pleasure to be with you here this morning, uh, mostly because it means that your industry has not yet found a way to replace my job with automation. <laughs> and if you're working on that right now, stop that. Don't do that. Um, I'm, we have an expert panel to deal with this issue tonight, but let me just frame the conversation very briefly. You know, from the amateur's perspective, it seems that uh, automation and artificial intelligence and the technologies that are uh, being developed around it are moving faster than our ability as a policy community, much less as a media community, to understand much less, oversee much less, uh, um, mitigate the risks of the implications of these new and emerging uh, um, industries and technologies and their impacts on national security and foreign policy and human rights, etc. Uh, nevertheless, there are a lot of people working hard on this issue. Uh, very recently, I think what we're going to start with is some reflections on what we learned from the latest and ongoing crisis in our national security world, the Russia invasion of Ukraine. And I don't know about you guys, but I was pretty surprised to discover that this was actually being fought as a quite a 20th century kind of conflict. And despite all of the advances, despite all of the warnings, it's really coming down to tanks and human beings and their ability to fight the tanks. And, you know, when I think about that, I think, why is it that Vladimir Zelensky has better uh, internet in Kiev than we have in Washington, D.C. How is it possible that even the um, unmanned systems are basically human-driven and human-guided? And what does that tell us about uh, Russia and its progress on this issue? And then we're going to move quickly to the country that's probably not going to be so 20th century if and when it uh, starts the next conflict, which is the People's Republic of China. And what does it mean to have a peer competitor that's integrated with our economy that uh, uh, is perhaps a peer competitor in this industry, if not surpassing us? And what does it mean that we've spent 20 years uh, helping the Chinese government and the Chinese companies build the industries that are now poised to help their military that's pointed against us? And how do we manage different priorities in American foreign policy, one being our national security and the security of our citizens and their privacy and their human rights and the human rights of citizens all over the world against our basic desire for openness and interconnectedness and our financial interest in building the industries of the future in a way that is collaborative. And I couldn't have asked for a better panel to speak to that tonight. Let me briefly introduce them. We have Gregory Allen, the director of the AI Governance Project and a senior fellow in the Strategic Technologies Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Until two months ago, he was director of strategy and policy at the DOD Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, where I, as far as I know, one of the most recent top defense officials to actually travel uh, to China and speak with uh, dozens of Chinese officials and experts about this very issue. Um, 
sitting next to him. Excuse me a second. Liza Tobin. Right, Liza? Excellent. I had a 50-50 chance, thank you. The Senior Director for Economy and Special Competitive Studies Project at the, not on my paper. The Special Competitive Studies Yes, where is that housed? Crystal City. Crystal City, okay, excellent. And, uh, and uh, next we have August Cole, a former Wall Street Journal. Apologies for my in, uh, paper here. August Cole, a former Wall Street Journal. This is a great advertisement for digital you're yeah, giving us you. right thank now. You. Thank you for filling me empty space, Gregory. A non-resident fellow at the Scowcroft Center at Strategy and Security at the Atlantic Council, and an uh, author, and of course, Rita Kunayev, a non-resident senior fellow in the forward defense practice of the Atlantic Council's Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security. Okay, I'm gonna ask each of you to give us your three minutes, your tightest three minutes, uh, on what I've just laid out. What is it? What does the current conflict tell us about the status of AI and automation in modern warfare? And what will the next conflict, potentially with China, how will that be different? Let me start with you, Gregory. Well, uh, thank you all for joining us here today. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'll start with the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, Josh described this as a 20th century conflict. I think there are elements of that are, that are true. We haven't seen a conflict on this scale uh, in quite a long time. But many aspects of this conflict really highlight what has been changing in the 21st century. Unmanned systems and remotely piloted systems and autonomous systems were all sort of the sorts of things that some had argued were not going to be a part of a high intensity fight, that they were only going to be relevant to counterinsurgency conflicts. I think that myth has been blown wide open. But what we've only seen is the first move in which there will always be counter moves. So a lot of the unmanned systems that we're seeing in use in this conflict that have been really remarkably effective are, as Josh said, remotely piloted. There have been some claims of Russia using AI-enabled autonomous weapon systems. I've reviewed the same evidence of that, and I don't find them to be credible. But we do know that this is an area that Russia is going, and just in the last couple weeks, uh, Russian military organizations have been discussing in Russian language press exactly how that's the direction that they want to be going. And as I said before, this is the first in a series of technology military steps with moves and counter moves. A lot of those counter moves are going to be taking away the remotely piloted aspect of the system. As more electronic warfare systems get introduced into this conflict, as more other UAV countermeasures come into the conflict, the pressure on all sides to go towards increasingly autonomous systems, that's what we should expect from the next stage. Um, just to talk briefly on the Chinese side of this equation, as Josh said, I've traveled to China a lot, both before I was a DOD government official uh, and also while I was at the DOD. And I sat next to a senior Chinese weapons executive uh, at a conference like this one in which he addressed an audience that was global and said, in the future, there will be no people fighting in wars, and that is the direction that my company is working to build, talking about his autonomous systems development efforts. I'll stop there. If you, thank you. Uh, Liza, uh, give us your perspective on each of these. Thanks so much, Josh. It's great to be here. So I think given that my background is mainly in China policy, I'll focus my remarks kind of on the broader context of China's technology strategy and how this applies to autonomy. And I think it's important to always understand the Chinese strategy in this context of economic and technological and military developments happening in tandem and really being inextricably linked. So I think, um, you know, in recent years, there really has been kind of a misunderstanding in the U.S., at least in Washington, among policymakers about China's technology strategy. And I think in some cases, this has meant that Washington has been somewhat slow to respond to the nature and the stakes of this contest with China over technology. Um, for a long time, we in the China watching community sort of discounted the idea, the notion that China could innovate. And I know that sounds somewhat quaint in 2022, given the challenges we face, but that indeed was the case for years. We were really focused on China stealing and um, you know, copying technology. And while that indeed was a problem, I think what it obscured was the 
really that the Chinese Communist Party is trying to do something new with technology, and fundamentally, this is political. The Chinese Communist Party believes that its system of governance offers certain advantages over Western-style democracy and capitalism, namely the ability to marshal state resources towards major state projects, including an autonomy, and then also a view of technology that prioritizes the needs of the state over the needs of the individuals. Now, Xi Jinping is a good Marxist, and sometimes when he talks about history, he says, um, we are seeing changes not seen in a century. And of course, he's talking about things like the centers of global power and the global economy shifting from east to west. But also, he's talking about new frontiers emerging in fields like space, um, autonomy, biotech, uh, things like that. And, and the party has, has determined that it is not only an opportunity, but there's a necessity here for China to be on the leading edge of these emerging domains. Now, uh, what does this have to do with autonomy? Well, the crux of the issue with autonomy, of course, right now is data, who can harness the most data. Now in the future, maybe in a few years, we'll have this conference and we'll be talking about synthetic data. But for now, I think the party is somewhat ahead of our political leadership here in elevating the importance of data in their national strategy and in investment. And I think uh, going forward, we need to understand uh, the, the political nature here and that they're really kind of throwing down the gauntlet and saying our system is better at exploiting this data and coming up with innovation not only to drive economic development but also uh, advances in military use technology. Um, and so, you know, I think it, it certainly remains to be seen whether they will succeed. Fundamentally, I'm an optimist about our system and our advantages, but I think the outcome is not guaranteed. Excellent, thank you. August. Well, as someone whose career started, uh, you know, chasing down facts and evolved into making stuff up, I offer, you know, this uh, <laughs> these comments with a lot of humility, sitting in the National Press Club. Um, but I think what I would what I would say, Josh, is, you know, with the conflict in Ukraine. I think it has really underscored you know, how important these kinds of technologies we're here to talk about today are to the next 20 years of conflict. That even if we are going to debate, you know, even what, do you, what is artificial intelligence? Like this is an active debate in the US right now in the tech community, the DOD itself. Um, we have a lot of big foundational you know, aspects we have to address. Uh, at the same time, you look at the tactical situation in Ukraine and you can see how vital and how much of that conflict actually almost rests upon a foundation of AI type capabilities, whether it's crowdfunding, whether it's using the sorts of uh, algorithmic uh, refinement for targeting and electronic warfare and all the stuff that happens behind a very you know, thick curtain. We know that at the same time you have trenches and artillery, code is fundamental to this conflict. So when you look across the Pacific to what we might expect with China in the late 2020s, perhaps sooner, perhaps later, we have to, I think, have that same tension in mind we have to understand where the big pieces that we're still trying to move around in our country and where they are trying to move around there as well. You know, as someone who's, who's you know, trying constantly to think credibly about what's coming, it's very hard to get things right. And I don't know that we have to always do so, but how we go about doing that is vital. And the one thing I think I would say, especially when you look at the missed opportunities in understanding what was gonna happen in Afghanistan, what was gonna happen in Ukraine, is to really hone in on the human aspects of these conflicts. It's very easy to get focused on policy. Specifically, it's easy to get focused on technologies, like we're looking at uh, with China, uh, and really try to remind ourselves that, A, there are, you know, conflict is a human experience, even if it is shaped and evolving with, of course, and, and through technology. But fundamentally, that ability to practice good foresight and really get it, like what's coming, what elements are gonna be present today, in the future and beyond, comes down to that, that foundational, I think, point of view. Excellent, thank you. Rita? Excuse me, August, I feel like you set me up with the sentence of trying to see what's right because as somebody who's been studying the Russian military and focusing on technological innovation and military modernization in Russia, I feel like I've gotten a lot of things wrong. And uh, if you are looking at the performance of the Russian military right now, it was very difficult to tell that the last decade and a half has been, in fact, dedicated to significant reforms that focused on professionalization, that focused on new equipment, um, autonomous capabilities, uh, a lot of robotics, unmanned systems, electronic warfare, AI for command and control, 
information, cyber warfare, there were grand expectations and we have not seen them pan out. So it is bringing a point of reflection for the community that has you know, been studying uh, Russia, both from the open source, and you know, I'm a native Russian speaker, I follow the sources you know, from the horse's mouth, let's say it like that, um, as well as uh, the fact that a lot of the more classified intelligence was also pointing that way. So if we're looking over the past now almost three months, what are some of the I guess, early lessons learned that we can uh, take away to better understand how we got some of these things quite wrong. And I'm going to make the first unpopular point by saying that we are often conflating concepts and technologies that are in the conceptualization, research and development stages to what is already out there, to let alone what is battle tested, battle ready, and battle proven. There's a marketing element to it. There's a tendency to rely on the companies that are advancing these and selling these. And there's a tendency to repeat uh, what we are hearing from the sources themselves. And I think we need to be increasingly more skeptical. And that is a point that is relevant for journalists, for analysts, and for intelligence uh, you know, observers themselves. And that is something that I think is also very critical for understanding China, where China is, and where China is going. And not only just what they're thinking on what is the strategy, but what is actually already ready to go and ready to be used. The second point I think also builds on the human element uh, issue is the difference between innovation and integration. Innovation and adoption. What we're seeing right now is that the technical barriers to innovation are really not the most significant barrier to the use and scaling and integration of some of these sophisticated and advanced technologies and operations. A lot of it has to do with institutional, bureaucratic, cultural, human trust issues, trust let alone between humans and machines, but between the humans themselves, civil military relations, those barriers are not technical in nature, they're not technological, but they are indeed very human and very societal and institutional, and we have to keep them in mind. Uh, finally, on a technological point, for every investment we are making in autonomy and every investment we are making in AI, we have to be thinking about how to counter those capabilities. So. The fact that the Ukrainian military is able to inflict such massive damage with quite rudimentary and relatively cheap drones is significant. And perhaps the United States would have been more prepared for such you know, attacks uh, through integrated defenses, better electronic warfare capabilities. But by all assessments, Russia had some of the most sophisticated electronic warfare capabilities in the world, and they are unable to deter or defend against that threat. So we have to be thinking about countering autonomy and countering AI going forward. When we're looking about what's next for Russia in its modernization efforts and its efforts to get its tanks out of the Ukrainian mud and out of the hands of the Ukrainian farmers, uh, it's hard to tell. Um, I'm a little worried about the pendulum swinging to a point where we completely underestimate uh, what comes next from the Russian perspective. It's useful to remember it is still in nuclear power uh, with a decent amount still of conventional capabilities. So keeping that in mind. And the relationship between Russia and China is also going to be very interesting and complicated, but not only Russia and China, but also Russia and India and Russia and Israel from the technological alignment perspective. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Fascinating to uh, start to apply the lessons learned from uh, what we see in Russia and Ukraine to the larger problem because we can be sure that our adversaries are uh, doing the exact same analysis. And that brings us perfectly to our first round of questions. Before I get to that, I'd like to just let you know in the audience that we will have some time for audience questions. And if, you're, if you would like to submit one, the way to do it is by emailing asknexus22 at gmail.com or by using uh, the app. So you can start to enter those uh, now, and uh, we'll get to a couple of those in just a bit. Uh, but uh, Rita, your, your segue actually leads us perfectly back to Gregory because uh, he has done some of the most important work on China's AI strategy. And uh, if you haven't read this document yet, I encourage you to read it after the panel. 
Uh, I made the mistake of reading it last night, and then I was so scared I couldn't go to sleep. Uh, it's some pretty shocking stuff, to be honest. And, you know, I want you to, first of all, uh, the thing that stuck out to me most was that the Chinese Communist Party is essentially doing two things at once. They're calling for international norms and international negotiations and international, essentially, arms control for AI in a very public and way that sounds very appealing. At the same time, they're engaging in the arms race they're protesting against simultaneously, which you know is pretty common for arms races, as it turns out. So using that as sort of a jumping off point, can you tell us what you know about the current effort to engage with the Chinese government and the US government and vice versa uh, on this issue diplomatically behind the scenes? Sure, and let me start with a, a bit of a digression. Uh, for a long time now, there's been a worldwide conversation around the unique and frankly weird uh, failure modes of machine learning AI systems. And there's been a, a, a related conversation around the ethical use of these systems. And I think what the war in, uh, the war in Ukraine reminds us is that while it is obviously a massive tragedy when there is accidental deaths, uh, accidental civilian deaths from the result of technical failures, intentional civilian deaths is still an unsolved problem on Earth. And the Russian forces are reminding us of that tragedy just about every single day. Um, so now pivoting to, to China in this kind of conversation, um, there are Chinese academics, there are uh, Chinese members of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs who have loudly been calling for arms control. One thing it would behoove everyone to remember uh, is that the Chinese system is different uh, than you, the American system. So uh, whereas our military is a part of our government, their military is a part of the Communist Party. And while they have the same boss, they have different reporting structures and different functional uh, governance structures. So all of the, the talk around um, AI arms control has thus far been coming out of uh, either academic institutions who do not speak for the government or to a lesser extent, um, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. When I was at the Department of Defense, we tried multiple times to have a conversation around military AI risk reduction with the Chinese People's Liberation Army and were refused multiple times. Um, this is a conversation that thus far they have shown no interest in engaging in, and I think that's unfortunate. Are you suggesting that the Chinese government may not be uh, genuine in its uh, pro protestations, that it really is for arms control and uh, diplomatic negotiations in this area? So I don't claim to be a mind reader. Uh, there are multiple plausible interpretations of what's going on. One is just the bureaucracies of the Chinese system disagreeing with each other. Another uh, interpretation is insincerity. Another interpretation is something else that I haven't thought of yet. Right? There's multiple possible explanations. But the fact is the United States has been taking criticism in the international community and in the press as somebody who is dragging their heels on international norms and dialogues related to military AI risk reduction, we are not the ones dragging our feet in this topic. As I said, China has refused this conversation multiple times. Very interesting, thank you. Uh, Liza, let me ask you, since you mentioned data, to explain to our audience how the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party uh, collects data, uses that data, and how they integrate their uh, corporate and military and human rights policy through AI using that data and what kind of challenge does that pose to us as competitors and also as to us as a community of free and open societies who believes that people have certain rights. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, so as I, I mentioned, they have a massive strategy called Digital China. They are, they are certainly focused on this as a uh, a new source of economic growth and innovation. Um, again, I'll come back to the fact that they're good Marxists, and um, they have actually updated their Marxist theory to add data as a fourth factor of production. And for those of you who may be a little bit rusty on your Marxist theory, the original three are land, labor, and capital. So when you put them all together in creative ways, it produces economic growth. But Unfortunately, the Chinese economy is slowing. The era of easy industrialization and demographic, demographic growth is over. And so they can't squeeze any more marginal productivity out of land, labor, and capital. Enter 
data, this new fourth factor of production. And so they are betting that this is a way out of the middle income trap and that by you know, adding data and exploiting the many benefits and opportunities of data, they can actually grow their economy in ways that we can't. So I think um, here in, in the West, we, when we talk about data, we're often talking about it in the rubric of privacy. And of course, that's very important, but it is a defensive perspective rather than this offensive perspective that the CCP is taken taking. Um, a couple of the use cases that you may be familiar with uh, from China, of course, is their so-called Digital Silk Road, which is kind of a subsidiary of the Belt and Road Initiative and is really their, their effort and their plan to control the networks, the platforms, and importantly, the standards of this emerging digital economy. And then at home, the use case, of course, is technology-enabled social control. And you see that most dramatically in Xinjiang with the internment of uh, you know, more than a million people, but really across the country, and it's, it's showing up in the COVID lockdowns. Um, and so really, you're seeing the elevation of, of political concerns being elevated over short-term economic concerns there. Excellent. Uh, August, that sort of takes me to the issue of uh, the ethics. Uh, which you talk about a lot as a former journalist, I know you covered a lot. You know, from the journalist perspective, what we see is sort of uh, the conundrum of American companies and the American government collaborating with a lot of these Chinese companies, which as we've just heard, cannot really be said to be anything but under the control of the party that wants to use the technology and the data for other means. Google built an AI center in China but refused to do an AI project with the Pentagon. Since time, uh, worked with MIT until 2019, uh, even after it was sanctioned by the US government, still had a successful IPO with the help of uh, many tech technical experts in the US uh, and around the world. IBM is partnered with dozens of Chinese cities on Smarter Cities program, which to my mind seems like a clear abuse of the technology. Hikvision, uh, the company that has built the cameras atop the concentration camp walls, that spot the Uyghurs, they've been sanctioned by the US government but funded to the brim by Wall Street. Uh, how, sh how can we understand that? And how is it that we have a system that's punishing these companies on the one hand and funding them on the other? And uh, what do you think we need to do to uh, square that circle? I mean, I think you can look at technology ethics beyond just artificial intelligence. You have to expand it to you know, what's coming with synthetic biology, for example. But as it relates to you know, AI, and particularly the consumer technologies or you know, commercial technologies that scale and allow social control, but also may aid in, imagine, the refinement of a hypersonics you know, payload vehicle. Um, you know, we're gonna, in the US, I think, need to be increasingly vigilant. And, and fundamentally, when you look at like, these ethical frameworks, whether it's for uh, the conduct of conflict, you know, laws of armed conflict, international humanitarian law, and those sorts of uh, you know, constructs. Or on the commercial side, we're gonna be asking a lot more, I think, of American leadership and our allies to make you know, ethical decisions. And I think that's a crucial point that in a period of time, particularly as we just experienced a massive body blow to valuations in the tech sector, there is gonna be a lot of pressure, especially as funding gets harder to raise for early stage companies, et cetera, to turn away from money that may not be as easy, or may be easier, I should say, than right. I would also pivot to, to the question of how we look at the ethics of AI in armed conflict, and particularly sub-threshold conflict. If you look at like a lot of the strategic conversation, whether it's in the conventional military or special operations about this kind of continuum or this contest, right, that we're setting up with China over the next 10 to 15 years, where we're gonna be engaging at the commercial level, at the cultural level, we're gonna be trying to look for advantage or ways to keep conflict from breaking out or if we get into a fight to win it quickly. That is also going to, to return to your question about the role of American companies and allies. Uh, they're gonna be involved in that conflict in ways that they may not be ready for yet. That requires at a board level, at a, at a you know, compliance level, really, really like a rich conversations that fundamentally don't allow for failure of imagination. And I think that's something that probably has to start happening sooner than most people are ready for. To, the, to piggyback just on the data comment too, if you think about what a conflict with China is gonna look like, potentially, right, in the Pacific. It's gonna be fundamentally decided by data, most likely. Yes, you know, you'll have to hold 
parts of the ocean and control them, you know, space, et cetera, undersea. But, but fundamentally, the side that can, I think, most effectively use data will be the one that prevails. So what are our rules, right? On the government side, on the industry side, what do we expect of our society when it comes to privacy, when it comes to the use of data that we can acquire on the open market? Uh, you know, you could imagine today uh, the kinds of capabilities that are, that are performed by a drone or a, you know, a satellite. Much of that can be bracketed or acquired on the open market to provide incredible levels of, levels of like fidelity or targeting, to put it you know, simply. When you're in an environment where the satellites are knocked out, and there's no drones going over the Pacific, how are you gonna find the things you need to find, the people you need to find? I'd rather have those conversations now today with a little bit of imagination and think through those outcomes so we can make the decisions that we can live with when a conflict's over. Before I move on, let me just press you on this one point because uh, as we saw in the last administration, this, a lot of this is detailed in my book, Chaos Under Heaven, available now wherever <laughs> books are sold. Uh, the Trump administration made a determined effort to name and shame American companies uh, that were seen to be aiding China's uh, effort to use American technology and know-how and capital uh, to build this AI machine that they're working on with their military. That naming and shaming had, you know, positive and negative effects to be sure. And we see the, um, to my mind, I see the Biden administration continuing some of that, although in a quite a, a different uh, manner. I'm wondering, what do you think is the solution for managing the private public uh, uh, um, cooperation on this issue on our end. Should the government be telling companies what to do? Should companies in the industry be taking it upon themselves to establish rules of corporate respon social responsibility? How's that working out? And uh, you know, how do we have a system where our institutions guard their uh, independence fiercely and rightly at the same time? This is kind of a problem that they need the federal government's help on. Yeah, that, that's a, a really thorny one, thank you. Um, <laughs> You know, I know I'm sitting here in Washington, D.C., so, uh, you know, it'd be obvious to say, well, we should regulate it. Uh, but I don't believe that. I don't think you can keep up with the, you know, vagaries of the uh, financial markets. I don't think you can keep up with the pace of innovation. Fundamentally, this is like a culture question in American business and in the technology community. That, you know, leadership comes from individual decisions, not necessarily from, you know, a, a mandate from on high. That's how China works, right? We don't want to have a system that puts us in a position where we don't allow the agility, the, the kind of freedom of action, but that has a lot of responsibility that goes with it. If companies can't, you know, uh, essentially uh, rise to that, then, then you're looking at, I think, a situation which is not just about not performing in the long term, but it imperils the security of the country. And you know, we've had, uh, you know, the 20th century, you know, much of it with a conversation about big companies making decisions that, that were in the interest of the national security of the United States. There's no reason why we can't have that again. Thank you. Uh, let me go to Rita, and then we'll come back to you. Uh, and Rita, feel free to, to continue that thread, but I also wanted to ask you to uh, apply what we've seen in, in the U.S.-Russia corporate-to-corporate uh, relationship post-Ukraine invasion. In other words, we're seeing American corporations decouple from Russian corporations. We're seeing Russian finance dry up, support for Russian companies by American finance dry up. A real startling, actually, decoupling of our two economies. Uh, as punishment, as a, a coercive method to get Vladimir Putin uh, to stop attacking Ukraine. And the obvious question is, is that something that can be applied to China? Would it even work considering the size and interconnectedness of our two economies? And from what you see in what we're doing to the Russian economy, is that working? Is that having its desired effect? And, and, uh, and feel free to also comment on what August just said. Um, as an neither an economist nor a China person. Thank you for that question. Uh, I'm just gonna you know, build on what August was saying in terms of um, whether it's a public shaming or accountability or aligning national security concerns with corporate responsibility. I think consumers have changed significantly over the past two decades. This new generation, uh, you know, whether it's millennials or Gen Z, a lot of them want to know where do they products come from, whether they're sourced responsibly. You see that in the fashion industry, you see, you see that in mining industry, you see that in all sorts of products. And I think it's important to kind of build on that momentum and not simply argue um, 
shifts from that hardcore old school national security perspective, but also from a hu fundamental human rights perspective and social accountability perspective. In the same way that we care about you know, climate change and renewals and sustainability, we should care about where the components of our phones come from and where, you know, uh, what does the technology that we're spending money on is used. In terms of um, the commercial activities and integration and decoupling from Russia, it's a much easier effort to execute because it's a smaller economy and the integration is not that significant. Uh, it's absolutely much less significant than it is with China. And it's also been declining quite rapidly since 2014. So movement in that direction is, didn't just start yesterday. Uh, what is interesting to watch is who has been replacing those ties and how Russia has been trying to effectively not necessarily insulate itself to the effect of Western sanctions because that's something that it will never be able to do, but to uh, make its economy, its technology sector, its science uh, innovation capabilities more resilient, whether it's through investment in domestic production or it's through, again, relationships with China, relationship with India, relationship with Russia, uh, with, uh, excuse me, with Israel. I just said, I just read yesterday that Yandex, uh, the CEO of Yandex, which is the Russian Google effectively, uh, who is, uh, by the way, an Israeli citizen, is uh, send a memo to the Israeli government asking about conditions and possibilities to relocate uh, the center of operations to Tel Aviv. There is already a pretty significant operation there, and now they're talking about moving their global center to Israel. That's going to complicate those types of relationships. So we got to be watching for these third order effects. So while that direct integration between Russia and the United States might have not feel as impactful because those ties are not that notable. The relationships that we have with our allies, including, you know, not to, not to, you know, um, tone in on Israel, but Israel and India and others are going to be important. And I'm just going to push back on that point that you said that the sanctions are being enforced to make Vladimir Putin to stop the war. We're actually not 100% sure that that is the end goal of the sanctions. It has not been declared that the minute that Vladimir Putin withdraws from Ukraine or withdraws from, you know, to the eastern uh, part or stops the war, that the sanctions are going to be removed. If anything, there isn't really an indication of an end date, which also kind of, you know, makes you question what is the incentive that Putin's now facing to end the war of the sanctions. There's no end to the sanctions inside. So we gotta be thinking about how we wanna use these instruments of economic pressure and economic straightcraft going forward towards China. Excellent, yeah, I should have uh, been clear that uh, that's what the Biden administration claims, is that the sanctions are meant to uh, uh, pressure Putin and his cronies to stop the atrocities and the invasion. Um, but you're right, there are probably a lot of factors going into it. And we could have a whole panel on the ethics of the Israeli tech industry, but we're just not going to have time for that today. Uh, um, but it does uh, bring us back to you, Gregory, because um, what, we're he what we're hearing is that uh, the war, uh, a conflict, a potential contingency with China, and we're, now we're thinking about a potential Chinese invasion of Taiwan, will be very different uh, for all of the reasons that we've just heard, for all of their capabilities, for all of our, the, the, t the interconnectedness that we have with our uh, our, our industries and for all of the uh, relative uh, tools that we're using now that may not be effective the next time. So um, let me just ask you directly, and I'll, anybody on the panel can take a crack at this one. What would automation and AI look like in a Chinese invasion of Taiwan, in a potential Chinese invasion of Taiwan, and uh, what can we do now to uh, prepare for that? Well, I think the, the answer to that question depends on when. Um, Let's the, say 2027. The, right. The, the reason why I raise that is because uh, the Chinese military is in the midst of a major AI-enabled modernization effort. Uh, they are really changing a lot of the way that they do what they do. 
Um, there was a report by uh, the former China bureau chief in uh, Nikin that basically said Xi Jinping was shaken by what he has seen in the Ukrainian conflict where cheap, crummy, commercially derived uh, UAVs were taking out expensive military specific hardware and in witnessing that he was wondering did I just make a mistake spending tens of billions of dollars to build an aircraft carrier fleet. Uh, that report may or may not be true but it is absolutely the case uh, that the Chinese military is drawing a lot of lessons from what we're seeing in Ukraine and that's why time matters a lot. Um, but as I said, uh, you know, we've been, a, we've been at this story for quite a while. Uh, Project Maven in the Department of Defense was all the way back in 2017. Um, so AI is already making a big difference in the Department of Defense. I'm not satisfied with the pace of adoption. Um, I don't believe a lot of people in the Department of Defense are satisfied with the pace of adoption, but it already is making a big impact, including in what the DOD is up to uh, in Ukraine. Um, and that is true of what's going on with the Chinese military. That is true of what's going on in the Russian military. I think we should expect a lot to change in a relatively short period of time. Thank you. Uh, Liza, you had something that you wanted to say? Oh, sure. Thanks, Josh. No, I wanted to get back to your point about you know, is naming and shaming companies the right approach? I think a more productive approach would really to be, I mean, the, the, let the government be the government. Um, I think it is the government's role to set common sense left and right limits and say, give companies a clearer sense of the direction where policy is going. And coming out of both the Trump and the Biden White House, I can tell you that there's tremendous continuity in the direction of policy, in the direction of we need to disentangle some of the more sensitive aspects of the US-China technology and economic relationship. The US government, as you all from the private sector know, is very slow. So I know you're, you're waiting to get more policy clarity, but I think the direction is assured. And for the government to set those right limits and say, you know, it is unacceptable for American expertise and technology and capital to be aiding and abetting the PLA war machine. Um, I think getting that clarity sooner and giving companies, you know, a, a reasonable amount of time to figure out their compliance is better than kind of kicking the can down the road and leaving things unclear. Um, and on the, on, the, on the company side, I think you all are ahead of the US government in actually designing the technical solutions. So in terms of kind of the proactive foreign policy front, I think the US government needs to be talking to the private sector and hearing what solutions you're coming up with so that we can be pushing for those in the standards bodies. Thank you, we're gonna to go to August in a second, but let me just press you on that because you're right, we do have a private sector audience here that um, has not been properly engaged by our government and has not been given correct, uh, fulsome guidance on how to navigate these very thorny issues. So how about you do that uh, now? And specifically, is there, an, is there any ethical way to uh, uh, collaborate on AI and autonomy with Chinese companies that are definitely under the control of the CCP and probably uh, kicking the, all the technology out the back door to the PLA. And is it just an ethical issue? Because when I look at the uh, China's tech industry, what I see is a crackdown. What I see is the party uh, um, installing itself in control of all of these companies, destroying their ability to function independently, taking trillions of dollars of valuation out of them on purpose in order to exert political control. So when I look at American industry and Wall Street, for, for example, I wonder, shouldn't they factor that into their uh, calculations, especially their economic calculations, and what does it mean if the Chinese tech company just becomes another arm of the CCP? Doesn't that mean that we're taking on a lot of additional risk for our investors that we're not, material risk actually, that we're not properly thinking about? Thanks, yeah, and I certainly don't speak for the US government. I've, I, I've left government, but just my, my personal views on that. No, I agree with a lot of that, Josh. Um, I, you know, I think that in terms of where the government has set the needle, it's, it's the job of the government to send these signals about where the risk is in China. Um, companies are very interested in understanding the national security risk, fiduciary risk, economic risk, shareholder risk, all these types of of risks, and I think they're very good at setting up compliance mechanisms and directing their investments as long as the US government is sending clear signals. Um, and so, um, 
you know, but there is no clear line. Autonomy and some of these other technologies are inherently dual use. And I think sometimes the US government gets themselves, uh, and I can speak from personal experience, tied up in knots, trying to find this perfect dividing line where we're allowing all quote unquote civilian and commercial investments to proceed and walling off all the military. Well, in a perfect world, we do that, but as you all know, uh, these things are inherently mixed and blended, and I think it's better to have a little more clarity now than sort of uh, leave the policy uncertain and kick it down the road and um, you know, hope that we'll somehow be able to untangle the two sides of this tech, which is impossible. Uh, if I may, um, I think the Munich Security Conference was coming through town uh, just the other week, so there's a lot of European diplomats and European security officials, and I will say the mood in Europe is that the peace through trade hypothesis really took a beating from Russia's invasion. And that is true deep within the European security establishment. The second thing I'll say is, you know, on my own uh, travel to China, one of the, the times I went, I went to a, a, a venture capital pitching uh, event um, where Chinese companies were uh, talking with uh, Western and other investors. Um, and one of the, the companies there was uh, a SenseTime executive, and he had specifically mentioned that it is extremely unusual in China's history for a technology as important as artificial intelligence to be trusted to the private sector. And he gave the examples of nuclear weapons and rocketry as the sort of peer comparisons. Keep in mind, this is him pitching to venture capitalists, talking about his relationship uh, with the Chinese government. Um, and what I took away from that was that uh, is it was going to be okay for these Chinese private sector companies to continue to be independent as long as they provided uh, support to the Chinese security establishment. But you know, as you've said, even I was shocked at what's happened in terms of the crackdown on Chinese companies over the past uh, year and a half or so, and the degree to which uh, the Communist Party has uh, insisted upon a degree of control that it, over the past decade it was content to ignore. Thank you. August? I was going to uh, you know, pull the thread a little on this Taiwan question. And I think it links to the conversation we're having now uh, also about the role of companies. You know, every company in the technology sector needs to have had that conversation or have that conversation. What are you going to do? when that happens. And that's not to say that every Taiwan scenario looks like a cross-strait invasion and is you know, at that kind of scale and, and catastrophe. But this is the world we live in, right? You need to kind of see it. And I think it's critical to have that kind of foresight, which isn't drawn from much more than what we see around us. You know, to the point, too, about you know, when, right? When would that conflict be? What would the role of AI be? Like with the commercial side, I think we're actually talking as much about culture as we are technology in both the private sector, but also the U.S. military. I believe later today, Commodore Michael Brasseur from Task Force 59 from the Navy will be here, right? Part of the kind of grassroots and institutional movement to adopt and, and experiment with autonomous systems to use new kinds of software capabilities. Those are not the norm. Those are not scaled. We have a lot, I think, that we can be doing a much more greater and uh, horizontal, like distribution of such efforts, so that we're able to, in a conflict like we're talking about, have gotten people at both the tactical level, but really at the most senior level in the services, et cetera, bought into this idea that the paradigm that was set in the Cold War of $200 million fighter planes is over. You know, should we have a 350 ship Navy or a 3,350 ship Navy? What is a ship? Those are the kinds of fundamental shifts that are very, very difficult to make for a, a nation like ours, for a military like ours. Yet that may be actually what is most important when you start thinking through the realities of a very high intensity conflict like China, with China. Excellent, thank you. And we are gonna take, I'm gonna read a couple of these audience questions. Before we do that, very quickly, August, I have to ask you, I was reading uh, some of your work about cognitive uh, warfare, and this, is, this really freaked me out. And, Me too. And, uh, you know, explain to us briefly what that is and what that means. Sure. And, and this is an area where Rita has a lot of uh, expertise, too. You know, the idea that with artificial intelligence, you know, we are now able to, uh, you know, shape messaging and the inputs that we take into our, you know, if you want to think about yourself as a computer, we take into our own systems. And if you're now able to shape that through social media and other forms of electronic manipulation, uh, at scale, but with incredible precision. And, you know, we've kind of talked around, again, data, 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 you know, on this panel. 
but the amount of data that's out there, the amount of increasingly capable artificial intelligence systems that can refine large you know, lakes of data or whatever you want to call them to affect how people are responding at a, at a neurological level to the world around them, the world as it will be, and maybe even as it was. That should really frighten you. And it is both offensive, but also potentially defensive in how it is used by different nations. So imagine the kinds of disinformation campaigns that we've seen for during everything from domestic uh, uprisings here in the US, like the insurrection on Capitol Hill, to the election, to COVID. Imagine that during a large-scale conflict with China. What would the messaging be? How would the American population be, be shifted algorithmically without people knowing? Or maybe people allowing themselves to be shifted, right? Confirming those biases and feelings that are quite, quite powerful. That is an emergent way of warfare. Whether should there be a human domain, a cognitive domain, that's some, one of the debates that's out there. But I think it's incredibly important for people in the technology community, particularly AI, but also synthetic biology and, and its attendant uh, you know, subsectors to be to be aware of that and to be to be frightened of it to be honest. Wow. So we have cyber force, we have space force, and now we're going to have mind force. Basically. Great. Excellent. Uh, what could go wrong? What could go wrong? Um, that kind of leads us back into this question that I got from the audience, uh, which focuses on the effect that uh, autonomy and especially autonomous uh, platforms, um, aircraft, boats, w ships, whatever. Uh, how that is actually a really uh, uh, competitive and in ways asymmetric advantage for our adversaries. And this is something, Gregory, that I also read in your paper that because of the way this town works and because of the way our government works, we're so invested in these legacy platforms that when China comes around and they skip all of that stuff and go right to the swarms, that's a huge com uh, asymmetric advantage, much like China skipping credit cards and going right to mobile payments or skipping landlines and going right to cell phones. Uh, so this is a question from the audience. How does that, what does that mean to our future capabilities of our national security posture? Let's start with you, Gregory, and then anyone else who would like and take a crack at it. So I think August made a great point here about the bureaucratic structures of the Department of Defense and the military as an obstacle to adopting artificial intelligence. Um, it is really hard to get good at operating nuclear submarines. It is really hard to train really high-performing fighter pilots. There is a lot of bureaucratic organizational structure. There is a lot of muscle memory in the system for how to perform those things well. And as long as those things remain the pillar of competitive military advantage, then all is well and good. But as August was pointing out, the nature of competitive military advantage, the underpinnings of that, require new technological skill sets, and our organizational structures are not really adapting uh, to come to terms with that. I love what you said, right, about how many fights we have had in Washington, D.C., about a 300-ship Navy, and as you pointed out, right, the conversation we need to be is, what would it take to have a 3,000-ship Navy, but instead of those ships costing $10 billion a pop, maybe they cost 100 grand a pop. What we've been seeing in Ukraine is uh, munitions um, such as those made by you know, Northrop Grumman or others, where these are kamikaze drones that cost somewhere between, you know, cost low tens of thousands of dollars a shot that are annihilating million dollar tanks it, you know, at volume. There is a cost and competitiveness revolution going on in military technology, all of which is underpinned by the progress that we've seen in commercial digital technology, not least of which is artificial intelligence. And our institutions, we have made some progress in this direction, but I think the scale of the transformation is even larger uh, than we had previously assumed to be the case. Um, that's something we have to figure out to how to get right. And I, as we've heard, um, the Russians wanted this too. Uh, they haven't done an especially job getting there, but boy, is there a lot of pressure on them um, right now. And I think we've seen throughout history, Russia really underperforming in the early stage of just about every war. Um, and that not necessarily being a great predictor of what the long-term outlook uh, looks like. Excellent. Uh, let's move to the next audience. Oh, do you have something you want to say, Rita? Um, I think I just want to make a quick but I think an important point. So we are absolutely correct in trying to understand and improve on the institutional, bureaucratic, budgetary constraints that 
are imperiling progress of AI and autonomy adoption across DOD. But we should also be very clear that concepts like military civil fusion or the integration between the commercial and the political and the military sectors in China, they sound like everything is streamlined and effective. And we know that authoritarian systems are not effective systems. They might appear effective from the outside because there is this humdrum of activity and plans and declarations. And this is not by any means to say that China can't innovate. We clearly know that it can or that China can't adopt. But we need to understand that the bureaucratic barriers that we face in a free society are probably very much existent in not free society. And what we're learning from the massive underperformance of the Russian military is not necessarily a technological or a technical lesson. It's a lesson about civil military relations in an authoritarian country that prohibits initiative, that gets in the way of effective command and control, that gets in the way of taking action to salvage an operation that is clearly going defunct, let alone prevented by saying no, actually you are probably not going to take Kiev in two days. So all of these, you know, I'm, I'm not to say that like our own self-assessment should be very critical for a fact if we must improve, but we also need to be very clear-eyed about our adversaries and our competitors as much about their successes and achievements, as well as about the barriers that they face. That's a very good point. Thank you, thank uh, you. If I could just briefly push back sure. on uh, a little bit of what you said, uh, Rita. It is definitely the case that Russia's corruption, in, which is endemic into their system, has been an obstacle to military progress. But I would say you go a little bit too far when you say authoritarian regimes cannot produce high-performing militaries. Um, you know, I would say the, the militaries of World War II, uh, many of those were high-performing authoritarian uh, regime militaries. And in the case of China, I think I recall back in, you know, 2010 timeframe, there was a line you heard a lot in this town, which was, China cannot innovate, they can only copy. Um, that's, that was a long time ago. Right, that's over. China's private sector uh, is really competitive. Mark Zuckerberg has admitted multiple times that he stole ideas of features uh, for stuff that Facebook has put out uh, from Chinese companies and Chinese services like WeChat. Um, we've seen a, an enormous renaissance in the Chinese commercial digital sector, um, and I will say what I have seen in the Chinese military sector is also just objectively quite impressive. I'll just say, uh, you know, both things can be true that we overestimated the Russian capability because we failed to understand the weaknesses of authoritarian systems, and at the same time, China is not Russia. And, well, this but, is but not even, what I'm even, saying, and uh, I didn't say that please. they cannot innovate. I please. explicitly said I am not saying that they cannot innovate, and I'm not also saying that authoritarian militaries cannot be effective. They can be very effective. The point is that we are at this self-assessment that stresses all of our weaknesses without understanding that there are critical problems that exist within our adversaries and competitors that we must understand if we want to compete with them effectively, not just their strengths. Excellent. Yes, there are definitely weaknesses in the Russian system that we can exploit in the Chinese system. I think that's, I think you're both right. I think you're both right. Um, last question, and I'll put this one to Liza. This is from the audience. We've talked a lot about how the Chinese uh, political system uh, gives them an advantage on data because there's no such thing as privacy and there's no such thing as uh, a rule of law and there's no such thing as a division between the private and public sectors. So they're, they're getting tons of data, which is hugely valuable and hugely uh, important. How can we compete with that while maintaining our values? How can we, what can we do more to close that gap uh, without becoming the thing that we're fighting. Thanks, and just to kind of build on Rita's point, I think you know it, it's absolutely true that we need to understand the weaknesses of our autocratic rivals and then find ways to exploit them, which has not to date been an objective of US-China policy, and I think it could unlock a lot of creativity in the US government bureaucracy to state that is an objective and then get, pe get people's wheels turning. 
So perhaps I'll just end it at that. Well, I think uh, we've got all of our wheels turning now. So I hope this has been a good uh, framing for the uh, busy day that you guys have ahead of you. Let's give another round of applause to our excellent panelists. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you to our panel for that fascinating conversation, starting off with their thoughts on the positioning of AI and automation and modern warfare, and then diving into how this actually actualizes in relation to China and Russia. Next up, we're now gonna pivot to a conversation between Dr. Michael Horwitz, the Director of Emerging Capabilities Policy at the Department of Defense, and Sun Ming Kim, the Public Policy Lead at Applied Intuition. It's, it's really nice to have you. Thank you for joining us for Nexus today. Thanks so much. Happy to be here. Um, so you started as the DOD's first Director of Emerging Capabilities Policy just over a month ago. Uh, so I wanted to start off with what is Emerging Capabilities Policy? Great question. I feel like on the, on the outside, if you, if you ask people what emerging capabilities are to begin with, you'll get, you'll get all sorts of different, uh, different answers. But from a, a department perspective, the, the Emerging Capabilities Policy Office is designed to lead OSD policy's efforts on, on capability policy and strategy development, emerging technology diplomacy, related interagency initiatives. You know, what, we, what we've been able to say about the national defense strategy so far discusses the way that the development and fielding of emerging capabilities, whether one's thinking about, about AI, uh, hypersonics, uh, directed energy, uh, quantum, uh, all sorts of different technology areas are, are critical to the enduring advantage that the United States uh, seeks to have over potential adversaries. And so our, our goal is to advance US defense and security interests by more effectively integrating emerging capabilities across the waterfront. And by that, what I mean is, you know, DOD, as everyone knows, is, is a pretty big place, right? It's like the world's biggest office building. And part of what we're designed to do is to help bridge between some different uh, parts of the department, and, and it's specifically within OSD policy, focusing on making sure that emerging capabilities are reflected as a high priority in our strategy, in our planning documents, in our budgets, uh, et cetera. That's the start, you know, easy job. So can you talk a little bit more about um, where you sit organizationally and how that helps you and your team do your job? Absolutely. So uh, I report to uh, ASD, uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense, Dr. Mara Carlin. And the placement of the Emerging Capabilities Policy Office there was deliberate. Since when we think about the role that emerging technologies are likely to play in the future of warfare, and emerging technologies in this, in this way, uh, you know, can refer to things that are they're actually pretty close to being fielded or be, you know, being experimented with or, or prototyped now that these are things that could be central to the central to the future force you know that they're not just they're not science projects that in you know 20 30 years we hope will pay off i mean DOD works on those too and those are those are truly important but our office specifically was placed within the strategy plans and capabilities arena within OSD policy to try to more directly integrate insights about emerging capabilities into the into our strategy, into our planning documents, into our budgets, uh, with the idea here meaning both thinking about emerging technologies as well as thinking about new concepts or plans to incorporate existing technologies, technologies that might be might be close to ready or even being or, or even ready to be fielded right now. And before you go back to academia, what are what do you think? are your top three priorities that you would like to accomplish? I'm definitely going back to academia. <laughs> I just want to be clear. The, 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 uh, I think, like, I'm here because of the central challenge identified by the national defense strategy. You know, that, that central challenge is the urgent need to sustain 
and strengthen the American military to deter aggression, specifically as it involves a, you know, the, uh, the pacing threat, China, and the acute threat that the department faces being, uh, being Russia, and integrating emerging capabilities into the core of how the US military does business, I think is essential to, to innovation. The, the phrase I like to use is that the US needs to act with responsible speed. You know, everybody wants us to go faster, right? Everybody wants the Department of Defense to be, to be faster in, in developing, experimenting, and integrating emerging capabilities. And, that, and that's right, and, and the, the top priority of our office, is, you know, as, I just, as I just talked about, is ensuring that emerging capabilities are more clearly, more effectively integrated into uh, what the department does and policy's role in, in strategy and plans and in budgets. But the responsibility part of that is really important, as you know from, from your time in government. And, and you know, the need for uh, AI initiatives, you know, in particular, to be, uh, to be responsible. The need for sufficient safety and, and testing of, of systems that you know, even as we seek to move faster, we need to do that responsibly. And I think the US can and should do that responsibly. And, and, and so our office is designed to be a voice within the, the policy component of, of DOD working to advance, uh, working to advance those, uh, those priorities. You know, we think that emerging capabilities can play a, a critical role in promoting the pillars of the national defense strategy integrated deterrence, an enduring advantage, uh, and campaigning. And this has to include thinking about issues surrounding the, the ethics, ethical questions, strategic stability questions associated with emerging technologies, because doing that reflects our norms, reflects our values, it will make us stronger. We just can't let us, that stop us from being faster. So I think that's what, what, what everybody uh, you know, agrees that, that, DOD needs to, uh, that DOD needs to do. And then the, the last thing I'll say from a priority perspective is, is, the role that, is the role of emerging capability diplomacy. The, the US increasingly wants to work with allies and partners. You know, we, we normally think about that work in terms of you know, transferring completed technology. But emerging technology diplomacy has become an increasingly relevant part of what, uh, of what DOD does. Whether working with other emerging, uh, with other democracies to try to you know, sustain efforts to, for, for Western technological edge, or just generally thinking about how to cooperatively develop, uh, manufacture, and deploy uh, high impact emerging capabilities. So the, the last priority of my, my office that I'll, that I'll mention for now, I mean, I, I could spend all day talking about it, would be, I mean, I do, I guess, every day, but the, uh, is, is building those collaborative, you know, diplomatic relationships, working with other components of DOD to engage with U.S. allies and partners on these efforts. Great, thank you. So a big theme of Nexus today is trust, uh, trust in autonomous applications uh, in defense. Can you talk about what policies and processes exist today within the department to assure trust? Absolutely. I mean, and, and frankly, from your from your prior role, you may know some of these better than I do. But the, I mean, the department has a number of different. As I think, I think the more that people know about DoD's systems for ensuring the the safe, responsible deployment of weapon systems, in particular. The, the more reassured that they would actually be. The, there's a myriad number of different uh, legal uh, and other sorts of checks that every weapon system has to go through uh, before it is approved. And there are a number of different checks even for things that are not, even for things that are not weapon systems. You know, think about responsible AI, initi or responsible AI, AI initiatives. Think about the, uh, the AI ethical principles that, that, guide, the, that guide the department. You know, these truly, are, uh, these truly are priorities and help ensure that whatever we, we do as a department in these sort of emerging capability spaces is done, uh, is done responsibly. And, and I'm focusing on AI in part because, you know, that, that's obviously an area where there's been, uh, there's been a lot of attention and, and where the different parts of DOD really need to, really need to work together. 
And I think another sort of symbol, you know, let me give you two other examples, I think, of the department's commitment to, uh, to trust, essentially, in this, in this context. The, the first is the way that uh, our, our R&E uh, undersecretary, Heidi Hsu, made uh, trusted autonomy in particular, called that out specifically as a phrase, as one of the key technology priorities for the Department of Defense. In that, I think is really important in suggesting that it's not just, again, the systems in and of itself. It's not just about going fast. It's about going fast in a responsible uh, manner. The second is, I think, the, the internal transformation that's happening in DOD right now with the, the standing up of the CDAO, the Chief uh, Digital and AI uh, Office. And that, you know, that, that office has been you know, publicly announced uh, before, you know, brings together the Defense Digital Service, uh, the Jake, the Joint Artificial uh, in Intelligence Center, and the Chief Data Officer. And that, I, I think, almost more than anything else, really symbolizes the strong role that DOD envisions, sort of trust, uh, ethics, et cetera, having in, uh, in emerging capabilities and specifically in, uh, in AI and data in particular. But even moving beyond a, you know, AI, even moving beyond, even moving beyond autonomy, there, and we haven't, and, and we, we can talk about autonomous weapon systems if you, uh, you know, if you want on DOD policy, I'm, I'm staying away for now, since I, I, I feel like that will come at some point. Uh, but <laughs> even moving beyond something like that, the, you know, if you look at policies that DOD has regarding directed energy, the conversations that happen about hypersonics, there's no military in the world that I think takes its commitment to these issues more seriously than the United States. And you see that with this incredible array of reviews that the US has to make sure that its weapon systems, its other systems, comply with international humanitarian law, can be deployed safely and responsibly, et cetera. Thank you. Um, so I wanna switch gears a little bit and talk about the AI strategy. So the last AI strategy was published as an annex of the 2018 National Defense Strategy. With this new 2022 NDS, uh, does the department plan to publish another AI strategy? You know, I think that there have been, there have been a number of, of public reports. You know, most recently, the, I think there was a GAO uh, study that came out suggesting that you know, DOD is going to be DOD is going to be relooking its its AI strategy in one way or another. I mean that that's really squarely in the in the wheelhouse of this new this new CDAO, you know the the sort of successor organization to the to the Jake, and I think they will be be leading departmental efforts on uh, on AI strategy. And I think you know he, this is an example of where the bringing together of data and AI in the new CDAO is so so powerful. Since if data is the fuel that, that makes AI go, essentially, you know, what is an algorithm without, without the data that you would use to train it in, in one way or another, then the bringing those together under the CDAO construct, I think will be reflected in what a, a new strategy will likely look like as well. And anyway, I think the urgent focus, if you look at the you know, what's been published over the last year by the department about the, about the CDAO is the, the need to focus on, on speeding adoption. You know, not just a, a sort of pie in the sky strategy for, for AI or, or, or data. I mean, I think the last, the last strategy, uh, frankly, did, you know, was, was DOD's first strategy in this area and was very, it was very successful. What's necessary now is to turn those those thoughts into reality and to do it and to do it faster, and uh, you know in my in my office and many others in the in the department are, are you know are working hard to to support the the CDAO in uh, in in many of those efforts and I think that that's you know illustrates the the way that the department is is trying to not just sort of talk the talk but but walk the walk when it comes to AI now. Thanks. So uh, my last question for you before I take the audience Q&A um, is on DOD Directive 3009, uh, the policy on autonomous weapon systems, which is my favorite topic. Um, so many criticize that this, this policy, which is 10 years old, um, is outdated because it doesn't mention AI. Um, and for autonomous weapon systems, uh, they're 
has been a lot of advancement in the last decade that actually power autonomy for these weapon systems. Can you address that criticism? Um, do you think the policy should be refreshed? All right, how much time we got? The, uh, I think 3000.09 is a remarkable document in many ways. It's, it's an internal Defense Department directive that was signed out by the Deputy Secretary of Defense in 2012 and was, in many ways, the world's first policy statement on autonomous weapon systems. You know, there, there have been these ongoing international discussions in, in Geneva for, for you know, a decade plus on, uh, on autonomous weapon systems in one way or another. And one of the remarkable things, I think, is the way that the United States has been a leader in outlining how seriously it takes the issue of autonomous weapon systems and and the additional uh, and the additional reviews that it thinks that uh, autonomous weapon systems would require uh, both before formal development uh, and before and before fielding you know but you know the the passage of time though you know make, make, makes all uh, m makes all documents look look imperfect and i suspect one look you know looking at 3000.09 today certainly it, you know that was written before the dod that, that was written before the jake existed that was written before the CDAO existed. That was written before DOD had, um, had ethical principles. That was written before the publication of you know, DIU's you know, attempt to interpret those from an implementation perspective. That was, that was, written, that was written before DOD's responsible AI initiatives. So you know, there's a lot that wasn't in that document. And to be fair, there's a lot that shouldn't be in that document. Since you know, AI and autonomy, you know, I don't need to tell this audience, are not the same thing. Uh, even if from a national security and defense perspective, they're, they're often conflated, and they're certainly in the Venn diagram, there's overlap. Um, but the, the, I think that the, the department is committed to taking seriously being responsible about autonomous weapon systems and having guidance concerning them that incorporates all that has happened over the last, uh, all that has happened over the last decade. And, and my hope is that, that anything the department does is, would, would reflect that need for responsible speed when it comes to the, the adoption of these kinds of systems. And, but, and, but the passage of time means that I think certainly there, there are conversations uh, that are ongoing about the directive. And, and for those that are not extremely well-versed, way too versed, don't even want to think about it, in, uh, in DOD, uh, you know, in the DOD bureaucracy, directives are required to have a sort of relook every 10 years. So this is actually an opportune time for the department, now that uh, given all that's happened over the last decade in the AI space, you know, to take a look at that, at th that directive and figure out, you know, what, you know, what should be done to reflect sort of where we are now compared to where we were a decade ago. So the, with the directive, um, the, the review process that is required by the directive has never been triggered uh, by any you know, DOD weapon systems. Do you, so putting aside the fact that the practice or the policy has not actually gone into practice, what are some good things that the policy has done for the department in the last 10 years? I think the policy really highlighted for the department the way that if you wanted to deploy, if you wanted to develop or deploy an autonomous weapon system, that there were, there were additional checks that were necessary, you know, and checks that involved stakeholders from across the department, you know, not just, not just policy, you know, not just, uh, uh, you know, what was then ATNL, but now is sort of R&E and ANS, you know, not just this undersecretary or that undersecretary or sort of the military services, but that we, we wanted to bring together senior leaders of the department to review any potential autonomous weapon system. And that I think sent a good signal about how seriously DOD was taking its commitment to, uh, com commitment to human control, you know, commitment to human judgment, and, and you know, it, its commitment to responsible behavior. And, and I think none of that has, uh, I think none of that has changed. And if, if anything, it's been, it's been reinforced. And I think the challenge over the next decade is figuring out how to sustain sort of that goodness, but, but also to speed the rate of adoption. And, and that's the big challenge, I think, for DOD when it comes to sort of AI and autonomous systems as a whole. 
And you know that certainly you know reflects I think you know any any challenges that might exist concerning autonomous weapon systems uh, you know themselves, but the but up to, up to this point I think that's the signal that's been sent. Thank you. That's a perfect transition to my first audience question. Uh, so Dr. Horowitz, oh, no. <laughs> several of the speakers this morning uh, have criticized DoD for moving too slowly on AI and autonomy. Can you give a specific example of how your office has or aims to have uh, helped rectify that? I've been there a month, guys. The, uh, I mean, I'll be, you know, on the, on, the, on the outside, I certainly wrote things arguing that DOD need, needed to move faster, and in many cases, much faster, in thinking about the, the adoption of autonomous systems and, uh, and AI. And I think what, the, what we're focused on doing as the, as the department transitions from having a national defense strategy to thinking about the implementation of that, uh, implementation of that strategy and you know, entering the, the FY24 budget cycle, you know, all those sort of regularly scheduled checkpoints that the Department of Defense lives by, ensuring that, that AI and autonomous systems are, are reflected not just on in the, the sort of technical parts of the department, but within policy as well. So that those you know, conversations that, that, the, that the strategy office is having, that the you know, China office is having, that you know, whatever office is having about what priorities should look like for the department, that those reflect emerging capabilities, you know, including, you know, especially, you know, AI and autonomous systems. So uh, I think the, I'm not sure there's something I could necessarily point to, point, point to yet, but I think that's the idea, and I think you'll see that reflected in, uh, in various departmental processes uh, moving forward as, you know, our office works to uh, speed and incorporate emerging capabilities within you know, the broader department strategy, I think, I think more clearly. I actually want to dig a little deeper into that. When, maybe when you were um, in academia and you were uh, you know, interviewing people or researching these topics, um, what, are there po specific policy areas or specific policies that people complained about the department having that served as the biggest barrier to, to adoption? When I was an academic, nobody ever complained to me about anything. <laughs> not students in grades, not other faculty. Wait, sorry, what was the question again? Were no. there policy areas that people complained about the most or that you observed the most about the department uh, being as barriers to adoption? I think that one of the challenges that the department has faced is the, I, I would say, the you know, two, twofold. And I think both of these are things that the department is working, working hard to address. I think the first is that, you know, multiple administrations, you know, covering, you know, multiple political orientations, uh, you know, senior leaders have argued that the, that the U.S. military needs to be, you know, faster and better when it comes to emerging technology adoption. And, and sometimes, you know, budgets haven't followed that. Sometimes they have. And, and I think one of the things that's really remarkable about this administration, and you know, if you look particularly at some of what's come out of the, the Deputy Secretary's office, is a really strong commitment to, as I said before, DOD walking the walk. And I think that, that commitment makes me more confident than I've ever been, actually. Between that, you know, the standing up of the CDAO, other things going on, that, that DOD can now actually move forward with speed in adopting AI and autonomous systems in a way that it's, it, it, parts of DOD have wanted to for, for a long time, but there have been all of the normal bureaucratic challenges associated with, uh, associated with doing so. Thank you. Uh, here's another audience question. You've mentioned emerging technology diplomacy as an important role for DOD. What countries are we cooperating with on emerging capabilities like autonomy and AI? I think the you know your your old office the you know the Jake was uh, you you, t you tell me was uh, you know the U S is the U S has talked to a lot of its closest allies and partners you know about AI and you know one thing I'd call out here is you know we have we have AUKUS now uh, you know a, a signature administration initiative focused on collaboration between the U S Australia and the U K and the president 
in you know in White House statements, you know, called out AI as an area for a cooperation uh, between them. But the U.S. has had uh, has has had AI related conversations with with lots of its allies and partners. You know, both those sort of close kind of five eyes countries that you would imagine, as well as maybe some countries that that might be a little bit that might be a little bit surprising. So I think you know as as the U.S. works to both sustain, build and sustain its enduring advantage, as, as the national defense strategy articulates, and reinforce uh, integrated deterrence, that, that talking with allies and partners in, in a way that, that in some ways can be a two-way street looking at, at, at advances that, that are happening in other countries is both been a priority, is, is illustrated by the efforts of the Jake, and will continue to be a priority. And so that's, that's, a, that's an area where uh, our office is going to be, uh, going to be focused. Uh, in the coming year. What do you think has been the impact of these cooperations on U.S. capabilities and planning? I think the impact up to this point has been, has been nascent. You've seen it in the form of, of exercises. You've seen it in the form of, uh, of experimentation. And, you know, and often, and, and often things that are, that are frankly below the headlines. As, as the department, I think, has really prepared itself for that push toward AI and autonomous system uh, sort of adoption and integration that the, that the CDAO is going to be, going to be championing, championing. And if you look at some of the experimentation uh, that's, that's sort of happening out there uh, now um, in, uh, in the combatant commands, that you know, this is really an area where uh, I think growing partnerships are likely to play a role in where maybe some of those diplomatic conversations, some of those, uh, some of those research and development projects start turning into sort of joint or you know, cooperative uh, development uh, prototypes, you know, experiments in, in a way that sort of translates into, uh, translates into the force. You know, and I'd say again that I think that, you know, AUKUS is such a great example of you know, this administration's really strong commitment to, to that two-way street in collaboration with allies and partners, and then, and then specifically in some of these emerging capability areas. And uh, I think this probably will be my final question. Do you think we're giving the right level of emphasis to AI autonomy within the department in terms of funding, policy, uh, sort of organizational structure of the Pentagon? I'm I'm actually pretty optimistic right now, uh, which, which if you look at some of the things I've written over the last decade might, might strike one as, as, a tiny bit, uh, as a tiny bit curious. But, but I really have never seen a, an orientation of political leaders the way the department has now that's so committed to thinking about emerging technologies and emerging capabilities. And the, the, you know, the creation of our office, the within within the policy organization, the launch of the the CDAO, the uh, the the deputy secretary's creation of the innovation steering group that R and E is running to try to coordinate and shepherd, you know, innovation across the department. I think all of those things make me optimistic that as we enter the the sort of FY twenty four budget cycle, that we're going to start seeing that that payoff as the department becomes. The uh, department becomes, you know, not, not, it's not a question of just more, but smarter at thinking about AI and autonomous systems investments in a way that really pays off for the joint force. And what about rest of government and Congress? I mean, it, it, I, again, I've only been there a month. The, uh, I, think that, I think that Congress, I think this is actually an area where you have bipartisan support in, in many ways in Congress. If you look at the National Security AI Commission, you know, for example, which had you know, bipartisan support and whose recommendations have in many cases received bipartisan support. You know, I mean, there are always debates between Congress and the department, you know, other, parts of the, other parts of the government about what exactly should happen at sort of this time or, or, or that time. But I think that the, I actually think that this is an area where there's been a bipartisan consensus in favor of the U.S. doing more, since AI leadership, of course, is not just a military question, but an economic question, a societal question, a broader workforce question as well. You know, and that's something that this administration has been really committed to. Well, thank you so much. It was great having you on our panel today. Thanks so much. Have a great day.
Thank you, Dr. Horowitz and Sunman, for an insightful discussion, starting off with an overview on emerging capabilities and emerging technology diplomacy, covering the need to act at a responsible speed, emphasizing a commitment of trust, and ending off with ways the department will continue to work on emerging technologies, including AI applications and autonomous systems. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our next panel, which will look at the investment landscape for defense autonomy. Please welcome Atlantic Council Senior Advisor, Steven Rodriguez, who will introduce our speakers. Ooh, hello. Uh, it's great to be here with so many friends uh, on a beautiful DC day. Uh, if you wait two weeks, it, DC will be horrible yet again, uh, the weather at least. Uh, also great to be here uh, with uh, so many friends and, and uh, unfortunately for some of them, uh, co-investors as well. Uh, we, uh, it, you know, when you talk about the investment landscape in dual use, innovative, venture backed, fill in the, the blank technologies, the challenge I often have, and maybe you do as well, is well, what the heck does that mean? What does it mean to invest in dual use? What does it mean to successfully invest in dual use? And what is a successful company that may or may not have commercial applications, but certainly, certainly has national security relevance and uh, supports our country and uh, the countries of our allies as well? That's the panel that we're here to talk about today. Uh, we have Catherine Boyle from Andreessen Horowitz. We have Bilal Zaveri from Lex Capital. We have Nick Sinai, uh, fresh off the plane from Insight. And of course, Peter Dixon uh, from Second Front. Um, what I thought I'd do is briefly share a couple of statistics and then direct a few questions uh, to our panel, do a little Q&A, and certainly get audience participation as well. So here's a couple of uh, current statistics I'd like to run by you. In the last five years, Small Business Innovative Research Grants, or SIBRs, have grown 10% uh, year on year on year on year on year, on year to $17.5 billion uh, in sum. It's a lot of money. It's also gone to many, 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 many companies as well. Uh, venture investment over the last five years in dual use technology companies has grown from $5 billion to $15 billion not a uh, inconsequential uh, sum of money. And uh, meanwhile, the aforementioned SIBRs, which uh, I, I think uh, and I hope most of you understand is a key uh, gateway into the Department of Defense uh, business, uh, only 58% have made the leap from phase one, which is a relatively small uh, amount of money, to phase two, which is a modest amount of money. So why does all this matter to you? And then I'll turn it over to our panelists. Uh, I think why this matters is when you talk about companies that are going to have government traction, ultimately they have to actually get in the hands of the proverbial warfighter, the person who's actually supposed to be using this as part of their day job, and that means not in a, not in a lab or not in a, uh, a testing range. Um, ideally, like current operations in Ukraine, uh, being used by people actually doing their real job deploying and executing and supporting American national security. So I think the focus of this panel, and I, th I think uh, what uh, would be great for all of you to take away from this panel is to actually get a good understanding of what do those companies look like and what really needs to happen, especially from venture capitalists investing a significant amount of money in those companies to ensure that they actually continue to stay in DOD and uh, ultimately end up in the hands of the warfighter. So uh, maybe I'll first turn to Catherine. Uh, Catherine, you've written a lot on this around American dynamism and uh, more recently on, I think, concerns around companies that have gotten significant amounts of investment actually remaining and staying viable in the defense ecosystem. Can you talk a little bit more about that and uh, what concerns you, especially with the, the amount of money flowing into uh, companies in the defense space currently? 
Yeah, so, so I think the, the stats that you talked about uh, earlier are, are really um, something we should be optimistic about. Um, I know when, when I you know, started talking about defense even in 2015, 2016, if you were excited about it in Silicon Valley as an investor, people would laugh you out of the room. It's like, why would you ever uh, want to invest in companies that are selling to government? It's too hard. There's all these other things, you know, uh, apps and, and all sorts of consumer things you can invest in. Why would you ever invest in defense? And I think what we're seeing now is just a complete sea change that's actually supported by the numbers that you shared that uh, Silicon Valley, um, and I'm talking about Silicon Valley as sort of an idea, a type of company building, um, not, not, a, not a place in Northern California. Um, but there's a real patriotism that exists now and a real excitement of working with the government uh, that did not exist a few years ago. And so we should really take advantage of that. Um, it, there's very young, talented engineers coming out of the best engineering schools in the country uh, who want to work on these hard problems. Now, now you mentioned something that I, that I also think uh, bears noting as we begin this conversation, which is that uh, dual-use technology is important. And I think all of us in this room agree that, that that's important. But I think that also came from a meme, uh, a pre-existing meme, that the best technologists actually don't want to work on government companies. And so we have to sell dual-use technologies to them because they have to create something commercial and then maybe when they have enough capital they can create a federal practice and therefore they will then work with the government. And so the other thing that has shifted in Silicon Valley that's very important is now there are young engineers, people spinning off of, of Stanford and Cornell and saying, hey, we actually want to work directly with government and we want that to be our main priority at seed through series B. And so that's another thing that I think is, has truly shifted is that there's just so much investor excitement, engineering excitement of, of wanting to, to work with the DOD. Um, the thing that I've been talking about is that this excitement is a great thing. Um, we've seen billions of dollars even in the last year alone going to companies that see the Defense Department as their number one customer. Um, and if we don't see real production contracts going to these companies, I think that some of the engineering excitement and some of the investor excitement is going to dry up in the next few years. And that's not just me as an investor talking. That's what I'm hearing from people within the department. That's what I'm hearing from founders, uh, that there's sort of this, if we're only getting SIBRs, if we're only getting OTAs, there's there's a real problem. So I think that's something we should would all be mindful of, and maybe we can, we can talk about that as well. But um, the, the takeaway is that there is just tremendous excitement to solve the most critical needs of the warfighter, whether that is selling direct or as a dual-use company. But the, the young talent coming into to startups these days is, is very excited about this mission. That's great. Bilal, uh, you, know, you came to this country, went to MIT, I believe, right? You're a, a national engineer, uh, and you've had a successful run at Lex Capital, investing in many companies uh, that were dual use even before the term dual use was fashionable. Um, from your perspective, what would you like to see more of uh, in companies that come into this space from a transition perspective, from an investment perspective, and also from a talent perspective? So first and foremost, I think people here should understand that venture capitalists invest in missionary founders. They're not just investing in money-making machines. Missionary founders end up building great businesses that also end up generating a lot of financial returns. But the mission comes first. And I think part of the uh, entrepreneur ecosystem is driven by the mission to protect the freedoms that we all cherish. They're driven by the idea that the United States as a country needs to be defended, our warfighters should have the best technologies, and, and that allows us to have the economic superiority and promoting our national interests globally. So that drives founders and that drives them to build companies that will last generations. That drives people to build companies, whether it's the Palantirs or the Teslas or the SpaceXs, and I don't want to just mean name companies that Elon Musk might be involved with. But, um, but certainly, end rules of the world and applied intuitions of the world and, and second fronts of the world and shield AI of the world. I can go on and on. There's a lot of companies that are being built by you know, these, these founders that are technologists. Um, the, the idea of a dual use uh, it, it, you know, emerges from, obviously, generally, that they have commercial applications as well as defense and government applications. But I think it has a lot more relevance today not only because, you know, I think Catherine mentioned that, you know, there are people who want to build only for the government, and they absolutely should. But I think there's also this realization that a lot of technology gets developed for the commercial sector, frankly, faster, better, cheaper than for the military sector. Um, you know, uh, they, it, 30, 40 years ago, technology used to be developed for the Defense Department first. They would get first access to it. Internet was developed for the Defense Department. Then it would get to the enterprises when it got a little bit cheaper. And the consumers would be the last ones to get access to this technology. That completely shifted, right? So we all had powerful supercomputers in our pockets before we could use it for our work, right? We had iPhones, 
before it could be allowed us at work, and it was like, okay, you can bring your own device to work, and that came later. And military generals, four-star generals, got access to it six, seven years after iPhone had been invented, right? And that's happening consistently again and again, where technologies are getting developed for commercial sector, not because they're being developed for the defense purposes, but whether it's machine learning or AI or NLP or automation or autonomy, because they need to be developed there. Applied intuitions technologies for automotive sector, for example, are extremely complex, extremely sophisticated, but they're equally applicable to the defense sector as well. And I think the idea is how do we make sure that those technologies become accessible? Mm -hmm. I always state that our adversaries have actually figured this out before we have. So when we think about China, you, you know, by law, if you're a company operating and you have any technology that can be used for national security, you're bound to provide it to the government. That is not the case here. We're a voluntary service, you know, unless we have a, you know, some kind of an emergency uh, order. Entrepreneurs have to choose to work with the government. And I think we want to promote that. I think venture capitalists want to promote that. We, we think this is a very large market. We think this is a very secular market, right? We also think that this is a, um, a, a space that if we start selling, uh, we can have fast iterating technologies available. We will see greater demand, but we'll actually will also see greater demand for more technology development, faster pace of uh, innovation, which I think drives uh, venture capital. Uh, brilliant. Yeah. So uh, it just dawned on me, we, we have an incredible uh, span of experience from journalism to uh, science to uh, Nick being a, a, an extremely senior bureaucrat or technocrat, might be the more appropriate term, uh, and of course Pete being a military officer. Uh, Nick, from, from your experience, you, you operated at the highest levels of the U.S. government in the White House. Um, you've also seen directly from that experience as well as uh, at Insight, uh, making a significant number of investments, the challenge of you know, getting and uh, contrast, getting uh, traction in the US government, and then scaling that, uh, that traction, getting things like authority to operate, you know, dealing with foci mitigation and uh, proxy boards and the minutia of what it takes to actually grow a successful enterprise. Can you talk more about uh, your experience um, with companies that have successfully done successfully done that, as well as the companies that tend uh, not to fully understand that, and, and maybe share why do you think that is? Yeah, um, I guess I would say that that it's th there's really two challenges for for both dual use and, and, and defense companies, but also for for more traditional uh, um, cybersecurity companies or commercial software as a service companies that are trying to enter the, enter the public sector. So one is this lack of operational buying, and I think it's something we should, we should continue to talk about. That is, how do we get the program executive offices to really lean in? Uh, but this other piece is this, what I call bureaucratic cruft, and it's a series of uh, practices, uh, and it could be the authority to operate, so you know, how you get software to go live. It could be the, the foreign influence, the foci, uh, and it, it, it could be ITAR, state uh, um, licensing. And, and all of these are well-intentioned processes, but they also tend to be paper-based. They tend to be uh, kind of committee-based. They tend to take a long time. And when you add it up, you just have a, this kind of bureaucratic cruft that is a tax for companies entering uh, the public sector. And so the conventional wisdom for, for venture capitalists, both at the early and the growth stage, was you know, it helps to have some scale before you enter federal because you're going to have to, you know, uh, go get FedRAMP or you're going to have to go, go through all of, the, all of these kind of uh, uh, bureaucratic processes and they're going to cost money and time. And so that's, that's a, a, a thing that you might want to wait until you're a little bit larger as a, as a traditional software company. If you are defense or dual use at your DNA, if that's kind of in your mission, you, you're not going to wait for a few years to do that. You actually have to have bureaucracy hacking as one of your core competencies. Hmm. Um, and so that's, that's part of the function that all, you know, all the companies that we invest in, and it's, it's something that uh, Peter does uh, really well, which is you know, how do we accelerate uh, entry? Um, and the, the large primes, you know, they do this really well. They have armies of people that, that do all of these, these kinds of things, and, and we're not gonna have 100 people in, in any one portfolio company attacking these dozen processes. One, one, one thing that you know, I'll, I'll point to you, because we had this conversation a few weeks ago at, at, at another meeting, um, 
the number one SBIR you mentioned earlier, small business. Startups are not small businesses. At some point in their life, they qualify as small businesses. But I often say they're genetically engineered to scale. Right? If they stay as small businesses, they're a failure, certainly from a venture capital-backed startup perspective. Mm -hmm. So so the whole SBIR process, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's such a small amount of money, relatively speaking. And somehow we've thought that you know, that's enough for us to find innovation and bring that into the department. It doesn't work. You have to find other pools of capital. Go figure out how to do that. Right? You, you know, we, are, we're, we are at war, whether we like it or not, and it's a hyper war. It requires automation and autonomy and AI, and we have to find where that technology is and figure out how to buy it. But the second thing, Nick, you, you brought it up at, you know, earlier in a meeting with me that you know, the way the process works um, in, in Department of Defense is this requirements stuff. Right? So you, two years or maybe even longer before the money ever gets allocated, you write a requirements doc. And primes are like set up generally to be able to do that. They work with the Defense Department for many, many years, sometimes decades, to figure out how to write the requirements such that pretty much they only, they're the only ones who qualify for that. Right? And then you go through and just make the product. So in some ways, you have to choose your supplier before you even know what they can build for you. Startups don't work like that. Startups build products because venture capitalists give them money to develop the technology and turn it into a product. What we're really looking for is a customer to buy the product. And I think this is what Catherine talks about a lot, is that you know, we need buyers of product. You know, we're not looking for grants. Startups are not looking for you know, uh, you know, uh, small amounts of money that are development and research contracts. They're looking for customer on the other side, any number of offices within any number of government agencies, national security agencies, Department of Defense, and so on. Um, that has to come, and, and that has to show scale. And if that, is, if that happens, there is a tremendous amount of venture capital that is ready to go into these companies. There are venture-backed companies that we have invested in that, has raised, that have raised over a billion dollars each. Right? Applied Intuition has raised a lot of money. These are all companies that are very well funded because they can find customers on the other side. And I think we have to figure out how to make that transition so that it doesn't stay in the R&D phase. Hmm. Yeah, so let me just add on that in terms of R&D because I know VCs are often telling companies, look, don't bother with Cibber. And I actually disagree with that pretty strongly. I think especially as we look at the current climate, that Cibber money is gonna be really important. I would just tell any company that is hoping to raise venture capital, just don't pretend to the VCs that it's revenue, because it's not. It's, it's NRE. Non, what, say what? NRE. NRE. It's non-dilutive, non-recurring <clears throat> engineering. And as long as you list it accordingly, you're going to be fine. But what it does give you is it does give you sole source justification, right, to be able to get to a phase three. The problem with SIBRs and other transactions and everything else is that it often ends up being innovation theater, often a petting zoo, where it's not incorporated into operational data flows or uh, you don't have a chance to make it indispensable to the user, so they don't, they don't feel like they need it. It's often a petting zoo that they may take a look at and think it's compelling, but they're not really gonna say, this is a technology I can't live without. And so uh, what I uh, realized in the Marine Corps was that the technology that I'd seen at places like Incutel and DARPA during my time in the Pentagon was not getting into the hands of my Lance Corporals in harm's way. And that was amazingly frustrating to be spending, what is it, as much as the 10 next countries combined? Yet, you know, in Afghanistan, we were effectively on a level playing field with the Taliban, right? They had IEDs, we had airstrikes. And uh, that stung, uh, that was not what I expected. And so uh, when I got out of that experience, I really tried to figure out what was causing this. And we call ourselves national security professionals. We talk about the value of death. Have you ever heard somebody actually define what the value of death is? It very, I mean, how can we call ourselves national security professionals unless we actually dig into that? So we, we did in part, and you know, I know you have as well. And really, to my mind, there are two big things there that you need. One, you need a production contract to be able to succeed or access to it. And then you need the ability to have an authority to operate, to go into production. And we realized that that problem was taking a year and a half, costing companies and internal and external costs and consultants and everything else, a million to $2 million, right? Sometimes if they were lucky. 
Um, and then once you broke in, there were other security enclaves that, that you then weren't allowed into. So you weren't even into the full market yet. And so a second front, we built a platform to be able to pull companies, containerized software, through that process in as little as 70 days, uh, which is the longest it's taken us so far, and to be able to do updates uh, in 24 to 48 hours. The reason that's a big deal is, for instance, when you change an AI framework, the military says, okay, well, now you've changed the framework, so it's now out of compliance. So even though you as a startup uh, you know, busted your ass and all of your engineers worked a weekend to be able to create something that was gonna save lives in Ukraine, even with a general pounding the table, we can't field it, right? We can't, from a compliance perspective, we can't field it for another two months, mm -hmm. right? And by that time, it's obsolete. So that's really the problem that we specifically are solving. Before I put down the mic, let me just, for the benefit of everybody, let me just understand who the audience is here. So if your government, can you raise your hand? Okay. If you work in what you would describe as you know, a, a defense company, either a small business or a traditional defense company, can you raise your hand? Okay. If you're, a, uh, if you're part of a startup, can you raise your hand? Great. That's a big, big group on the startup side. Okay, great, thank you. So uh, uh, since you jump, jumped the mic, I was gonna make a, I had a couple of Marine jokes, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure to kind of <laughs> sprinkle them around. Uh, the, I was going to say, you have all v smart VCs here, and, yeah. and me as a Marine. Are, are you sure I'm on the right panel here? No, well, it, it's, so it, it's interesting that, well, the joke was is that the, oh, Pete was the, re the guy responsible for the Marines giving up all their tanks. Uh, and the other joke, I'll just go with it, was the, uh, the, you know, who has more tanks than the U.S. Marines currently? Ukrainian farmers. Um, <laughs> so, it's, uh, uh, there's more where that came from. Um, uh, real quick, uh, audience participation. Um, Ask Nexus 22. Uh, hopefully, you've been paying attention. A ask Nexus 22 at Gmail. Uh, that's the email to send your questions uh, to us. Uh, and uh, l let me stay with uh, Pete, though. Um, I think your inclusion here is important because you've actually had to go raise money with a and make a value prop that people will buy, right, in the form of a. Uh, a you know venture dollars at an attractive valuation. Um, key point: if you ever raise money, um, <clears throat> unless I'm giving you money, in that case, you know, I'm happy to crush you on valuation. Um, what was the argument that you made to your investors, like artists and Kleiner, uh, on why they should invest in you? What the value was? Uh, what what the value was to the market, or like product market fit? And then also what the product mission fit was, right? How is this going to solve the actual problems that you were just talking about? Yeah, it's, it's hard for me to, to answer this question without bagging on, on sort of the traditional defense industry and DOD a little bit, which I swore I wasn't going to do up here on stage because I feel that that's what these sessions turn into. Uh, but let me, let me just put some numbers out there to put this in kind of stark, stark terms. So the average... Uh, tech transition, how long it takes the traditional defense industrial base to produce software for the Pentagon, so for, really for IT, is 105 months from RFI to initial fielding. Yeah. So that's catastrophic, catastrophic failure by any standard. Mm -hmm. So in terms of like the new positions that are being announced and everything else, uh, I tend to be uh, optimistic about that stuff. But really, some of this seems like shuffling deck chairs a little bit. When you look at almost nine years to field technology, I mean, that's, that, that says a process doesn't need to be reformed. That a process needs to be done away with. And so what we were able to say is, given that uh, level of failure, mm. this is a space that is ripe for disruption by commercial technology that can come in, if we can remove the barrier for them to be able to do so. And so we had a value proposition that we could do that, and so that we could see a shift in hundreds of billions of dollars moving from traditional defense companies that were failing the American warfighter, flat out failing, mm. to uh, dual use commercial companies. Because something like 18 out of 20 different lines of effort of what DOD actually needs from AIML to robotics to adaptive launch is all coming from the commercial sector. And until the traditional defense uh, companies figure out how to incentivize and retain good software engineers, um, they will not be able to compete 
on anything that has dual use applicability. Brilliant. Um, Catherine, uh, I'd li I'll direct this question towards you, but if any of the other panelists want to chime in, please do. Um, yesterday in a, in a session, uh, Peter Ludwig, one of the uh, uh, senior leaders at Applied Intuition, um, mentioned something that really caught my attention. He said that the self-driving or autonomous driving, you know, car, car or, you know, uh, ecosystem um, has actually been driving a lot of uh, secondary investment in related technologies to include what uh, applied intuition is quite good at. I thought that was very, very interesting because I'm old enough to remember seven years ago when the third offset strategy uh, was like coming out, uh, that there was this whole discussion around, oh, D the DOD and drives innovation, and then the commercial industry is trying to, has always uh, played catch up, which was in many cases very, very true. So when he said that, I said, wow, like maybe this is a paradigm shift, and there's a line of thinking along with that paradigm shift that I know uh, uh, other VCs have, have publicly talked about is maybe we're just spending too much, too much money, you know, the super money especially, on too many companies, right? So we should keep spending the same amount of, amount of money, but we should be picking, in essence, kind of national tech champions, if you will, uh, analogous to what the Chinese do with their, I think, eight companies they pick. Any thoughts on the idea around, and it's really kind of an American dynamism, totally. industrial policy yeah. question, isn't it? No, I, I actually love that point because I think that's that's one of the things that, that, you know, we're always surprised as venture capitalists what companies work out coming out of movements. I mean, autonomous vehicles was, you know, five years ago, the place where so much capital, you know, 2023 was the year we were going to see autonomous vehicles on the street of New York City and Washington, D.C. that was going to be fantastic. And what we've seen is actually sensor tech technology, LiDAR technology coming down the cost curve to the point where any defense company can benefit from that investment, from commercial investment. Uh, so I think the, 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 you know, the kind of moral of that story is that the DOD, it, would be, it would be wrong for the DOD not to benefit for the mistakes of investors, I shouldn't call it mistakes, but for the, the visions of what's going to happen in the next 10 years, uh, because so much of that investment is actually very commercially applicable mm. to what the DOD does, not, not only from, you know, from a commercial context, but, but, mm. but from, from a government context. So I think, I think that's really important and something that we should remember. And I also love this, this idea that, you know, I think a lot of, you know, going back to, there's just a lot of memes that are so dated. The idea that the government is only going to be the, the only funders of science in this country and that, you know, the, the, we don't have enough research dollars and that's where technology is coming from. The five years in Silicon Valley land is 50 years compared to anything else. The acceleration that we are seeing is so extraordinary. And so I, I think some of the, the kind of dated memes about how you build a company, about how, you know, software works, about how, um, how we bring new technology technology into the DOD, they, it, it, they, they go stale just because of the pace of technology and things that even, you know, investors and founders, you know, up here can never, you know, picture happening. So I think we have to keep that in mind that um, just the pace of, of technology and pace of, especially of commercial technology innovation is leading us to where every industry has to be kind of on their toes of how do we adapt uh, to this pace and acceleration. Uh, uh, I actually want to add something to that. So the, uh, you know, in the previous generation, there was these cell phones that came out, right? Like all of us have one in our pocket. Uh, and if you don't, why not? Uh, but, uh, but out of that came a series of technologies that became very ubiquitous. GPS prices went, you know, remember we used to buy GPS systems at Sears and Best Buy for $300 independently, and now it's, you know, a buck. Right, a GPS it, sensors. If you find a series, it's probably still three hundred dollars on the shelf. <laughs> That's true, but that was the peace dividend of the cell phone wars. A whole bunch of clocking devices and sensors and all of that stuff became really cheap and became ubiquitous in every device that we use now. There's similarly going to be what's been called the peace dividend of the uh, the autonomous car wars. There's going to be a series of technologies that are going to come out that are going to be very valuable across a lot of different sectors. Eight, nine years ago, nobody believed, you know, besides a few, you know, hardcore believers in electric cars being the dominant mode of transportation, right? People joked around that Tesla is basically existent because it's a taxpayer subsidy uh, company, mm. right? Uh, now we have autonomous cars driving around in the streets and testing, you know, in at least four or five different cities fully autonomous as taxi cars. Um, and, and out of that is going to be, you know, the LiDAR systems, the compute systems that are coming out and uh, simulation systems that are coming out that are now becoming applicable for many other industries. Innovation does not happen linearly. This whole idea of writing requirements because we know what the future will look like, what will our conflict with China look like five years out, is absolute utter nonsense. It's batshit bullshit, right? It just doesn't work. 
We have no idea what that conflict is going to look like. So we have to be on a technology development pathway that allows us to innovate and move really quickly and also you know, serendipitously. You know, I'll give you a quick example, and I hope it doesn't take too much time, right? We, VCs do not know what the future is going to look like. Like VCs, I have no idea what the future investment is going to look like, where I'm going to deploy the billion dollars that I may have raised last year. Right? But what I do know is going to be at the cutting edge of what we're already investing in. Mm -hmm. You know, about nine, ten years ago, we became interested in this area of science called metamaterials for cloaking devices. Yes, you can cloak, you know, our, our planes with that material science technology. We ended up investing along with Bill Gates into that for uh, solid state antenna, radar antennas. Mm -hmm. That company is now selling to special operations forces, right? And it's also selling to commercial uh, uh, companies. Those guys sitting in a board meeting said, hey, you should look at this company coming out of NASA. It's like a bunch of kids who are building satellites the size of a shoebox. And they're like, what? Satellites are $300 million to build and $350 million to put in space. So you went and see these guys, and they're like building these satellites, which are essentially a, a lens the size of a, a size of a shoebox with electronics wrapped around it. And they're like looking for, you know, hyenas in Africa or something. And turns out that company became what was called Cosmogia Den, then became Planet Labs, which we invested in. And Planet has the largest Earth observing satellite uh, constellation in space that's in operation today. Mm -hmm. And that satellite imagery is being used by the Ukrainians and for Ukrainian use. That, getting that data, we're like, you know, oh my God, there's going to be a ton of data coming down. Who's going to analyze this data? Are we going to have, you know, thousands and thousands of people in building looking at images? Remember when we were all looking for the downed airliner in Malaysia, and you're like, you know, if you find this image and find a part floating around, like, we're like, how are we going to do this? We said, oh, it's going to be machine learning AI is going to do that. Right? So we invested in a company called Orbital Insight that's doing part of Project Maven and a bunch of other work using machine learning AI to identify images, whether it's over North Korea or Ukraine or whatever. It's all machine learning technologies. They then told us that, hey, we do all of this in the cloud using you know, NVIDIA GPUs. We're like, There's only one company in the world that does that. So that led us to an investment in Nirvana that Intel acquired. Mm -hmm. right? Now, if you look at this trajectory that I just said, we're looking at metamaterial, which is really a material science technology, leading us through ma machine learning, intelligence, satellites, down to semiconductor technologies. That's what happens in venture capital. And this is a story of just nine years. Right? So, That's what we need to be investing in. So I, I want to continue this. Uh, but add a, a, a flavor of uh, uh, government policy, which I know gets everyone out of bed in the morning. Um, <clears throat> this question is obviously directed towards Nick. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, I think three or four years ago, I wrote an article on foreign policy saying that America, this is back when Trump, uh, the Trump administration was launching uh, their new executive order, right, on, uh, on industrial policy, a, a very sexy topic. Uh, and the, I think the article title was something of the, of the effect of uh, America needs a new dreadnought strategy. And the idea behind that was uh, taking a page from our, our, our friends across the pond who had the, imagine being the royal engineer that came up in the 1880s with the concept, a viable con uh, MVP, if you will, uh, minimum viable product, uh, for the dreadnought, right? Revolutionized naval warfare. And the, uh, the British high command said, cool, like, why don't you just sit on that intentionally as a national policy for 25 years, uh, including, and so the, Britain went to war multiple times with deliberately inferior technology, at least publicly at the, at, at the time, as a national policy in terms of deploying or withholding technology. And that, that wasn't a technology or an investment issue, right? What held them back was uh, an aspect of national policy. So from a, from a national policy perspective, what uh, what would you like to see more of in the Biden administration or future administrations uh, when it comes to engaging venture capitalists, engaging technology, and driving that technology, uh, hopefully within an OODA loop that Bilal was talking about in terms of making sure that you have capability that reflects the reality today and not the reality today, but then somehow projected 50 years in the future? So there's another conference going on today, uh, Code for America. Um, and the GSA administrator, Robin Carnahan, is famous for saying, just make the goddamn websites work, right? And the domestic policy advisor, Susan Rice, has talked about publicly about policy is great, but you have actually have to execute on policy. So I'm a big fan of policy. I spent part of my career as a policy staffer, uh, but policy doesn't amount to a hill of beans if, if 
if the government can't execute on it. Um, and so, yes, there's a ton of how do you remove the bureaucratic cruft, but it's also how, how can the, the Defense Department actually execute on that. Um, I'm also really passionate about talent strategy. Um, and so we have tremendous talent inside of government and tremendous talent that wants to come work in government to solve some of these problems, to, to, to help government better find, try, and scale the best technology to meet the diverse mission needs. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to have helped with the U.S. Digital Corps, which is about early career uh, technical talent in government. Uh, there's some great uh, people flow programs about bringing people out of uh, um, government. And even in, in Bilal's story, you notice the, the, the NASA engineer, you know, all of the defense and dual use companies that we invest in, they have a government engineer, mm -hmm. technologist uh, uh, person uh, who has come out and is, is, is determined to do things better. And so I think uh, government policies that, that focus on, you know, how do we continue to attract and keep great talent and continue to upskill great talent are gonna help uh, uh, address some of these challenges. Brilliant. Uh, Peter, uh, uh, can you, can you uh, in your remarks, also flavor in uh, the primes? We talked about them a little bit, and we are definitely gonna talk about the war, the war for talent. Um, but the, I think the consensus is, is that you know, you know, if you're a venture-backed technology company, Primes are very, very necessary up to a point. Uh, obviously, you came out of the defense industry and, you know, and, and of course, of second front. What, what are your views on that? And then maybe once you go, f happy to have the rest of you guys chime in as well. Because I think this is, this is an important point. And I, I talked with uh, an unnamed Secretary of Defense uh, who was involved in the third offset strategy, which should narrow it down to two. <laughs> uh, and they, they said, uh, this individual said, uh, a year or two after it, it launched, I said, you know what, I think we inadvertently alienated the defense industrial base in the initial rollout of the third offset strategy. Um, so would love, love to get your comments on any and all of that, uh, especially as how uh, all, all of our companies relate to the primes. Yeah, I, I like your example of the dreadnought, right? So the reason the British sat on that was because they had the best fleet in the world. And what the dreadnought did was it reset the playing field. And so why would they reset the playing field when they were ahead and when the dreadnought was coming out of their defense industrial base? The, the problem is that now it's not like we have isolated defense industrial bases that are driving military technological advantage. Where it's being dri driven from is from a global technological pool, a uh, pool of uh, companies that that you know, we have our sphere of influence, the CCP, like was being talked about earlier, has their sphere of influence, but we all have access to it. And so you know, if we don't adopt, for instance, AI, it's not like we can sit on that and not reset the playing field. The playing field's being reset. It's just a question of are we picking it up or are we not? And so, so let me just be real here for a little bit. A bunch of us are, are aware of what's going on in terms of, say, like the AI effort within within DOD. And you know, when I when we heard the list of organizations that were going over uh, to this new executive, uh, I didn't hear Maven mentioned. It's going over to NGA. What I he, what I am being told by people that feel like they know is that NGA is already messaging that they don't have the budget to to they have 10% of the budget necessary to maintain Maven. So this is the most effective thing that DOD has done in AI, right? And it's already being messaged that it's gonna be carved up by the bureaucracy. That terrifies me. You have uh, Mike Brown, who's gonna be on a panel later, coming out publicly. And this is a deeply, deeply humble man who keeps his head down and does the work. He is not a showboat. And he is saying benign neglect is killing DIU. I think we're at a real inflection point where a bunch of different efforts have made a phenomenal start. But we have to decide as a national security community, are we gonna go back to business as usual? Which as I mentioned, is catastrophic levels of failure. Or are we gonna actually be serious about the start that we've made here on the three programs that have worked? Three out of 160 different buying centers that have innovation in their name in DOD. There are three that work. It's AFWorks for the Air Force that recaptured the Cibber budget from basically what was largely Cibber Mills. It's Defense Innovation Unit for the DOD, and it's InQtel for the CIA and, and intelligence community. That's it. Everything else may have had great people who did phenomenal things, 
but they were never given the budget authorities or resources necessary to actually move the needle. So that's what I'd say in terms of the, uh, my view on the traditional defense industrial base. You know, honestly, we, we do need a national security innovation base in this country and something that looks a hell of a lot more like Israel than what we have today, because what we have today just flat out is more, okay? Anyone else? I'd love to go back to the, the talent point, because I think it ties into this nicely. Um, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I've gone back and looked at every, you know, Paul Volcker in 1989 led a paper called, or a commission called A Quiet Crisis, was the name of the paper he put out about the talent crisis facing the federal bureaucracy. That's 1989. We've been talking about this for a very long time. I think if you're actually going to talk about the moment that things really switched in America, I've talked about this a lot, I think it was with the revocation of the draft in 1973, where we told our young people that they no longer have to serve their country. It's totally fine if they want to go to a great university and go into the private sector. And I'd say the good thing that's happened and that's changed since the 80s is a lot of our best and brightest used to go to great universities and they used to go out and they used to go work for consulting firms. They used to go to Wall Street. Uh, they, you know, they, they used to, to, to serve themselves in a way that they thought was best for, for themselves and their family and ignore public service altogether. And I think what Silicon Valley has changed is that serving your country through a government company like SpaceX, like Applied Intuition, like Palantir, like Andril, these companies are so cool. Uh, I know that Elon Musk is sometimes seen as a polarizing figure, uh, but he has made, like he has made space cool again. He has made government cool again. And the number of companies that have learned that playbook of how you work with government, but how you also do hardcore engineering in the private sector, it is the trifecta that has come together that is really going to benefit this country. And we have a whole generation of young people that look at these companies and say, this is what I want to do with the next 10, 20 years of my life. And so we can't say, oh, well, how are we going to bring them into government? How are we going to change what they want to do? I think we have to meet them where they are, which is wanting to work in these really fast-paced startups, whether they're working as a founder or whether they're working at these companies. Companies. So I, I'm less optimistic about solving the talent crisis, that something is dramatically going to shift where young people are going to say, government is wonderful. You just turn on the news. I don't think that anyone's looking at government and saying, wow, that's, that's where I want to spend my time right now. Um, so so I, I think we have to be realistic about that and somewhat stoic about that. But ultimately, there's this entire just talent network that wants to serve. And so we have to, we have to capitalize on it. And we have to do it in the next few years. Bilal, I know you have thoughts I, on this. I, I want to just second what Peter was saying, not second front him. Uh, <laughs> but uh, this, is, this is a moment of crisis, and I think part of the problem is that we're in this weird situation where on one hand, we have our politicians telling the world that you know, we just pulled out of you know, uh, the war in Afghanistan and we don't want to put troops anywhere. The reality is that we are at war. We just don't want to accept it. We're at war because we have you know, uh, just because we don't have troops engaged in, in the battlefield directly in, in geography, that does not mean we're not at war. We are fighting China every single day. There are, you know, massive, you know, all of us must have heard by now that semiconductor manufacturing is basically done either in China or in Taiwan. Every IoT device you have, every camera you have for your home security or whatever has chips that were built in China and probably already programmed to be activated whenever necessary. We know that because we fund in cybersecurity companies that try to protect at least industries that can pay. Likely they're not working for your camera that's situated at home, right? We have China-made drones that have taken high-resolution imagery of almost every sensitive site everywhere in the name of um, you know, uh, infrastructure management. Right? DJI, it's turned out to be you know, very closely related to the Chinese government. It is the only drone company, pretty much, at scale, until just a few years ago when the US DOD decided that we're not going to buy it. But for years, they had full freedom to do whatever they wanted to do in this country. We, have, you know, we are at war with Russia. We may not want to have our fingerprints on it, but we are at war with Russia. Right? We are at war with terrorists still all around the world. Iran and North Korea are not that far behind. And we just have to know, what are we going to do about this? Right? Like when this war is at our doorstep, that'll be too late to act on it. And unfortunately, that thinking, and again, going back to Nick told me this example where somebody came up to him on the DOD and said, how much money do you spend on enterprise software investments? And he said, you know, a few billion dollars a year. He said, why do you do that? Why don't you just write the requirements and give it to a, to a, a prime and they'll build the software for you? Like, that entire understanding of this poor guy who worked for one of the primes was that all you have to do is give me the requirements and I can go build it. That is not how innovation works. That's assuming they know what the requirements are. Correct. 
you, there's no way of knowing. No VC could sit and tell you what needs to happen. Even Steve Jobs, who built the iPhone, could not have told you that I'm building this iPhone so that you can, the biggest app built on it is going to be for you to call cabs, right? Like that's not why he built the iPhone or to take photos that disappear. Innovation happens because innovation happens, right? We have drones, ocean-going drones that are all around the world that are collecting data right now for support of US military, but also for navigation around, around the oceans for commercial purposes, right? This is technology advantage that we've got now. How do we make sure we actually use that? This is, I think as Peter was saying, we have to get serious about this. If we don't get serious about this and we all think of this as a giant $750 billion DOD budget as basically an entitlement program, it's just job creation in 50 states, then let's find money elsewhere to invest in actual startups and actual technology that we need so our, fire, so our war fighters are actually safe and actually we're able to win wars. I mean, at the end of the day, if we're gonna go to war, we better win it. And I think we're, we're collectively responsible. Right, so I testified in front of Congress a few years ago uh, pretty negatively about the primes um, and, and, and said like, look, you know, I don't blame the primes. They're, we created the system and it served us very well and I have some really good friends and talented public servants and, and military officers who work in the primes, right? Uh, and a lot of our portfolio companies will sell to and through the primes uh, and some of them are just crazy enough to try and replicate a prime. We're investors in, in rebellion defense, right? Like, like uh, um, Andrel, for example, uh, crazy enough to try and be a, a prime. But most venture-backed companies are gonna uh, be selling to and through, but we have to create that kind of pressure on the defense industrial base uh, that they, they, they need to partner, uh, they need to find ways to, to incorporate um, technology that changes rapidly, and to, to Bilal's point is, uh, we can't be writing requirements for years, procuring for years, building for years, and then give it to give it to a warfighter because technology will have changed. The user need may have changed. I mean, we saw this in in Ukraine where there's kind of real time um, change in in Starlink, right? Where the Russians are 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 attacking uh, um, the constellation, um, the communications uh, constellation, and 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 they're changing kind of it in real time and, and we need to have that kind of uh, responsive capabilities. And so we, we can't be thinking about software as these big capital assets, right? Uh, like, a, like a battleship, it, it, it has, it, software is a living, breathing thing and it, and it continues to evolve and, and we can't think about it in terms of capital and then operation and maintenance, which is kind of the way this town does. Basis is I showed back up in DC, uh, and uh, I guess the question is, what's driving that change of sentiment? And then, uh, re relatedly, for all of you, um, what are your priorities or areas of interest? And in, you know, we're all, you know, for the venture back companies in the room, you're already halfway through Q2, so uh, you know, you're halfway through uh, uh, 2022. What are the kind of priorities that your funds are interested in or focused on uh, th for the rest of this year and going into the next year? Yeah, I think don't run out of money, right, is what most of the, uh, most of the startups um, in terms of priority for the next year. Uh, you know, I think that there are storm clouds on the horizon. And so, you know, one of the, one of the uh, this whole thing about Silicon Valley or startups not working to work with DOD, well, not only to work with DOD, I mean, other than the one Google example, who, by the way, is back working with DOD heavily, including in Maven, right? So it, it's a total red herring. I, I have to think, perpetuated in part by folks who like the status quo and are invested in the status quo and sort of saying, stay in our cold dead embrace, you know, they don't want you anyway. Um, so I would say a lot of what's being uh, driven practically is, got it, one minute left, I'll wrap it here. Um, I'll just say when I first, when I first went into uh, working actually for a Silicon Valley startup, like it sounds like many people in the room might be, 
Uh, I was told by some of the VCs who now have invested in us, don't do it because the federal sales guy or gal that works for our startup, if it's the first one, they get fired within the first year 80% of the time. And so I would just say, don't get distracted by all of the different things that are out there and all of the, the cul-de-sacs and rabbit holes that you can go down. You just need two things to be successful. You need to, to nail your pilot and turn it into a production contract, and you need authority to operate. You do those two things, you'll be fine. Priorities, real quick. So, so our, my priority this year is we, we just launched a new practice that we're referring to as American Dynamism, uh, which is companies that support and actively support the national interest. And this goes back to this newfound patriotism question that came out, which is I, I genuinely believe we're in this historic moment where young people very much want to serve their country, but they want to do it through building. Uh, they see themselves as builders. They see themselves as supporters of the national interest. And most importantly, they've seen success. They've seen SpaceX, they see reusable rockets, they see that it can be done. So we have a, an extraordinary moment right now to take advantage of it. So our firm is, is launching this practice. We're actively investing in companies that support government. Um, and and you know, I, I think there's many of us on this, on this panel who've been doing that for, for a very long time. Um, and we want to see every firm have, have an American dynamism practice or something like it that actively supports this country. Bilal? I think I'll just support what Catherine said. That, that's the most important thing. And just to the audience and founders, don't own the solutions, own the problems. Like, you know, there are many, many important problems to solve in the world. Use technology to solve those problems. We just uh, closed a $20 billion fund. So we're definitely open for business. We're passionate about public sector. Uh, and we're passionate about, about software and data-driven innovation. Great. Uh, Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, as you can see, it, it's a rare treat to get a lot of people who uh, invest a significant amount of money in companies that we all care about and actually hear what they all have to say and giving them a, each a chance to play off of each other as well. So please join me in thanking all of our panelists. Hello. Thank you to our panel for breaking down the existing investment landscape on emerging technologies in defense. From the discussion around SBIRs to how we can handle bringing new technology from Silicon Valley into the DOD to talent flows both in and out of government. I would now like to turn to a brief spotlight video from Congressman Michael Waltz, who will give us the first congressional perspective of the day. Hi everyone, Congressman Mike Waltz here. Uh, and joining you as the ranking member of the House Armed Services Committee on Readiness. Also, I've served uh, the last year as the ranking member of the House Science, Space and Technology Committee on Research and, and Technology. So you know, before I uh, give you a few remarks, I just wanna thank uh, Applied Intuition and the Atlantic Council uh, for hosting Nexus 22 couldn't be more timely and more applicable to what, uh, certainly what we're dealing with in Congress uh, as we build uh, the next year's defense bill uh, in the Pentagon and in the national security community. Look, w right now, I think we have a teachable moment uh, with, with the application of technology and warfare with what we're seeing uh, in Ukraine vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. I know you've had a lot of conversations about that. I think we still have a long way to go in terms of our procurement reforms, in terms of navigating that valley of death uh, with the ecosystem of small businesses as they try to innovate and apply that uh, into the Pentagon's uh, procurement system. Uh, and, and importantly, in terms of protecting our IP in uh, uh, our research institutions and in academia uh, and in the mergers and acquisition space within our national security community. One of the things that I'm really focused on, I know you're gonna talk a lot about uh, uh, Ukraine and, and, and Russia, but I still absolutely fundamentally believe China is our number one threat. They fully intend to replace us as a global power. They are developing the military capabilities to do so. Uh, and they're doing it through leaping ahead of us in key technology sectors. We've seen the national report on artificial intelligence uh, that says China absolutely is making the investments to surpass us. That will not only uh, change the way we conduct ourselves in society, in our economy, 
but certainly in warfare, I'm very concerned about that. But even in the broader array of key technology areas in quantum computing, in advanced materials, in applied manufacturing. Uh, and so in addition to crafting the defense bill, uh, I'm also a conferee in it has a variety of names, but the China, uh, the China bill, USICA, the Competes Act, the National Security Foundation of the Futures Act, that's been part of the problem, is we're really trying to pull together a lot of things, the CHIPS Act. Uh, and my piece of it, I'm really focused on protecting our technological investments. I absolutely agree. We need to be investing in those technological areas. One of the key agencies in that is the National Science Foundation that's responsible for about half of the research grants, uh, both applied and fundamental research uh, throughout our entire ecosystem. Well, that agency, the National Research, uh, the National Science Foundation has received a thousand percent increase in referrals from the FBI for grant fraud and theft and the vast majority, uh, majority of it, China is behind. They also deal with the various talents program, like Thousand Talents, uh, that many American professors uh, have, um, have been found to have been fraudulently participating in. Anyway, the, the security office in the National Science Foundation is an army of one woman. Uh, and so I've been very focused on getting them the tools, uh, expanding her reach and capability, uh, certainly getting her more resources uh, and, uh, and striking that balance of how do we keep our scientific community open and collaborative, yet at the same time protecting the investments uh, that we have been making and that we're on the verge of significantly increasing. The bottom line is we can't pour billions of dollars into this research space and watch it flow right out the back door uh, into Beijing and into their military's hands. Uh, and with their CivMil future uh, fusion process, they absolutely have a state, they being the Chinese Communist Party, a state run at scale enterprise uh, to steal this uh, civilian technology and apply it to, uh, to the Chinese military so that they can surpass us from hypersonics to uh, advanced engines uh, and, and, and on down uh, the list. Look, at the end of the day, I look forward to a really great conversation here on how we tackle these challenges, how we tackle them within our own procurement system, but when we make the appropriate investments, then how we protect it on the back end. Again, whether that's trusted capital in the mergers and acquisition space, uh, whether that is in the in, uh, appropriate cyber protections that don't put an over um, that you know an overwhelming burden on our small business community that's just trying to innovate and make it, um, uh, what, or whether that's over in academia and in our research institutions. Uh, really tough issues. Uh, we certainly welcome your input as we try to tackle them uh, here in Congress both on the Science Committee and on the Armed Services Committee. Uh, and that's why I think this, uh, th you know, this conference is in Nexus 22 really is so timely. And I look forward to hearing from all of you. I'm sure I will uh, in terms of how we tackle these challenges. But hey, thanks so much. Uh, wish I could be with you. God bless and, uh, and let's keep fighting the good fight. Thank you, Congressman. Could we get a round of applause, even though they're not here? <laughs> yeah. We heard a lot about their perspective on current congressional actions, such as the National Science Foundation, the CHIPS Act, and more, all to maintain the US technological edge. Also, as a reminder to the audience, uh, as mentioned in a few panels, feel free to submit any questions for any of the panels through either the Hopin app or via the email asknexus22 at gmail.com. Up next, let's please welcome to the stage General Raymond Anthony Thomas III, the former commander of SOCOM, and Thomas Toll, founder, chairman, and CEO of Tilco, for a fireside chat moderated by Applied Intuition's Kasser Yunus. Okay. 
thank you all for uh, joining us. Uh, let me uh, introduce the panelists first, and then we'll, uh, we'll jump into the uh, questions. So uh, General Tony Thomas uh, formerly served as the 11th commander of U.S. Special Operations Command. He also served as the commander of Joint Special Operations Command of, uh, in North Carolina and the commanding general of NATO's Special Operations Component Command in Afghanistan. Uh, Thomas Tall, uh, also another Thomas, uh, is, the, uh, is a leading entrepreneur and investor focused on leveraging the power of technology, AI, and data science to disrupt, uh, disrupt industries. He's the founder and chairman and CEO of privately held holding company, Telco LLC, as well as, pri as a private investor in many uh, early stage technology companies. Thomas was a founder and CEO of and chairman of Legendary Entertainment, the film company that produced blockbusters including The Dark Knight, 300, The Hangover franchise, uh, and so on. So uh, I guess the first question is, uh, why do we have a four-star general and a, an entrepreneur uh, on the same panel, uh, other than the fact that they hate share names? Uh, the, uh, the real underlying importance here is the public-private partnership required to take on this, uh, this, this pretty significant challenge of ours. So uh, first of all, uh, General Thomas, uh, is it your sense that the warfighter uh, currently supports a wider adoption of a, uh, autonomous systems? Uh, why or why not? I mean, just to set, set the base of uh, what, what is the current kind of thinking uh, in the military? Hey, Kasher, great to see you today. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Very good. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. As I apologize to you before, I'm sorry I'm not there in person, uh, but I had another commitment and great to be on the panel here with my friend Thomas Tull, who is, uh, you know, poised to do great things. To, to oh, I think we lost a little of your audio there, uh, General Thomas. We are not. Um, we'll try a little more, but uh, maybe. Uh, uh, but, but now. Yeah, now we can hear you again. Okay, please let me know if I if I slip away here. Um, the general, the quick answer to your question is yes. I think there's universal acknowledgement that uh, this is transformational technology. Could drive a revolution in how we fight and how we secure our country. Um, about three years ago in my last Senate testimony, I was asked a similar question and I, I provide that answer that it applies to everything we're doing now and everything we can conceive of doing in the future. But my concern, and I describe myself as a zealot, but my concern is we were moving too slowly. Now, shortly after I left that room, my young, younger son, who had time on his hands that day and was watching me on C-SPAN, uh, felt compelled to text me and said, Dad, if you're a zealot for AI, I'm Steve Jobs, because he, he knows I'm the 63-year-old in the room that can barely spell AI. Um, but the point being, I thought we were too slow back then. Three years later, I'm even more concerned that we just have not made the big moves that, that, that we need to be making. Three areas that I think uh, kind of uh, undercuts that development. One is philosophical. We are wrestling with the policies and, and the uh, potential applications of automation and, and applied AI. And all, almost invariably, it goes right to Skynet and worst case sci-fi type applications, which I think, uh, you know, we need to back it off that and, and, and certainly uh, tailor that aversion. The second is more pragmatic, and that's resourcing. The previous panel talked about the extraordinarily huge DOD budget uh, that we have now and potentially in the future. And you look at the relative pittance that is being applied to applied artificial intelligence automation, it's just not leveraging, you know, potentially transformational technology to the degree it should. And the last thing I would offer is inherently and organically to the Department of Defense is a platform bias against true enablement of automation. And I'll give you the kind of the seminal moment for me was three years ago in about the 2019 to 2020 timeframe, DARPA hosted uh, what they called the DARPA dogfight. And to the Air Force's credit, it was essentially a come fight me invite to various uh, competitors to throw applied artificial intelligence to go up against top gun qualified officers. That that's, uh, uh, event is readily available on YouTube. I hope most of the audience has seen it. But the short story is the machine won five nothing. Interestingly, in the wake of that event, the discussion was, well, that was, that was interesting, uh, something we should consider in the future. But it, it was machines doing things that humans would never do. They were doing near suicidal tactics. And the point being, yes, the machine does not know fear, does not know fatigue. 
And more compellingly, do you want your kids flying against some capability like that in the future? So we have a, a couple different kind of biases and obstacles to adaptation, but, but I think there's a general consensus that we have to move in this direction and more aggressively in the future. What do you, uh, if, if that is the case, if resources are being allocated to, uh, to, to systems which are antiquated, uh, what's the way that we, we you know, uh, more aggressively reallocate budgets? Jim Thomas. Yeah, again, I think, I think we, we need to have compelling kind of experiences to do that. I mentioned that there, there are ongoing applications. I would offer they're formative most specifically in, in the big hand wave of command and control. Uh, join all domain command and control is the buzzword for the day. Folks are, are keenly interested in visualization at Echelon, a dashboard kind of approach. Um, and, and, and those are intuitive, but, and I think they're coming uh, to fruition more, more every day. It's, it's being applied to logistics, although falteringly, which again, if we look at the private sector, there's huge opportunities to do it much faster. Targeting, maintenance, and then most interestingly and possibly most impactful is in information operations. Uh, the information space, dealing with both fa factuals and counterfactuals, and how you actually dominate the, uh, the narrative in that space. I think there are some good applications, but, we, but you know, if anything is compelling us to consider it now, it's certainly the ongoing situation in Ukraine. It's the looming potential crisis with China and Taiwan. Um, so I think there will be uh, drivers for, uh, for more, more rapid adaptation, uh, but it, it'll, it'll depend on the, uh, the key decision makers. Uh, what do you think on the private side that we could do in, in order to, uh, to accelerate that uh, adoption of autonomous systems? Well, I think we've reached a point where there's a ton of conversation. People are writing op-eds, people are saying the right things, but I don't see a lot of uh, change happening. And I, and I agree with Tony, certainly not fast enough. I don't believe there's any magic bullet for this problem. It needs to be, first of all, clearly identify the problem, be intellectually honest about where we are vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, I'd love to say near peer. I'm not sure that's accurate in certain areas. I have full faith in American innovation if we take the gloves off, right? I also recognize that bureaucracy exists for a reason and folks working at the Pentagon have a very complex job. <clears throat> but by recognizing the same approach and problem sets that we faced even 10 years ago uh, are, are not the same problem sets we face today. And the word that I keep coming back to is velocity, right? Technology is moving so quickly now. AI, quantum, uh, uh, directed energy, et cetera, et cetera, that you have to be willing uh, to form that bond and partnership again between uh, private industry, technology, institutions like MIT, Carnegie Mellon, Caltech, et cetera, uh, and, and our military. And I think by combining those things, uh, that, that's the way that we, we have to approach the problem. To, uh, what, what, what can uh, uh, you know, industry and uh, academia do to educate commanders, uh, both uh, uh, and policymakers, more effectively than just forums like this? Well, one, one of the things that um, just kind of being around the space, certainly not in the same capacity as, as General Thomas, but I think we have a digital fluency issue, and I think uh, we have to continue to educate folks, our elected officials on the Hill, as well as our commanders that didn't grow up with that fluency. Um, you know, last year uh, at MIT, we did a program with SOCOM and took some of our top commanders through an AI course which I think is starting to make a dent, hopefully expand that program, because I think that fluency is gonna help uh, make better informed decisions and allow us to go faster. What, what uh, started uh, that initiative and uh, who thought, hey, we, we need to have kind of formal training around these new technologies? Well, you know, a lot of times uh, the special forces community, you know, they, they get handed a, a lot of hard stuff and are pretty forward leaning. Uh, so General Clark, uh, saw that problem, that issue, and said, how, how do we change this? And uh, the dean at MIT and some other folks put this course together, and, you know, I think it worked well. Um, General Thomas, uh, how, do you, how do our foreign adversaries or competitors think about uh, autonomous systems in a, in a warfighter context? Uh, and, and how is it different from the way that the, you know, the U.S. is approaching these problems? It, interestingly, they've been very open and frank 
about you know who gets it first will dominate. Uh, Putin has been very specific about that. Xi Jinping to a lesser degree. Um, but to my other point, they are putting their money where their mouth is. They are literally, especially in the case of China, uh, getting hard reps every day in terms of applied artificial intelligence towards their you know totalitarian state, but nonetheless as it applies to, to national defense. So. Um, again, that's juxtaposed with our, our Western approach, slower, uh, you know, more methodical, more concerned in terms of policy implications and human rights, et cetera. Nothing wrong with that, uh, but it, it's, a, it's a contrast of styles and certainly a contrast in terms of uh, state-sponsored uh, efforts going forward. It, uh, uh, Thomas, uh, what considerations should, on, on the private side on, on companies you've invested in, Silicon Valley startups, what should they keep in mind when designing trust systems, uh, designing trust components of autonomous systems, and in general, supplying uh, technology that is both for commercial use and also for defense use? I think it's uh, clear communication, understanding the real world problem that you're solving for, right? Because if something goes uh, wrong when you're building an app, that has one implication. If you have a warfighter on the ground uh, in harm's way, that, that certainly is a completely different matter. So I think it's understanding what problem uh, you're trying to solve for, and I think contextually what situation the technology is gonna be used in. Um, and just, I think one of the things that's critical is forming those partnerships and the open communication uh, between DOD and the like and the private sector where you can have honest conversations, everybody rowing in the same direction, um, and uh, I, I think that is critical over the next couple of years. When, when you're uh, investing in seed stage startups, which are purely commercially focused, um, does this thought come to your mind? It's like, a, how, how do we reapply uh, all of these technologies in the defense sector, or is that coming from entrepreneurs themselves? Uh, I'd say it's a bit of both. It's certainly something I'm very focused on right now, uh, because I, I think it's critical for our country. And I think what has to happen is the private sector has to be willing to go all in on this. And I think, frankly, the government has to figure out a way to be, to do, to, uh, be easier to do business with, right? You, you, you have to figure that out. From your perspective, what are the most difficult, uh, what are the biggest obstacles in terms of not being easy to do, to do business with right now? Well, I think in a lot of cases, we don't have a technology problem, we have a deployment problem. So, you know, if, if you have something off the shelf or something that is readily available and it takes three, four, five, six years to end up in the end user's hand, that's, that's not efficient and it's not going to get it done. So it's stepping back and saying, while recognizing all the complexities uh, and rules that are in place for a good reason, how can you uh, be, be easier to do business with and how can you make sure that you can move quicker uh, to the end user? Great. Um, in terms of uh, 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 General Thomas, from, from your perspective, um, you know, one, one of the stories that we often hear is uh, in, in China, if there is a, uh, if there's a military commander and they want to use the technology, they literally call the CEO of a, of a Chinese company and they, you know, procure that technology. Um, obviously, we have a very different public-private uh, relationship, but in your ideal world, what is that relationship? From a, uh, from a senior uh, military commander uh, utilizing uh, uh, private resources? Kassar, I actually think, you know, I'm not uh, advocating, emulating what the Chinese are doing to the degree they do it, but I think you've nailed the critical mesh point. And in fact, it, it was the epiphany for me uh, as the SOCOM commander that for my first year in command, we were chasing technology in the Valley, in Austin, at Carnegie Mellon, literally throwing people out there, trying to keep up with the pace of te technology. It was the wrong approach. It was, never, it was never going to help us. We tried to leverage DIU. That was brought up in the previous panel. But it, it was literally chasing technology instead of what we adapted to over time, and I give credit to my chief data officer, uh, a flipped approach of bringing uh, venture and technologists under our tent, helping, you know, literally creating that mesh point. You, you have to accept some risk. Um, but where they could absolutely appreciate our problems in detail, they certainly, the twofer was they got to see our people and they all walked away saying you got great people. They know how to leverage this technology. 
but you're you're failing to bring it to them and you're certainly we didn't we weren't aware of your your challenges before so i think that mesh point flipping it of instead of us chasing technology bringing uh technologists and, and leading uh, you know startup companies under our tent is key um quick question there but uh, what about skeptics who say well these are private companies and they're just trying to you know uh, make a quick buck and uh these incentives are not aligned and and really it should be uh, the public sector, you know, writing requirements and figuring out what needs to be done rather than the private sector uh, pushing its wares. Um, how do you think about that tension or, or that criticism? Uh, embrace that tension. It's too damn slow. Um, and we have to accept the risk. The, the previous panel talked about the Maven experience with Google. I, I would tell you, I think that was absolutely cathartic for both the private sector and for DOD, that Google had an internal debate on, ooh, you know, what are we supporting actually? Um, the reality was that outside of Google, we had a rush to the door of other companies saying, if they don't want to play, we'll play. We continue to make it hard in DOD across the kind of the triple headed monster of the department, Congress and the prime, but we have to triangulate them. That's the ecosystem we're living in. Um, how, how do you, you know, uh, you know, exist and survive in that, uh, that environment with the proper meshing, but, it, but again, uh, inviting and, and providing venues to have these private companies under the tent where they can see the problems, they'll come up with the solutions faster than we can even uh, specify them in any requirements document. So, um, uh, you know, it, we have to flip the approach. Um, just finishing on this private public partnership, fast forward, uh, 10 years, uh, Thomas, uh, uh, what's the uh, ideal interaction uh, that we're, you know, we're aiming towards as we've gone through these fundamental technical shifts from buying, you know, tanks and planes to AI systems? What is it? Lots of small companies that are very fluidly working with the government. Is it something else? What what, what does ten years into the future look like in the ideal uh, outcome? Yeah, I think the approach changes, and I'm not naive enough to think it's going to pivot quickly, but. When you look at the history of technology, it is a lot of uh, private companies that, that are, you know, they're not cost plus, they're willing to break dishes and take risk and so forth, and we're gonna need to do that. Um, I think that, again, open dialogue and conversation, everybody rowing in the right direction. Um, and, I, and I think that, uh, you know, you mentioned just a minute ago about the, the tension, and I, I agree with, with General Thomas, capitalism works, doesn't work perfectly, but, at least you know where these companies are coming from, and that competition is what leads to, um, to greatness and, and what leads to breakthroughs. And we just have to, to me, be adults and realize that we live in a world now where there's a land war in, in Europe, uh, where you have po folks like President Xi and Putin who will tell you uh, what their aims are and then actually go do that. And I, I think we need to stare at that and say, the same old won't, won't cut it. And so I think that uh, over the next decade, you're gonna have to see these things come together and everybody decide that it can't be just their way and the private sector has to do uh, its part and be flexible and pliable as well. How do you uh, recommend uh, private companies, specifically in Silicon Valley, that are dealing with some of these tensions of uh, employees who uh, have some uh, acidic reaction, uh, to now the company used to be a pretty commercially oriented company. Yeah. Now maybe 10, 20, 50, 80 percent of the of the effort is going towards defense. Um, any any thoughts on around that topic? Have you seen that improve? Have you seen that get worse? Yeah. Listen, I have dealt with this directly, where uh, well intentioned folks, and that's the great thing about our country. We can we can uh, agree, disagree. We can debate it. But what I challenge people to do is be informed, right? Be informed, don't just make your philosophy fit on a bumper sticker. And you know, if you understand what our adversaries are doing, it would be great. I'd love to live in a world where everybody said, we don't need nuclear weapons, we don't need AI systems, we don't need satellites that'll be weaponized. Let's all you know, sit together and be productive. But I don't see that world, that's not been my experience. So I think uh, folks in technology uh, who have done well, make a great living doing it, need to understand that our freedoms aren't free and that you have an obligation to try to help. Doesn't mean everybody has to jump into the fight, but I think some of the 
reactions that we've seen out of tech companies have been, although I'm sure the person feels like they're doing the right thing, uh, I, I think are naive and, and misplaced. So that's kind of on the ground. Of the can I follow, can I, yeah, go ahead. Can I, can I follow up on Thomas's point there? Because I think he's, he's spot on. We DOD missed a real opportunity uh, during the whole Maven uh, to do. And that was, you know, really have the dialogue um, that should have followed that realizing that there's an aversion to war. I'm, I'm, I'm one of the leading agents, you know, as a military professional, the last thing I want to do is go to war. Uh, but the reality is, you know, it's, 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 it's our part of our nature. But the dialogue that we missed was, hey, here's what we're pursuing. The most precise application of military power conceivable, you know, absolute target discernment, et cetera, et cetera, minimizing collateral damage, all the right, you know, all the right approaches, again, there are folks that will, you know, turn you out at, at hello because it's war and they don't want to talk about it, and that's their prerogative. Um, but here's what we we're pursuing, and and that should have been the dialogue that followed up instead of, hey, it's it's going towards some, uh, you know, voodoo capability that won't be explained to, you know, to to anyone to, to any of the, you know, to the American citizens who have a right to know what we're doing. Absolutely, uh, I think that's a that's a great place to uh, uh, end on. Uh, thank you uh, to both of you uh, for this uh, for this conversation, great. and uh, we're on to lunch. All right. uh, before folks head out to lunch, have a few announcements. So first, thank you to the panelists for all your varied perspectives from warfighter adoption of autonomy to all facets of the public-private partnerships. We have a few amazing speakers coming up right after lunch, including Nan Mulchandani, the Honorable Michelle Flournoy, and Mark Andreessen. So stay tuned. You don't want to miss out. And we're going to be taking a short break. Please be back in the room by 1220. We're going to start at that time sharp. So feel free to grab your lunch, come back, or e eat in the lounge itself. But we'll resume soon.
Hello. Welcome back to the second half of our symposium. It's been a fantastic first half of the day. We've seen many perspectives across the policy implications of emerging technologies, the investment landscape of defense technologies, and public-private pri partnerships. And for the rest of the day, we will focus on how these technologies can break through the defense barrier for actionable use. We want to thank you, our audience, for all of the engaging questions throughout the first half of the day. Please do keep them coming by emailing them to asknexus22 at gmail.com or via the app. We appreciate sending in whatever questions you have. That's a lot of the value of these events. So please do contribute through the platform. Now, please welcome to the stage U.S. Navy Captain Michael Brasser, Commodore of Task Force 59, who will introduce our panel on defense autonomy and trust. Well, good afternoon. I hope everybody had a wonderful lunch. I'm pretty sure I got the long distance award coming all the way from Bahrain to be here today with you guys. <laughs> Sporting the, uh, the Bahrain tan, if you will, but uh, wouldn't, wouldn't miss this panel for the world. Uh, the way we're going to uh, uh, talk this afternoon about defense, autonomy, and trust is I'm going to introduce each of our panelists. They're going to give a few opening remarks. I have a few questions for them, and then we'll open it up to your questions. If that sounds good, we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Commodore uh, Michael Brasser from Task Force 59. It's the Navy's newest. Uh, task force dedicated to the rap rapid uh, integration of artificial intelligence and unmanned systems into fleet operations. We're based in Bahrain. Uh, first, I would like to introduce. Oh, got my notes. Let me get my notes organized here. Uh, Dr. Jane Pinellas, uh, she's currently at the Jake, uh, which is now, as we know, been uh, uh, the CDAO. She's the chief AI assurance uh, there. She's also the chief AI engineer at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, formerly a t and &E for the algorithmic war uh, warfare at Johns Hopkins APL and a PhD from the University of Michigan. Jane, could you just give us a few opening remarks? Yes, thank you very much, and thank you so much for having me here today. So as uh, mentioned at the Jake, I am the Chief of AI Assurance. I've also served as the Director of uh, Test and Evaluation on Project Maven uh, prior to the Jake. Um, so what is AI Assurance, and how does it really relate to trust? In our AI Assurance portfolio, we have two uh, main parts. One is test and evaluation. So this is rigorous, continuous, objective. Uh, test and evaluation of our AI-enabled capabilities, both within the Jake, but also enabling uh, the services and enabling the rest of the department to uh, produce their own tests and evaluation for their systems that they're acquiring. And then also, uh, we have, of course, our responsible AI portfolio. As you know, we are the first uh, military to adopt uh, responsible AI or ethical AI principles, and so now implementation of those principles to the systems that we're acquiring falls into, and the governance of those principles falls into the Jake and the CDAO portfolio. Really briefly on what AI assurance actually means, uh, AI assurance is a framework that helps us build assurance cases or sets of claims for the various stakeholders in the uh, department but also outside of it. Um, about how our systems actually work, that they do what they're supposed to do, that they don't do what they're not supposed to do, and that the humans that are meant to operate them know how to operate them correctly. So as uh, some of our previous speakers mentioned, there's a certain amount of emerging technology diplomacy, for instance, that has to take place. A lot of that is done through building assurance claims that assure our international allies, for instance, or U.S. taxpayers in some cases, um, as well as the warfighter, that the systems are an asset and not a liability, and that's what my team at the Jake does. All right, thank you, Jane. And next is uh, Dr. Jeff Schneider. Uh, Jeff is currently uh, the research professor at the Robotics Institute at the School of Computer Science for Carnegie Mellon University. He's formerly a senior, uh, senior engineer at Uber uh, Advanced Technologies Group. Uh, they worked on Uber's uh, driverless cars. Uh, he's got multiple publications, machine learning, AI, and robotics. 
and he's a PhD from the University of Rochester in computer science. Uh, Jeff, if you could give some opening uh, thoughts as well. Sure, thank you, thank you. Um, I know one of the topics that's come up over and over is sort of concern uh, about the U.S. military falling behind in areas of AI and autonomy. Uh, certainly, I've had a unique perspective on that as one of the folks who took a leave from CMU uh, in 2015 to help Uber start its self-driving car program. Uh, I got a real perspective on how a, how a tech company pursues autonomy and AI. Uh, versus how that's done commonly in the government or the, or the military. At the same time, since I've returned to, to academia in, in 2018, I've also got a perspective on the, on the state of academic research uh, versus where we are and what's deployed. So I've, I've certainly, uh, I, I agree with some of the concerns that have, uh, that have been voiced. On the flip side of that, the Army has recently opened their AI integration center uh, on Pittsburgh's campus. I'm the, uh, on Carnegie Mellon's campus. I'm the director of the, of the CMU side of that collaboration. Um, but I see very positive signs about how different aspects of the military are working to, to re-engage with industry, with academia, to try to overcome some of those deficits. Uh, so I have that, and I think that's an incredibly positive way to, to start on things. So I'll have that perspective as well. Thanks. All right, thank you, Jeff. Uh, next is the Honorable Joe Kernan. Uh, he's currently a principal at West, uh, West Execs Advisors. He's the former uh, Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security. And he's a retired uh, Navy Admiral, uh, Naval Special Forces, uh, 36 years uh, in the Navy, uh, a 90, uh, 1977 graduate of the Naval Academy, and also, I guess, a winery owner, uh, practitioner? Yeah. My wife's the owner, I'm uh, the CFO. Okay, <laughs> yes. So. Sir, any uh, opening remarks from you? Yeah, I'll just make a, make a couple of comments. <clears throat> and that was my last academic endeavor was in 1977, which I was a 2-0 and go guy. So I'm a little bit out of place with the intellectual capital up here. But let me, I, you know, I'm, I'm coming in just from, uh, I'm, as my wife would say, I'm not particularly honorable or intelligent, which goes into my titles. But so I, 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 tell you, I take kind of an operator perspective in view of this thing. At the Undersecretary uh, for Intelligence and, and Security, I took a big, big, push towards the secretaries and everyone else to embrace AI, to embrace machine learning. I was kind of overseeing the MAVEN project. I think somebody made a comment on that earlier today. I, I recognize the importance of it. You know, it, it, it wasn't to perfection, but understanding and, and getting after those types of things. But more, my most interested piece is how AI and machine learning and those types of things could enable war fighters and people who actually had their hands on and had to use them. And the people that are using autonomy in a way that maybe a lot of people don't understand and that'll come up, what's the distinction between using it in the military? I mean, there's lots of things, obviously, you're using autonomy against adversaries, you're, you're in a conflict, uh, you know, they're trying to get into your system, you're trying to get into their system, so it's incredibly complex. But my most, probably, obviously, number one, the partnerships that we build with certainly industry that were, we've, in my own opinion, I don't serve for anybody now, has been horrible, nowhere near what we could be doing with industry. Uh, no more near what we could doing with um, uh, with academia, um, and then I think the other distinguishing factor as we talk about later that always is going to be, as you might expect, important to me. Uh, what's accountability? What are the consequences? Because remember, machines aren't going to—they're not going to the green table. You know, the guys who operate in those things are. So how do you actually balance that machine learning with the person and make sure the cognitive piece comes in and drives the what the machines are doing I think is a really important piece and then training and education for the people that operate and that's a really important if you're going to depend on that thing and you're going to have the consequences and all the second third order effects you know getting getting the military getting the operators up to speed to be able to comfortably operate those systems so there's an education process I think is important but but again I'm, I'm a huge advocate always have been for partnering with with commercial we just don't do it well and I'll maybe comment on that a little bit later but maybe that's enough for me so uh, thank you Joe and uh, finally uh, Mustafa Suleiman he's uh, currently the CEO and co-founder of inflection AI and uh, venture partner at Greylock uh, formerly he's the VP of AI policy at Google he co-founded DeepMind which was acquired by Google in 2014. Mustafa, any opening remarks? Sure. I, I think um, one of the things I've been reflecting on quite a lot, uh, um, you know, lately, and particularly after the discussion this morning, is 
the um, opportunities for developing in simulation. In, in an ideal world for um, you know, maximum safety, we'd like to believe that we can develop very capable systems that are autonomous and do so in controlled sandbox environments. And that's the attraction of building in simulation. In fact, at DeepMind, we spent many, many years building very, very rich, high fidelity simulations. That's why um, we've picked games as our development environments for so long, both with Go, Shogi, chess, and other games, but also StarCraft, which was obviously of a lot of interest to people in the military. I think the challenge with these environments is that quite quickly you run up against the limits of uh, the design of, of your simulation. And very rarely have we seen good sim to real uh, applications where you've sort of developed well in simulation and that simulation is sufficiently representative of the physics or the reality of the real world environment that you can actually carry over your, uh, you know, your learnings or your insights into the real world, um, you know, w whether it's a military theater or a commercial deployment. Um, not to say it's not possible, it's just that we haven't really demonstrated very, very good examples of this working so far. And so from a kind of safety perspective, a trust perspective, given the pressures that I know that we feel in defense and, and elsewhere to make progress as fast as possible with um, very capable but also very safe systems, uh, not having access to good simulated um, research and development is difficult because it means you have to do it increasingly in the real world. I think that's a, a pretty big, big challenge that we're all facing. Um, the, the other sort of brief comment I'll make is that, um, you know, I've, I've long been interested in the importance of ethical principles, AI principles, governance structures, and have worked on this for much of my career, in addition to deploying AI in practice in many, many different contexts. I drafted the AI principles at Google and worked on their implementation um, uh, for, for, for many years, and, and I actually think uh, internally, I feel very, uh, well, ha having insight into how it was received internally, I feel very optimistic about the fact that we could have quite significant institutional change as a result of operationalizing AI principles. So, so far, many of the AI principles I feel, you know, around the world, and there are upwards of 100 or so governments and other institutions that have made statements about AI, um, haven't had the opportunity to operationalize them in practice. At Google, we did, because we had many, many different pieces of infrastructure, products, uh, you know, uh, partnerships with third parties through cloud, which touched on um, you know, sensitive aspects of AI principles and required very, very thoughtful consideration with respect to their interpretation and application. And so I think, you know, once again, just to understate, there needs to be opportunities for operationalizing principles so that their effectiveness can be properly scrutinized and then those principles themselves can be updated. And I think that's an important part of this whole framework. And thank you, Mustafa. And this is exactly the perspective I'm coming from uh, out in the fleet where we're operationalizing these uh, autonomous systems. We are literally, I know we had August Cole uh, here earlier this morning, we are literally burning in the kit uh, in the real world out there in the, uh, in the waters surrounding the Arabian Peninsula. So uh, as you can see, we have a great panel here. Uh, we've got the full triple helix, government, academia, and industry represented. So we're gonna get, get right into it in this topic of uh, defense autonomy and trust. Here's the first question. I'm going to ask Jane this, if you'll get us started, and then we'll ask others to comment on it as well. What is uniquely challenging about trust in defense autonomous systems relative to their other use cases? This could be ethical, organizational, technological, social in nature. So just kind of an open-ended question there to get us started, but we wanted to start with you, Jane. So if you could take that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think the challenges are plenty. Uh, the first is really a definitional challenge, actually establishing what trust means, uh, establishing the definition. If you Google it, by the way, you'll get about 300 definitions of trust. And then being able to tie any of those definitions to something measurable and also to mission success uh, is very difficult. On the one hand, we have the kind of societal and organizational trust that we're trying to get to, for instance, with our international partners, uh, trust in adopting new technology, and on the very other end of the spectrum, um, we have warfighter trust, uh, trust and reliance on their equipment in a real uh, operational scenario. Now, especially in that situation, I think we should be very careful with our language. Um, trust is, we often talk about trust as something we can build or gain. Um, I don't necessarily think that's the best language. 
uh, trust, or as we actually refer to it in the DOD, justified confidence, should actually be something that's calibrated. You only want to trust your, and rely on your technology where you know it has been tested and where you know it's going to perform well. And otherwise, we actually want our warfighters to be very skeptical um, of the technology if it hasn't been tested or if it is known to degrade in certain environments. Uh, so again, the calibrated justified confidence is really what we're trying to get to. Now, also in the DOD, we operate obviously in very complex environments. We operate um, in environments where decisions are made sometimes very fast um, and very often in a very hierarchical uh, way. And so figuring out what trust or even assurance as a better defined term means in that context uh, exactly and how to establish those assurance cases, how to build the body of arguments and evidence needed to convince uh, somebody that their system is justifiably trustworthy uh, is actually very, uh, very difficult. Uh, notably, this problem is in many cases similar to a problem that industry has. So there is a lot to be learned from industry but we do often operate in environments where our stakes are higher and the consequences of failure are considerably higher. So the DOD needs to simultaneously partner with industry and learn from industry and academia in this case, but also invest in their own research, invest in their own technology that will elevate uh, the test science and the assurance science uh, to the level of, of our high stakes. Go ahead, uh, Jeff. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to add a little bit to one of the things Jane said there. In, in commercial applications, as, as self-driving cars being one example, a lot of the trust focuses on the safety side of it. Is anything bad going to happen if I do this? What's interesting in a, in a military situation, we're already in a not that safe environment uh, if it's being used. And so the other side becomes much more important, which is can I trust the system to perform the job I need it to do, or am I going to have to send a human to make sure I get the job done? At the same time, there's the other risk, which is uh, against a difficult adversary, uh, am I not being safe by not deploying it because I really need this or, or I'm going to lose? Um, and so I think that trust... Um, comes from experience. There's lots of things we do to, to, to build trust, to improve this, the safety of systems. But I always ask people, why do you get on an airplane? That's not even AI or autonomous, but there's a lot of work that goes into making them safe. Um, some of us could understand the work that goes into it, but the reason I get on an airplane is not because of all that analysis. It's just that I see a lot of them fly pretty frequently, and it usually turns out well. And so the only way we're going to get to that point is to start using these, these systems. De definitely, and that's what we're seeing play out, uh, you know, as we put more systems into use in the real world and, you know, where it's hot and sandy and salty. And, uh, you know, Joe, did you want to comment on anything that's been said to this point or, or take that one step further? Uh, yeah, I'll just, I think, you know, just from the operational, just reinforce, I think, some of the things that Jane said and Mustafa, an interesting piece. You know, for, for the operational level, I mean, the ex you know, the expectations, I think, for the military is, number one, we're going to, we need, to, we need to arm them with the best technology that's out there. So that's why investment is really important in doing this. And it is a difficult task in the Pentagon to get the right investment in the right place. As I, Secretary Gates used to tell me when I was his assistant that you know, there's a river of money that runs into the Pentagon. No one likes to hear that, but it's true. There's a lot of money that's misinvested, and this is where we're kind of underinvested. But investing in the research and development, the technology, the making sure it's well tested, getting the operator, the people that are going to actually be out there that accept the consequences of, of using that autonomous system, you know, they've got to get comfortable with it. Get them, get them in early on on the testing and the evaluation. Simulation is really important because it maybe doesn't get you all the way there, but it's a very efficient and effective way to get you there. But, but again, ultimately, for the people out on the battlefield, it's going to be, it's going to be the cognitive piece that plays with the machine. It's going to be their sensing, their knowledge, their experience. Uh, those traits that are in the human probably can't be replicated to some degree, and, and ultimately, they're going to have to make the, you know, they're going to have to make the decision on it. You know, from the adversarial piece of it, again, you know, you can. You know, I think it's very important to have ethical standards. You know, there's legal standards, ethical standards. Um, all of those things are important for us to establish because of the, whatever, maybe the democratic types of nations that we are. But advocary, adversaries don't care. They're not going to comply with any of those. Their ultimate goal without consideration of collateral damage or typically they don't care. If they get their mission done, destroy something, they're fine. They're always going to be after our systems. They're always going to try to infiltrate them, compromise them. And as I think you hit it on a, it's unlike, you know, it's an, 
and a car is at safety, but you don't have people actually trying to undermine your system, and they'll constantly do that. But to me, that also means you can never you can never cut that relationship off with constant innovation, constant collaboration with commercial and, and, and academia, because that's where the innovation keeps coming. Because my hope is when we get it, we hope we've got the best that there is. And then the resiliency of the systems. You just got to have something that's resilient. Are you going to trust what information you see because they've either injected false things in there? I mean, those are the types of things that most of the smart not the old guys like me, but the smart young operators who are out there running these systems are very, very cognizant of. They think about the second and third order potential effects of what they do. And so I think, yeah, the, the technology piece of it, but you got to get them in. They're smart. They're tech savvy. This generation is so tech savvy. Get them in early on. It, yeah, they'll be, it's easy to learn how to hit a target you know, with, a, with a weapon or aim, put an aim point somewhere that you want it to go. But this type of stuff, it has to be taught. They'll learn it, but we got to start very early on to have the trust. Maybe not the trust, just the, the confidence in what they're using is a tool that will help them be successful, help them be mission success, save lives, and not have collateral damage. Mustafa, any comments on, on what you heard to this point uh, on this the discussion of trust? Uh, could you, you know, give the kind of industry perspective? Yeah, I, I don't know about the industry perspective, but I think one thing that I've observed in practice is that um, utility is essential for creating trust. Like above all else, you don't have to understand, I mean, people don't have to understand how the system does what it does, but if, you, if people have the opportunity to observe that it is effective in practice, that is the most powerful source of building trust. And what I've experienced is that, um, you know, people will quite quickly adjust and accept uh, a system operating fairly autonomously if it continuously performs well. And that has, you know, pros and cons, right? I've, I've seen people get complacent um, and permit a system, maybe not operating entirely independently, but certainly having significant, you know, free reign on some of its actions. Um, and, and that complacency is dangerous because the kind of human who is supposed to be overseeing a system and monitoring it, you know, say minute by minute, um, it's, it's quite difficult for a human to spot an error or an anomaly, one in a hundred, right? And to pay attention for, you know, every single one of those moments and, and really care, especially when you get accustomed to it performing so well consistently. And so I, I do think that like utility drives it, but people will get very complacent very quickly. And I think, you know, it's also important to think about the other um, commercial actors which are making progress really, really fast in the space. So it's probably better to, to have the expectation that you know, sort of national defense programs are unlikely to have a significant strategic advantage in this area for very long periods of time. I think that, you know, uh, we talked about Ukraine a little bit this morning with, with sort of Turkish, uh, you know, drones. You know, these are inherently dual use uh, tools. And so the commercial incentive to have, you know, various kinds of UAVs, whether in the water or in the air or on the road, is going to drive their you know, sort of production and therefore their proliferation much, much faster than, you know, sort of the, the, the defense, you know, procurement uh, approach. And, and that's going to create a lot of tension for us because I think many, many actors are going to be able to get hold of them and, and use them in ways that we might not like. Yeah, Mustafa, I, just a, a comment from, from my perspective. I, I can literally see this playing out uh, as we, we deploy various, you know, USVs with various levels of trust. And you, you know, once the, the platform performs like you expect it to, you, you do not revisit it as much as you would, would normally expect to. And so I can see, you know, this kind of playing out in the real world. Jane, uh, can you talk a little bit about the uh, CDAO's um, ethical uh, perspectives? Uh, I just want to go vertical on that for a minute. And I know you, you've got some... Did you craft those, by the way? I did not, okay. but we do have some people in the room who did. Um, so the we are the first military to adopt the um, ethical principles for AI. Uh, since then, multiple other nations have done so. Uh, and where we stand now with CDAO is we're trying to move into implementation. So we have the five ethical principles at this point. Uh, we um, have got direction from the deputy secretary to advance them across six different tenets. You, you, you can all probably find this online, so I won't belabor all of the, the, the various lists of things. Um, but 
now we're moving into no kidding implementation. And so what we're working on and what we're awaiting uh, a signature on from the Deputy Secretary's office is uh, a formal kind of pathway forward um, that will, no kidding, task various organizations in the Department of Defense with very specific actions as far as actually putting these principles into practice. Uh, a lot of it does overlap with test and evaluation, uh, quite a bit of it actually does, uh, but there are also multiple other pieces. Uh, responsible AI is kind of everybody's job in the department, and so there are pieces of it that have to do with the international allies, there are pieces of it that have to do with responsibly acquiring these systems and responsibly developing these systems, and kind of, again, crafting all of those arguments and evidence that go into responsible AI. Uh, thank you, Jane. I, I'm gonna go to an audience question here. And I'm just going to, this be a jump ball, so anybody that wants to take it here. What are some of the quantifiable ways that DOD can measure trust? A jump ball there. I'll start. Okay. <laughs> I'll jump on that one. Uh, so probably the easiest way for, for us to do it um, has been uh, measuring reliance, right? Trust tends to, tends to manifest itself in reliance. And, and so in our tests, uh, and this is something that's very different for us. If you think, so I'm a career operational tester. Um, that means that you know I've participated in testing multiple uh, systems that the DoD has acquired over the years. Now, if I'm testing a tank, I would never give during the test an opportunity for my operator to not use a tank. Um, during the test, right? But with AI, that's actually precisely, we're having to incorporate basically free play um, into the way that we plan uh, these events because we have to give the operator an opportunity to not rely uh, on the system if they don't find it sufficiently trustworthy. So reliance is probably the easiest and the most straightforward way uh, to, to do it. Uh, additionally, we also look at emergence of human behavior. Right, if they actually start to rely on that technology, do they take on additional tasks? Do they come up potentially with you know, off-label uses for the technology, as, as uh, most service members tend to do when, um, when given the opportunity? So all of that has to be incorporated in our, in our evaluation. Uh, and I want to stress here the importance of, in general, focusing and measuring human factors, which is uh, something that I think traditionally we have not paid enough attention to. You know, Jane, I want to... I wanna talk about uh, T&E and, and actually go past T&E. I know you've, you've got a very uh, deep background in this. This question is for Joe and, and, and Jeff. The DOD has been doing T&E for decades, right? What new tools does the department need to go beyond T&E and deliver autonomous uh, capability at pace? At pace is also, you know, something we talked about this morning. But, um, if you could. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, uh, that gets to the to the root of a, a big difference in, in how procurement and and management of systems is done, right? So the DoD largely works in a, in a in a waterfall process, where requirements are specified up front. A long time is spent developing. There's some kind of acceptance test, and then the thing goes out to the field. Of course, that's not how the tech industry does it, right? They have an agile process, right? They do continuous development, continuous integration, and continuous testing. And so the example I like to give is, is at Uber, we never did demos, ever, because we had two code builds a day that went out to the track for testing, and the, and the ones that succeeded went out to the road. And so when a VIP came by asking for a demo, we said just hop in the next test run. Uh, because we were always doing it. So to get back to your question where we've got to change is we've really got to get to a testing and evaluation regi regime that's a everyday testing during development, but even after deployment, that the testing is in development is continuing every single day. And ideally, there would be uh, test sites that are maybe not in harm's way, but there's a tight connection between what folks are seeing, like at TF-59, mm -hmm. saying, hey, we're seeing this with our, with our system, and they can go back and run it back home on their test thing, again, because there's a test every day anyway. Just try it the next day. You know, Jeff, I just want to interject a point here. This is kind of the value prop for Task Force 59. We want uh, the warfighter to be an intimate part of that, uh, that process you discussed. And so we have kind of inserted ourselves into that equation uh, because we're, we're the problem holders and we want uh, to bring, you know, the problem holders together with the solution providers. Uh, Joe and Mustafa, did you have anything to add to that or just uh, did you want to comment? Um, just, uh, yeah, a couple of uh, um, 
Yeah, what, what's a metric? So, you know, I obviously come from the soft community. A metric is use. <laughs> Because people in the soft community who are engaged in conflict virtually every single night, so they're driven away from complacency. You, you just, because complacency actually, in, in its most basic sense, translates to casualties. So, so, they're, so the guys in the special operations community became, complacency was never a word in their vocabulary because they experience it every night and every, and there's always chance, there's always fog, there's always, fa all those things, whatever the trite comment about your plan never survives first contact. And that's why the cognition piece, I think, for operators becomes, becomes so important. Um, but I, but I, I think is it, you know, from the, from the department perspective, so I won't, won't get it, it's a completely frustrating environment in the Def Department of Defense. The resources aren't aligned, the people aren't aligned, you can't take a, you can't take a new development or new technology that somebody comes in with and you, that thing needs to be tracked and moved from, it starts as a new technology, starts as it looks something good, but it's got to some way have a pathway all the way to our program. It's all about money. You know, even in, in the role I had as undersecretary for, you know, supposedly oversight of NSA, NGA, DIA, if you don't have the money, you don't have it. And so for people in industry and venture capitalists and people who come in and throw down innovating pieces of technology, I mean, we, first we've got to be innovative, we've got to continue to be that way. Uh, but it, there's just so much bureaucracy, and the bureaucracy resides in Canley. I'll just say in the Navy, all the services, they have all the money. There needs to be, in this particular area of AI, machine learning, and autonomy needs to be a single point. I call it a task force, reports to the Secretary of Defense, and what he puts out is not recommendations, it's directions and orders, so to speak, or we'll never kind of get synergy and alignment to be able to bring to bear all the benefits of, of autonomy. And at the same time, where uh, there's so many tests and evaluation, I think every service has one. Right? You know, we just need to synergize some of our efforts, and then, you know, whatever, try something, fail fast, move forward. Uh, and I think that kind of lacks in the department. But I mean, it's it's gotten better, I think, but for the people probably out here who are always trying to figure out how to get into it, just incredibly bureaucratic. Uh, it takes so much time to get something done. As you said, in commercial, they just iterate it and do it. That's why, you know, moving in, in partnering with uh, in partnering with commercial and, and other firms out there that are actually doing this. I mean, we used to say a couple of things. 80% of the solutions out there for all of our technology, AI, machine, all that, that's already in industry. We just need to take it and engineer it for us, and I and I think that's the truth. And it, and it, the other piece I'd before I, you know, it is information dominance. That's what all this is about: being able to dominate, understand information. That's why AI and machine learning. That's what we need: information and success down the road, and having it better than anyone else. But this is where it resides, uh, and I, you know, just pushing for that partnership. But it, it won't be critical of any any of the people in the leadership. But it does take does take somebody just jamming it down the throats candidly of, of others say, you can't go off in your own direction. The services have their own money. Pick a lead service, give it to them, empower them, give them the resources, give them the decisions, establish somebody who reports to the secretary every, I mean, this area of we're talking about is important enough in my mind to, to actually put into that, into that framework. And then candidly, better figure out how to work with Congress uh, because that's a key and critical element to it. But aligning those things up, I think will posture us for it's not novel, it's not new, we just need to keep pushing forward uh, on, on trying to get to that position where we just open up our arms, embrace it, understand the risks, move forward, get it out there, give it a try, teach people, make sure they have, they have confidence in it by using it, uh, and, and involve them, simulate it. Those are the types of things I think that'll gain us the, the better, the, the generation, will, generation will take it and run with it. We just have to offer them the opportunity to get it and, and use it, so. Uh, thank you, Joe. I'm going to actually shift gears ag again here and go to another uh, uh, audience question. And this one's actually, I'm going to associate myself with this, having stood up a new task force. And, you know, we talk a, about, a lot about robotics and AI. But, you know, my main focus has been getting the talent uh, necessary to, uh, to build a task force that can deliver at pace. And this one's for you, for you Mustafa. Having built a couple, you know, very successful uh, companies, uh, are there changes needed to how we recruit, train, and educate the force for them to have confidence in autonomous systems and AI-driven systems? No. <laughs> yes, of course. Okay. So, I, I think it's got to be... Um, look, I, I think the good news and bad news at the same time is that these systems are getting much, much easier to build. So the technical know-how the uh, you know, capital resource required is going down, the technical know-how is proliferating, and people without PhDs in machine learning can take advantage of APIs. Uh, they can very quickly implement things which are being open sourced. 
And that is, you know, good on the one hand because I think it broadens your pool of uh, people from which you can recruit. Um, but on, on the other, I think, you know, it means that, you know, many, many different adversaries are going to get their hands on these kinds of techniques, like, really, really quickly. And people are sharing insight and know-how on the web all the time. Um, and, and when I say open source, I mean, like, really the, the weights of the model and the code to implement the model and the training data that it was trained on, uh, you know, are increasingly open source and, and widely available. So I don't actually think that the problem is as big as it might have looked five years ago when we may have thought that, you know, you can only hire extremely qualified, very, very expensive people from Silicon Valley and they need to be on full-time staff and so on within you know, the DOD. I think that is really changing very, very rapidly and is only going to continue changing, especially when it comes to the development of the algorithms. Obviously, integrating them into your existing hardware is a completely different story, but the, the plain development of the algorithms, I think, is much more accessible. Mm. Uh, Jane and uh, Jeff, could you comment on that as well, or just uh, anything that uh, Mustafa has mentioned that you wanted to talk about? I, I think in general, t talent is always the biggest issue, right? Maintaining, retain, uh, retaining and, and acquiring talent and keeping them in the DoD long enough, uh, especially when our hiring pipelines are reasonably slow compared to industry, especially when we pay lower than industry. Uh, it, it's definitely making it more difficult uh, for us. Now, with the CDAO, we are merging, one of the organizations we're merging with is Defense Digital Systems. They do have uh, kind of a, in the DOD, a well-known and, and allegedly magical uh, hiring pipeline that I'm really looking forward to learning about. They're considerably more creative than the rest of the department and how they hire um, and how they retain their staff. So I'm looking forward uh, to seeing what that's like. Um, in the end of the day, we do have a very unique mission, and I do think that that does attract enough individuals. Certainly what attracted me to the DOD is the mission. It is not the pay. Um, so, but, but I think another thing we're kind of changing our minds on is what does employment in the DOD look like? Because I think historically we've seen people come into the DOD and make a career of it. Um, and, and now we're seeing people like Sunman, like many others in the room, who have given a few years to the DOD, and then they go either back to or just go to private industry. And I think we're starting to really appreciate that. Come in, work with us for a couple of years, we'll absorb your greatness, and then if you want to have a, a fantastic career elsewhere, that's okay. And then now we have even better uh, industry partners uh, in those people. Uh, just one quick comment on that. Recruiting talent is always a problem because it's in, in, in high demand at all times. Uh, one of the puzzling things that the, that the U.S. does, of course, is the, is the immigration quotas on, on talented uh, non-Americans who come here. Now, the DOD doesn't usually, wasn't usually in a position to advocate for changing that because those wouldn't be the people they could recruit anyway, but they really should because not having those, those tech positions filled is what creates <laughs> the, the supply and demand mismatch we have. And so I think there's an opportunity there that's missed. Yeah, I, I, no, I, I think you're exactly right. I, you know, it's, I don't know, if you want to look for example, look at the space program. Who ran the space program back in the 60s? You know, we didn't have a whole lot of problem. What did we do? We recruited a bunch of German people that came over there. The, you know, and actually did it. So, so I, I'm kind of with you. The, the other thing, you know, like the security clearances, all those things are very difficult. I'll tell you what, you can't hide much these days. Uh, and, and so is you, the security debacle that I had, that I inherited for security clearances for all the department. So we finally got to the point, where that's all technology. You don't, you don't have to go through, I'll tell you three of my best friends to go ask about my, if I should have a security clearance. That, that's all going away <laughs> because you can visualize people anyway through their networks and everything they've done over their career. So, so that's one thing so you can actually test people, but that's a risk area that we, we should take. We should, in, in my mind, we should embrace people. The other thing on recruiting, you're exactly right. You better make some incentive uh, just because um, your assistant is a reserve. Yes. A highly smart intellectual person that's a in the reserves and so spends most of her time in industry using her intellectual capital and doing some yeah. great things, but can come in and reserve duty. Yeah. To me, maybe that's a good way to hook people into the world that don't want to spend all their times in, in uniform. And listen, everybody doesn't have to carry a rifle and march and do all those things. We need mm -hmm. to get away from that. 
that piece too, but how do you yeah. incentivize? I just think there's ways to do it. You gotta get people to do public service though. They gotta get a, could be invested a little bit in some level of public service, whether they, again, go in the reserves and spend most of their time in industry working at Google, but maybe once a year they spend two weeks with us and that inculcates and they can bring into bear what I think will help with that yeah. recruiting. It's a, it's a tough nut. And if Joe, if I could, could talk about that for a minute, we are leveraging the reserves in a big way at Task Force 59. Uh, it just so happens, uh, you know, a lot of our talent is reservist. Among them, we have two Forbes 30 under 30. One of them is in the room with us today, Skylar Moore. Obviously, she's a big a player in this space. Uh, my deputy, when we stood up the task force, was the uh, CEO for a $1 billion cybersecurity company. Uh, we've also got you know, Elsa Kania helping us out. I don't know if you know her. She wrote, wrote a book on, uh, called Fighting to Innovate on Chinese Innovation. So there's a lot of talent in the reserves, and we've been we can, kind of plucking that on Task Force 5-9. You know, sabbaticals and things, you know, we started sabbaticals. I'll, I'll tell you from my community, the SEAL community, when I was running that, no SEAL wanted to go to the Naval War College, the Army War College. Where'd they want to go? They wanted to go to Harvard, Stanford, Yale, somewhere where they could be immersed in something kind of different. And then they come out with whatever, you know, uh, some, we had two or three guys went to the London School of Economics. I mean, so that type of immersion, the military just needs to be different. They don't forget how to fight but mess around with their mind, you know, get their minds engaged in these types of things. And then companies, whatever, like a Google, a sabbatical that would go for two years and work and learn and have an understanding of it. It just inculcates the, those types of programs. We just need to, there's plenty of money to do that, but, you know, all that we got to keep all of those institutions that we have in the military. But I think we personally, we'd be better served getting educated and, and immersing ourselves somewhere where we're not comfortable. One, uh, one of the other key things that we leverage there at Task Force 59 is allies and partners. And this, this is another audience question, uh, and Jane, this one's for you. So you spoke about measures that the United States is taking to earn allies' trust in AI and autonomous systems. How are we taking the standards of our allies and partners around AI into account? So the Jake and now CDAO, we do run on what's called Partnership for Defense. It is a um, collaboration with 13 other nations. Um, and, and then we have special, of course, bilateral um, conversations and agreements as well with other countries. Uh, we discuss at length things like our ethical principles and exactly how uh, we're implementing them. We exchange lessons learned. Um, in the case of our UK colleagues, even exchange technology in some cases for, for assurance and test evaluation. In fact, uh, the concept of AI assurance and building an assurance case was actually largely documented in the UK, so we worked um, a lot with the UK MOD to, uh, to borrow some of those principles. Any other comments on uh, partners and allies in this space and trust, uh, defense, and autonomy? I, I, no, I, I mean engaging with partners. I mean, I'm a big advocate. I, of course, I spend every quarter over at NATO trying to convince, and it's a difficult, but the bottom line is, I don't know, maybe it goes back to the old saying that old historians know, the, you know, what Marshall used to always say, hey, never go to war alone and don't stay very long. So, mm -hmm. so, but that does, you know, partnerships and building partnerships with NATOs and Five Eyes and sharing our practices, and, uh, you know, I think that's a really, and you have to embrace it and you have to take a little risk. I mean, it took me my whole time at the Defense Department to be able to get the Five Eye partners into the skiffs. Come on, guys, what do you, you know? We just got to embrace partnerships, and you got to do that to a level with industry and take some risk. But that's the only way you're going to get that advantage. It does is some risk, but I think it's it's an important. You know, partnerships are just. Well, we've got a we've got about five or six minutes left. I actually wanted to just do a quick round round the horn and any closing remarks. Really, any topic that interests you, and I'll, I'll start with uh, Mustafa if you if you want to lead us off here in this uh, discussion about defense, uh, uh, autonomy, and trust. Yeah, I mean, I, mean uh, I, I think it's an interesting conversation. I think the, the, the main question is to maybe not over-index on, on the role of autonomy. I mean, autonomy has its place to play, but I think it comes a little further down the line than we currently are with developing AI systems. So, you know, there's, there are a lot of very useful, practical ways that we can deploy machine learning systems, um, you know, that, that I think will give us much more control, build much more trust, and establish a precedent of these systems being, you know, accountable to us and useful. And then over time, as we've, like, demonstrated empirically that they can be contained, uh, you know, fully under our control and safe, 
then I think we can sort of, you know, come closer to the question of, of, of autonomy. But I, I, sometimes I feel that we're sort of rushing ahead before we've even demonstrated to ourselves that we can control these systems. And I, I, I think, you know, in, in many cases, that's not really proven out yet. Uh, Joe, any, any comments either on that or any just any, yeah, any other topics? Yeah. I mean, I think what you just said, Mustafa, we used to don't run to your death. <laughs> you know, that's how we, that's how we kind of put it. Hey, make sure you understand the environment you're going to and understand. But I do, but I do believe that, you know, keep the balance right between you know, the, the cognitive capabilities, you know, the sensing, the knowledge, the experience of the people that are going to have to use the systems and, and just be, be very careful as you, you know, careful as you move along, I think. Uh, and then including, including those that have to use them, you know, in everything you do, whether it's a testing and evaluation and whether it's the, the education piece. Again, I, I don't, even have an advanced education, but as you said, I don't need it to appreciate what AI is and what other people can do and gaining confidence and, and, and bringing those in. And, and you just have to, you know, don't, you can't give up. You know, all the small startups, all the venture capitalists that put money into these things, we just have to persist and, and try to get into the rapid, you know, proof of concept, authorities to operate, all those things, and, and there needs to be an iterative path for, all the, uh, path for all the people that are willing to help the Defense Department. We just need to kind of make it more as efficient as we can, and I know Jane works on that all the time, and there, there just needs to be a synergy on, on doing that and, and, and making sure the, the benefits of artificial intelligence and machine learning are, are being brought to bear in the Defense Department, while at the same time, candidly, it's the companies who are investing get a return on investment. I mean, that's just the way it is, and it should be that way, and it ought to be beneficial to them. So um, I'm just, again, I'll always encourage the, the partnerships. I never, I never said no to a company that wanted to come in and talk to me, and that was a Mattis piece. Mattis entertained any single company, small or otherwise, that wanted to talk. He would invite them in, so I'm going to listen to you. And, he, and the reason was is because maybe if you're listening to them, the rest of the people that live in that clay layer mm -hmm. that haven't had a creative thought in 20 years mm -hmm. but are still resting around <laughs> in, in the department are willing to embrace the new yeah. new energy that's going. Uh, and I'll and Joe, I can tell you we have the same approach at Task Force 59. Um, Jeff, any final words? Yeah, exactly. I, I, I would just like to advocate a little bit for DOD's increased engagement with academia. They've, ch they've They've tended to treat this a little bit arm's length, just from a data security, information security point of view, but there's much lost opportunity there. And just to give yet another example, on the early side, on the requirements side, you know, if you ask a warfighter what they want, they, they, we, we often see an answer that looks like, well, I want an autonomous wingman. Uh, yeah. They'll be next to me, I'll tell them where to go, and there'll be an extra set of eyes for me, I'll look at what they can see, it's gonna be awesome. And then you ask a, an academic, and an academic will say, well, that's cognitive overload. You don't need more jobs to do. And by the way, the technology is already advanced far enough where they can be fully autonomous and take missions on their own. So it's just a much different perspective, and I would advocate for having more of those conversations. Yes, Jeff, and, uh, and I couldn't agree with you more. There's such value in that uh, triple helix approach, you know, government, academia, and industry. Looking forward to partnering with you in the future. All right, Jane, I guess the final word's gonna be yours. Uh, I get the last word, I love it. Uh, I guess I, I want to just focus on the importance of AI assurance uh, in order to build the kind of trust that we discussed here today, both for the warfighter, but also uh, for all of the other assurance stakeholders. In the end of the day, we really cannot put all our resources into fielding AI-enabled systems without making sure that they work first. Um, the DOD has never operated that way, and we will continue uh, to, to operate in, in an assured uh, system space. Um, if we were to kind of flood our warfighters today with untrustworthy uh, or incapable systems, not only would we uh, waste taxpayer dollars, but we would also um, potentially have catastrophic consequences, and we would erode warfighters' trust uh, in their equipment. And so we're really kind of at the forefront of either creating a foundation of AI integration or AI skepticism. Um, and so I think we all agree in, on the direction that we actually want to go. Uh, and what we want to do is use AI assurance to, uh, an, to achieve asymmetric advantage over our peer and near-peer adversaries by creating much more robust uh, AI-enabled systems, by being able to experiment with them during test events, by figuring out their operational envelopes, and by understanding where they're most risky and how we can mitigate those risks. Oh, thank you, Jane, and uh, thank you, Jeff, and Joe, and Mustafa, 
Uh, and thank you, Applied Intuition and Atlantic Council for uh, hosting us today. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I know I did. This is particularly relevant to my work and, and well worth the trip. So uh, I think we're off to the, to the next event. I can see them uh, lining up here. So thank you for you. Thank you to our panel for that in-depth conversation around trust and defense autonomous applications, t and &E, and reiterating topics around talent flows and strategy. It's definitely an important topic that has spanned many panels already today, and it also underpins how we execute on everything we've already discussed. Now, please welcome Nan Mulchandani, the incoming Chief Technology Officer at the Central Intelligence Agency, who will introduce our next panel. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, hopefully, this is going to be waking you up from your uh, slumber after all the other ones. Just kidding. This is going to be a really exciting panel. Uh, have some really amazing people uh, here. Uh, just incredibly lucky to, uh, to have this panel here. Um, so we are going to be talking about uh, acquisition around uh, commercial autonomy, so breaking the defense barrier for commercial autonomy. Um, let me start with the quick intros here. And um, so we've got uh, Devika Raj, who's the CEO of Crowd AI, uh, a really hot startup uh, around computer vision and uh, autonomy in San Francisco. Uh, had the good, uh, good luck of working with uh, Devika and her team when I was at the uh, Joint Artificial Intelligence Center. They did actually a lot of work for us. Uh, Mike Brown, who's the uh, current head of uh, DIU, and actually a six-year veteran of the U.S. federal government, so uh, was a presidential innovation fellow, and now four years of uh, heading up DIU, so uh, that's great. Uh, Chris Bros, who's uh, the chief strategy officer over at Andril, and um, so he'll represent, obviously, the commercial side of, of the world, but also uh, was at the, uh, in the Senate as a, as a staffer for uh, uh, Senator John McCain and uh, actually author of, a, of an amazing book called Kill Chain, which uh, is in top of my list uh, in terms of thinking through uh, some of the defense issues. And then uh, Angel Smith, who's at Microsoft, who will be joining us virtually today, uh, who focuses on uh, partner mission solutions and uh, the customer expansion side of, of Microsoft. So welcome. So I'm just going to jump right in. And um, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, we'll get a bunch of uh, questions from the uh, audience as well. But I've got a couple of topics that I wanted to jump in first. So the biggest question, um, I've been at the, I was at the DOD for almost two and a half years and dealt with uh, trying to bring in cost, uh, commercial solutions, not only across the board for healthcare and logistics and others, but autonomy as well. We had an autonomy product that we uh, worked with. Um, so the question is, and, and why this is such a great panel, is we've got um, Chris, who will represent sort of the uh, legislative side of the world. We've got uh, Mike, who will represent the government along with me maybe, and, uh, and Devaki and Angel, the commercial side. Is this, a, is this acquisition of commercial products, uh, whether it be for autonomy or in general, a systemic issue, or are we dealing with a tactical problem that we can either legislate or fix with a simple fix? So why don't we start with Chris, sort of from the legislative side, and then work our way to the government, and then have the commercial folks get in there. Sure. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here, and um, I've been out of the legislative body for three and a half years, so far be it for me to ever speak for the Senate, um, but definitely informs a perspective that I bring. Um, I, I would start off the bat and say I think we have a systemic problem, but I would also kind of broaden the aperture to say it goes well beyond uh, acquisition and it goes well beyond commercial technology. Um, you know, I think the acquisition system comes in for a lot of blame, and it deserves most of it, um, but this, the problem is actually kind of the entire way that the government sort of thinks about and engages with technology, commercial, defense, or otherwise. Um, and that process starts well to the left of acquisition with how they define requirements, which turns into how they build programs, how they construct budgets for programs, how they go through a typically very long acquisition process to then get funding authorized, funding appropriated to go buy the thing that they wrote a requirement for. By this point, about 10 to 12 years ago, um, and the whole system is kind of set up to, to, to think about, engage with, procure technology that looks largely like large Cold War capital platforms. Um, the kinds of things that we, we built military power in the last century around, uh, but increasingly uh, are not the things we're going to be building military power around in the future. 
Um, add to that the pace at which technology is changing. Add to that the pace at which our uh, strategic competitors are moving in terms of the threats that they're fielding. You know, we talk about them in a lot of cases as the near peer, but I think what we, we don't realize is that in many cases we've become the near peer, um, where they're actually superseding us and outpacing and outcycling us. So you, you kind of step back and look at this whole process that, that literally has you know, well-meaning people across the entirety of it, right? These are good people trying to do their best in the role that they've been put in. Um, but you kind of look at it and imply some common sense. And you know, you've got people who are trying to define the requirements for technology that they think they're going to need in the year 2032 um, with the expectation that it's going to be bought in a very long time from now. And the whole thing is systemically broken. And I guess just to kind of put a bow on it, um, you kind of look at this process that we have, that we engage with all technology through. Um, and at a time where we are being systemically disrupted, both by our threat and by the pace of technology, we are, we are working in a system that has uh, largely become impervious to disruption. And I think the challenge for all of us is how do we disrupt ourselves and nonetheless find a way to get good solutions, autonomous capability, be it commercial mm -hmm. defense or otherwise, through a process faster, fielded and out into uh, the hands of operators at a faster pace. So before I hand it to Mike, so it sounds like you're saying we're trying to set requirements, uh, which obviously is the customer's problem, the DOD or, or the intel, intel agencies, et cetera. We have to set requirements, but we're setting requirements for, because the funding process is two, three, five years in advance, we're trying to forecast what we're gonna need then, which in the technology industry is just complete, you know, I wouldn't say batshit crazy, but it is, because uh, you can't forecast out five years what's going to happen because the commodities, the curves move in a different way. Uh, so by the time it gets to appropriation and everything, we're appropriating the wrong thing. And this is the stuff that then Mike gets fed to you, and then you've got to go out and deal with the vendors and try to get them incented. So how's it, how's it been? Well, first of all, how's it going? <laughs> uh, I find myself, as often as the case, agreeing with everything that Chris said. Uh, it's very systemic problem, and it's rooted from the time when the DOD developed its own technology, or most of it. In 1960, the U.S. Defense Department and Defense Primes were one-third of global R&D. That number is now 3%. But we have not changed the processes since the McNamara era to recognize most of innovation is happening outside the Pentagon, not, not inside. So what Chris said is true for... Uh, everything that we buy, especially large weapons platforms, but we, in, the, in fact, need a complementary system for commercial technology. Because yeah. if you think requirements make sense for uh, an F-35, probably does, it's not a commercial F-35. Spending 20 years developing those requirements is batshit crazy. But <laughs> uh, for commercial products, you don't need that requirements process. Why would we go out and tell someone to make software or small drones, here's what we want you to build? That limits our creativity and competition. So we really want to open ourselves to the creativity of the market to see what they can deliver. And I've seen cases where when we start with requirements, we've narrowed the market immediately. So we should be expanding the competition. DOD has an explicit objective to increase the base of vendors who support us. Well, we're not going to get it if we start with requirements and narrow that from the very beginning. So what I've learned is that the three aspects of bringing capability in, requirements, acquisition, and budgeting, they all have to be moving in parallel. All the reforms been on acquisition. Uh, as Chris said, maybe that's because it deserved it. But now there's been almost no reform on requirements and none on budgeting. And they're equally limiting us. So for, for commercial products especially, we need to figure out where we're going to buy those. Today, we don't even know where we're going to buy commercial satellite imagery or small drones. There's not one place to go at DOD. We need to make sure we're funding those ongoing assessments and fielding them right away. No sustainment strategy. And then budgeting, we need some help from Congress so that we could have more flexibility rather than a budget you have to think about three years in advance before you can spend a dollar when technology that's coming from some of the commercial world hasn't even started yet. The product isn't even out yet. So there's no way you could forecast what you need. So we need progress in each of those areas and we need it especially in requirements and budgeting to match the reforms that have happened in acquisition. Wow. So, Devaki and Angel, this is your chance to, uh, to go at uh, Mike and, and the DOD and other. Just kidding. Um, yeah, maybe I'll hand it over to Angel because she's from Microsoft, a very much larger company than Crowdai. Um, but then I'll talk about it from a small business perspective. Angel. Yeah, I was, I was going to add on to, I think, what, what uh, Chris had mentioned just a second ago about kind of when we we're talking about 
identifying some of the requirements. Um, so I, I was on the Hill for a few years as well. Um, and one of the things that I thought was pretty interesting is that we're very often seeing requirements being drafted by uh, people inside the Department of Defense that don't necessarily even have a really strong idea about the technology that they're building the requirements for. And so, and that's become, I mean, almost exponentially worse when you start talking about software solutions and other things. And so we're building, not only are we building requirements that are taking years to execute um, in a place where the technology is tra transitioning so fast, but you're also having people build requirements that don't fully understand what the technology where it currently is today or will be in a couple of years from now, which is almost, you know, almost just kind of like orders of magnitude make the problem much, much more difficult. Um, and then whenever you start to kind of think about uh, the acquisition cycle, um, understanding that there needs to be flexibility. You know, we obviously we always look at it from a software perspective on the Microsoft side, but as we start to partner with other these commercial companies that have uh, other pieces of smaller hardware technologies that develop really, really quickly, we're starting to see this bleed over um, also into other things that are that are requiring a lot of flexibility, even on the hardware side. Um, and how we're kind of like it's the Department of Defense and the intelligence community are starting to figure out how to shift their acquisition strategies to some of those things as well, because, you know, that the F-35 of today may actually end up being, you know, a, a swarm of, you know, micro drones in, in three or four years from now. And so how are we shifting also not just on the software side, but how are we thinking about hardware as it gets smaller and uh, those those turnaround times on innovation get shorter and shorter. Yeah, I want to talk about it from a small business perspective. Obviously, the conversation up until now still is very much in the years process. Um, we don't have that luxury as a small company. You've got you know 18 months max before VCs want to see whether or not actually you're actually getting sales on the government side and whether you should be continuing to pursue that strategy. So I think what we've noticed is that there have been pockets of innovation of acquisition that we've been lucky enough to be part of, right? So when we worked on one of DOD's flagship AI projects, um, we were brought in through the DIU. Um, obviously, that process was still very much working with this prime contractor versus subcontractor relationship, but there is pockets of innovation around how to bring businesses in much more quickly for innovative technology and autonomy. As we think about the next level, okay, we don't want to necessarily just stay in that subcontractor position. How do we think about other ways? Obviously, there's the SIBR process, and this is something that a previous panel has talked about. But again, the SIBR process is one very slow, and the transition into program of record is negligible. However, I do think that the SIBR process is bringing in this innovation in ways to open it up to open topics, so it doesn't necessarily mean that we need to have requirements beforehand, which take a lot longer to, to bubble through up the, the process. Um, I think... Um, as we think as a small company, how do we get into the next stage of becoming more, more, like a pro, more like a prime? I think it comes down to how do we explain autonomy from a requirements perspective? Um, and how do we explain autonomy from an acquisition perspective? Um, one of the flagship AI projects that we're working on um, thinks about acquisition in a very interesting way because you can't buy um, algorithms or computer vision in ways that you could buy hardware or licensable software. You have to continuously iterate on it, which means that ownership and IP rights around that has to be kind of ironed out um, well before um, you actually bring on um, providers. And so we think, uh, I think maybe um, courses around acquisition of autonomous systems is something that also needs to be part of these like requirements drafting process. Um, it's very different from hardware. It's very different from software. I mean, it's kind of like software plus. No, that's fantastic. So actually, given that this is, you know, we started out talking generally about acquisition, and I now want to dive a little deeper into what makes autonomy different and special. Um, so let me uh, sort of seed this with when you think of the what I call the sort of older generation of you know the industrial military complex companies that you know were were sort of hardware providers to us in the Defense Department, and now you've got the rise of what I call the software industrial complex companies. Uh, you know who are the ones that can offer up the big juicy stock options and get AI you know folks on on staff you know in hip places like San Francisco. The question is is autonomy is one of those examples where you're melding software. It's next generation software with potentially older generation hardware that the Valley doesn't build. The question becomes, who becomes the integrator? And what's the model by which autonomy gets integrated into these systems? Because 
everyone is the, using the F-35 example or a tank example, the vendor is used to building a fully sealed system, which is you want a tank, I produce a giant tank and I give you the tank. The tank has everything in it. There's no APIs, there's no containers, there's no data center running on it. But the question is, is that they don't have the data, right? The data is collected and stored at the DOD. At the Jake, we had vendors now come in like yourselves, working on Claves with our data so it doesn't leave. The AI algorithms, the IP rights are questionable in terms of who owns what, that, that's something we cleared up. So how do we think of autonomy in particular uh, you know, being different from general acquisition? Probably the most complicated one because of the number of players and the complexity of hardware and software integration and all those pieces. So um, why don't I... You know, I'm happy to talk about one specific example please. of, of, uh, yeah. of, of Just right something in. that we're actually going, going through right now. So um, at CrowdAI, when we first started the company, we started building best-in-class computer vision algorithms. So what we did was the IP rights around the algorithm was, you know, we would own the network architecture and the government would own the model weights as well as the training data and things associated with that. As we started to grow um, our footprint within the US government, we started selling a platform. So the platform is all the end-to-end -end components for a customer themselves to build their own computer vision models. And so we, we um, had a conversation with a DOD agency, and they said, we don't necessarily want to have vendor lock-in with one company when it comes to this end-to-end -end system, because this end-to-end -end system goes from data management to labeling to model development, testing evaluation, and then taking models in production. So would you be willing to sell your platform GOTS? And that was, that was really hard. We're, we're a small software company, and when you say, can you give all of our IP in a GOTS perspective, and then maybe in a year and a half, you know, a very large systems integrator comes in, has access to your IP, and then owns that relationship, that's very difficult. So we actually had to think very creatively about how do you extend these relationships in ways that it's a combination GOTS, COTS approach in order for you to still be able to sell in the ways the DOD is okay with buying when it comes to autonomy while also um, maintaining IP. Um, and you know, there's, you know we, we've, we've tossed around some ideas and obviously the folks in the room probably know a lot more, but which is you know, maybe you have licenses around, you're the only ones that could continue to update the, the software for a number of years, right? And so we have to think about this as a small company all the time. Um, but yeah, I look to you guys for, for answers. <laughs> Mike, do I get? Sure. I, I think uh, we need to much more often think about the fact that we should be taking commercial products as they are, rather than our mentality at DOD is, oh, what we're doing is so unique, and we are a big customer. We're not that big a customer in a lot of these markets now, and, and thinking we're going to design something custom. And when we do that, of course, we get off the mainstream platform that someone's trying to develop, which means you're automatically behind. As soon as you buy it, uh, the first day you buy it, uh, you've started to get behind because the company has moved on with the development platform, and you're still stuck on something you decided to buy when you, when you made that decision. So that locks us into cost curves that are not competitive and technology that's out of date. And my feeling is way too much risk is put on the warfighter because we're not fielding them with the latest equipment. So my experience is we should start with how can I adapt what the commercial market is already using. We need to stay on those platforms and get that cost efficiency. And then I might need to do something else because I'm doing that, but don't start with how do I make it custom and lock DOD into that. that so often, I, and I give you a quick example with autonomy, we worked with the Army to field uh, what they call class one drones, small drones like you would buy as a consumer. <clears throat> we, from their price expectation, uh, we were about 30% of what they thought they were gonna have to pay. That's goodness. It's 17 times what the consumer is paying. Did we ask for requirements that were 17 times better? I don't think so. So we need to change our orientation to get better value. Um. Angel, do you want to, any thoughts on? Yeah, absolutely. And, and honestly, I could apply this even. So, you know, the, the, the part of Microsoft that I work on is, is on our, cl our cloud business, our government cloud business. And we're actually seeing something relatively similar taking place even on the cloud side. And so, you know, number one, in a space where multi-cloud should kind of just be the standard, um, just because we want to give our adversary a targeting problem, um, we're, we're seeing that there's those kind of divides that are that exist, I think, based off of some of the um, acquisition practices and acquisition models that we saw implemented. 
Um, but then if you also think about it on the commercial side, I actually had a really interesting conversation with, um, with the Aussies just a couple of uh, weeks ago, and they were asking, um, is the way that we're actually executing on how we're building clouds the best way to do business? And they actually popped off a question that I thought was actually relative, is a relative um, to this discussion. And that is, they said, would the financial services industry see air gap clouds as the way that we should move forward? Or are they actually executing on a model that would be less expensive and has the same level of security that we would expect on the on the U, on the uh, air gap side for, for different classifications of data, data sets like unclass secret and top secret? And the reality is, is that the commercial industry has the same uh, level of requirements for security in a lot of different ways, but we're not necessarily adopting those models across the government framework because in the end, we applied hard um, hardware solutions to, uh, I think, a technology kind of a, a, an aspect of technology that was not necessarily made for that. So we allowed the tail to wag the dog in some capacity. Um, so I think it's a really good point. Thanks. Chris? You asked earlier, um, who do you think is going to have to play kind of an integration role right. to to really bring this into reality? Right. And you know, I'll, I guess I'll offer a couple of thoughts on that. Um, typically, the answer has been you go to a lead systems integrator who is traditionally kind of expert in building a platform, you know, an aircraft, a fighting vehicle, a ship, um, and all the subsystems, software and hardware, sort of flow up to that lead systems integrator, and it kind of made sense in that model. Mm -hmm. Another answer is the government. Um, and that is a role that the government has played in the past, and I see it trying to play in this kind of uh, autonomous space more and more. And I would contend, and I'm prepared to have the fight, that the government has you know, neither the expertise nor the ability to actually develop and field this, but it is certainly trying in a lot of instances, and I would argue most of that's going to end in tears. Um, so I think the question is, you still need an integrator. It still needs to be from industry, um, but it needs to have different attributes. Mm -hmm. um, I think first and foremost, it's recognizing that autonomous systems are just going to be very different than conventional systems in the mm -hmm. sense that you're not going to be kind of building one. You have to inevitably think of this at a systems or a mission level, right? The question isn't how does one autonomous aircraft burn a hole through the sky. It's how do multiple systems work together, possibly with a human, possibly not, to accomplish a mission uh, that a human being would set mm -hmm. for them. Um, that's not just a question of sort of building an algorithm that can help an you know, AI agent perfectly navigate a totally known environment. That gets into really having deeper expertise in the mission systems, the sensors, perception, um, networking, uh, all of the things that inevitably come together such that the platform itself is almost abstracted out of the equation. Mm. It's, a, it's a means of bringing mission systems into an environment where they can collaborate to higher and higher degrees of autonomy to actually do what a human being wants. And I guess the final thing I'll say on this is you know, the bar for this is not building a good autonomous system. It is building a better system. Hmm. Um, you know, I think what Elon Musk said about Tesla was we don't aim to be the best self-driving car, we aim to be the best car. And that's hmm. actually the bar, right? It's not, you get no points for autonomy working in the DOD. It's either you are effective, efficient, you reduce cost, you reduce manning, or you don't. Um, if you do, you increase the, you know, uh, degree to which users are going to find this a useful capability that they will actually employ. If you don't, it's going to be baggage and dead weight that they'll never take. So I think a lot of this problem is you need an integrator that's capable of actually recognizing that, first and foremost, the people you're working for probably have no idea how they're actually going to employ autonomous systems, and that's totally understandable. Neither mm -hmm. should they. Um, it's more a question of can you actually keep pace with a cycle of learning and development, retraining, both in the digital world and the real world, um, to get a system through, not just a single platform, but a, 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 a sort of autonomous system or family of systems, mm -hmm. a capability um, that is something that is going to be constantly changing and constantly iterating. Mm -hmm. And I would contend that for the kinds of military missions that we're talking about here, it's going to become harder and harder to just buy that off the shelf. And I think what you're looking for, and to, again, the point of your question, is kind of a different type of integrator who can work across those various disciplines, but nonetheless do it in a very non-traditional, disruptive, software-defined, and high-speed way. Because that's the only way this type of capability is going to get fielded over time. So I want to dig a little deeper into this, which is, uh, and this might get a little technical, but you know, here we are. Um, is this going in the direction of needing to build out standardized API sets that 
can allow a hardware vendor, for instance, you know, it's the model of, you know, Dell makes a computer and then you can install your operating system on top and do whatever you want. So the hardware and the software layer gets effectively virtualized to a point where you can have a software vendor put a brain into another piece of hardware. Or is it the model that we still have to have the vertically integrated, factory sealed, factory tested system? Are we saying that, you know, when the DOD acquires, say, autonomous systems on this front, are we going to have to buy it from the single vendor? And to your point, is the integration, this third party integration vendor, are they a software vendor, are they a hardware vendor, or have to have expertise and also be the referee when it comes to having finding that line between who builds the hardware and the software and the brain and who gets to control it? Because we also know with the AI cycle of, you know, one of the questions I think from the audience was, you know, AI software is never done. You're continuously retraining. You're continuously bringing, bringing new data in. Uh, uh, AOR specific deployments. You're not going to deploy the mm -hmm. same AI brain in the South China Sea as you are in Eastern Europe. How do we build this? Because we have a hard time right now absorbing tech. This seems like an insanely complicated problem. Yeah, I, I'll, just a couple of thoughts and then um, one others to oh. jump in here. I mean, I, I think part of the problem is that the government tends to paint with one brush constantly. Mm. Um, not all autonomous systems are created equal. You know, the okay. Group One quadcopter that Mike referenced earlier, the government should just buy it, consume it in like 10 to 12 months, and then buy the next better version when it's available. Um, it's not doing wildly complex autonomous behaviors, and the consequences of failure are pretty manageable. You know, you start getting, you know, up into more complex military systems where level of complexity, the missions that they're going to be performing, the consequences of unpredictable or failed behavior go up and up. The government, I think rightly, has some degree of expectation that they're going to control more of that process. It's going to have a longer timeline associated with it. And they're going to at least want to have the ability to inject their desires and inputs into that process rather than say, you know, integrator or vendor X, you're just going to sell me a black box and I have no idea what's in it. I have no idea how to modernize other parts of it that might be developing faster than other parts of it. Um, I actually think that's a pretty reasonable expectation for the government to have. But I think in the sort of zeal to avoid vendor lock, um, we've wildly overshot the target in the other direction where the government is attempting to build things that they have no credibility or expertise to build, and we're going to end up with no capability. So we'll have no vendor lock, but we'll also have no capability either. So I guess mission accomplished. Sure. Well, the, the key to no vendor lock is continuing to look at what's competitive in the marketplace. Set yourself up to be continuously assessing and qualifying who's got the best. Great companies are not afraid of competing, but we in the government want to think that things aren't changing, back to the McNamara era, and that we can just sort of develop one set of requirements, select one vendor, and buy for 40 years. I don't think we should be doing that anymore at all, but especially not with commercial technology, where the rate of improvement is so fast. So I think the, the key to avoiding vendor lock is planning for those subsequent competitions as frequently as the commercial market brings out new products. We do not have a system to do that today. Uh, I've recommended something called a fast follower strategy, which is exactly that for commercial technology. Buying centers of expertise rather than Army, Navy, Air Force. These technologies are not designed for a service. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe a tank was, maybe a plane was, but these technologies are not. So you need a center of expertise and you need to be thinking about how are you gonna refresh that continuously. On the question of, uh, you know, are we uh, the, the the government serving as a platform integrator? Yeah, that's a that's a terrible idea. Um, I think Chris has that exactly right. It's going to be based on the economics. At low price points, we should be buying something that is a sealed product, and that's the example I gave a moment ago with small drones. The more you get into a very large system, well, now we need to be opening it up. Congress has already told us to do that. Uh, probably Chris had something to do with this. It's called modular open system approach, uh, but ask us how often we do that. That means you would open up a large platform and have different subsystems. Software would be separate from the hardware and you'd recompete those with some frequency. So we already have the direction to do that. We just haven't figured out how to do that yet. I want to talk a little bit about it from a tactical perspective because this is something that we've seen um, that happened at the Jake when they decided to build a ML pipeline themselves internally. Um, you know, obviously it was gone to a systems integrator that's a, a very large, well-known consulting firm. Um, but then once they built it, or once they were trying to build it, right, they would also want to build the algorithms, build the software, and try to eat as much of the pie as possible. So, 
you know, it, I think it's a very fine line to cross, which is even though eventually we don't want the government to be that large systems integrator, unfortunately there's a lot of, you know, external forces that make it much more difficult to actually create it. Um, I do think that there's something to be said about what the CDAO is trying to build, which is, you know, you have to be able to bring in autonomy to a variety of different services in a, in a, in a, in a broad-based way. And, you know, right now, as, as a small company, we're going directly to each service and seeing what we can do. But in reality, in order for us to actually save taxpayers money, it's best to go through one place that then gets resold multiple times. Um, so I, I don't think it's necessarily as clear cut as to get a very large systems integrator to do that because they're, they're just misaligned incentives. Um, uh, so therefore I think like a third party that focuses on, okay, this is a systems integrator that we're bringing in um, as part of under like, for example, the CDAO. Um, but they, under you know, a certain type of license or certain type of contract, they cannot provide certain parts of the software. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, and I think that's the only way to make sure that you're actually getting competition, getting people to continuously innovate without it being back to just buying old systems. Could I, could Ouch, I that hurt. No. Just a quick <laughs> point or a two finger, one finger, I don't know. Yeah, what. yeah. Um, I, you know, I think part of this is, um, Lead systems integrators in defense have somewhat given systems integration a bad name. Um, and I think, again, the government is kind of overcorrected in the sense of saying, like, maybe we should be doing systems integration. I, I still think there's actually a need for industry uh, on certain kinds of systems to do systems integration. I guess it's more to say that you need a different kind of systems integrator to do projects like this where you're fielding autonomous systems or families of systems or systems of systems, uh, which are inevitably going to be software defined, very rapidly changing, highly iterative, highly unstable programs by design. Um, you still need systems integration, I think. Um, it shouldn't be the government, but I also am not sure that the expertise that we tend to think about in terms of systems integration and the defense industrial base is going to be best positioned to actually deliver what it is we're seeking on autonomous systems. So it's more to say I think you need different breeds of cat. Got it. Angel, anything to add on the, um, the whole software hardware system integrator interface? Yeah, I'd say I 100% I agree with Chris. And then also, you know, one of the other components of, as we start to kind of, uh, we start to build out what this new type of SI is, giving really clear left and right lat lateral limits on what they're allowed to do. So, you know, we've had the exact same uh, experience working with the Jake in a lot of different ways where, you know, we, we start building AI models that are best of class. And then eventually we start can kind of getting gobbled up by the SI. Um, what you end up doing is losing some of the best Technology and best innovation because you're you know starting to see there's there's a territory crunch that starts to take place. So 100% agree with all of that assessment. Yeah, um, at the expense of the moderator jumping in with a rant, um, you know one of the things we at least I realized when uh, being at the DoD was that also we we're just also a very terrible customer, in the sense of our IT infrastructure and systems are not set up to absorb componentized modular software. Right, so we've bought these vertically integrated stovepipe systems over time. We don't have platforms where we can then grab an algorithm from you or from Microsoft or from Mandrel and pull it onto the platform and do it. We did one project called Project Salus where we were successful in being able to have an open platform for the data and then have multiple vendors actually compete and work on different algorithms and things in an open way. And trying to create that as a canonical pattern and scale that became very hard because there's no one who owns platforms inside the DoD. Uh, not hardware platforms, but software platforms that we execute at scale. Everybody owns applications, but there are no programs of record to drive and deliver logistics platforms or command and control platforms or data platforms that enable that. So we don't get to solve that. Um, so, um, it, so we've got, I think, about 15 minutes to basically solve this problem. Um, so let's, let's get at it. Um, so one, one question that came out from, uh, from the audience is this whole uh, Navy's 30-year shipbuilding plan to have autonomous ships by 2045. And obviously, you know, the Air Force has plans in terms of Skyborg and a whole bunch of other things. We, the Jake, had a project uh, around drones and autonomy and other pieces there. Um, how do we actually make this work? What, what's the, if we could go to the Secretary of Defense or the Deputy Secretary and say just, what's the lightning bolt that they can throw down that will solve this problem? This hardware, software, and autonomy, like I'm saying, I think of all the problems that we face, 
autonomy is probably the toughest one to deal with, given the complexity of integrating all this stuff. What would be the systemic fix that we we, we apply to uh, to make this happen? And it sounds like Mike, you you're ready to rumble. Well, I'll, I'll start with this. Uh, it's not necessarily the systemic fix, but we've got to start playing with these concepts and experimenting with them. So. Here is a perfect example of where the McNamara system fails us. If I sit in a chair and start thinking and maybe take 10 years to specify exactly how it's going to work, I'm going to be wrong. No company in the world, certainly not any Silicon Valley company, would think if I spend enough time in the armchair, I'll predict the future of what's going to happen in 10 years. So why do we do that at DOD? So we need to start buying these things, experimenting with them. We need a little help because think how that goes over in Congress where, no, you tell me exactly what line item you're... No, we need to have some flexibility so that we can do that. That's happening right now. Uh, Commodore Michael Brasur is here. I don't know how many of you have met him. He's leading something called Task Force 59 for the Fifth Fleet. And I really applaud the Navy for having the, the vision and, uh, and uh, creativity to say, Michael, go see what you can do. So he's playing with a variety of uh, satellite imagery, uh, uh, subsurface, surface, air, uh, autonomous systems to see how can they all work, which ones are useful, which ones aren't, which work, which don't work. Starting to pull all that together, all the data to see what can we learn. That's exactly what we need to be doing in all the services. We're not going to specify what it should be. We need to start experimenting and see where that gets us. But Mike, let me push back on that one second, which is okay, sounds great, experimentation, everything. Um, you know, in, in the Valley, you raise a, a, a seed round of Series A. Things happen. The company goes under. Move on. Maybe you get experimental. Or pivot because you, you learn pivot, something. You can pivot. You can raise more money. Yeah. Um, what I see in government service is that there's just it's all downside risk, which is I fail. Right? If I succeed, I don't get don't take the thing public. Don't get stock options. Don't don't make bank. But the downside risk is oh my god, you wasted taxpayer money. There's this high profile project. You know, Task Force Fifty Nine does 18 things, the chances of Task Force 59 uh, hitting the exact autonomy project that's going to be wildly successful is very low, right? That, that isn't the point. If you're not experimenting with these concepts, you're sure as heck not going to hit on it. Okay, so, so your point so, is not experimenting, you get a complete zero. Experimentation... To learn. The that's the way all companies are evolving these days at rapid rates. 100%. Uh, yeah. But the question yeah, is, how do we make be, failure okay? You have to be ruthless about pruning. So the worst thing is yes. experiment forever. DOD is pretty good at doing some of that too. <laughs> but you've got to be pruning aggressively what's working, what's not, and kind of refining your Great. concept. That's what we've learned really works in innovation ecosystems. And part of that is incentives. You're right. The incentives right now are focused on the downside at DOD, not the upside. So that part would also help. Got it. I, if you don't mind, I would like to hop yeah, in here. Please, jump part in. of this is a lot of this is also motivated by congressional behavior, and then Chris knows this as well as I do. Um, there's a there's a lot of you, if you've got a program that fails or doesn't hit its target timelines, it doesn't hit its deliverables. Um, even though we're working on these 10 or 15 you know year cycles for acquisition, there's just not a lot of tolerance out there for any programs that fail. And so we almost create this environment where it's an impossible scenario. Um, there are, of course, exceptions to this, but um, we've we've kind of created this environment. And so in some ways, it's not a shock to me that we don't have the level of um, of, of fa fail fast kind of mentality. Expect what we see inside of the special operations units. And if you take a look at what their acquisition authorities are, it's much more flexible than, than kind of like the, the rest of the services and kind of the, the larger picture DOD. So how do we replicate some of that kind of cultural, because we've got congressional tolerance for the tier one units where we don't necessarily have that same level of tolerance for the rest of the Department of Defense. Yeah. Chris, fail fast. If, if I could respond to a couple things. Um, you know, I, I think there are right ways to fail and wrong ways to fail. Um, and I think there are experiments with purpose and there are experiments in search of a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and we, I think, have seen a lot of those over the past few years. Um, you know, the first several years of the Air Force's AVMS program was sort of a, you know, uh, an experiment in search of a problem and it failed and it was not received well by Congress. Mm. The, to your question about, you know, what can senior leaders do? Um, I think first and foremost, we actually need to spend the time that we would otherwise in government spend you know, trying to micromanage and define the requirements and actually micro-define the problem 
that has operational urgency that an autonomous system is uniquely positioned to solve and, and add value to. So Task Force 59 was brought up, Truth in Advertising, Andrew will support it and was proud to support the work that uh, Task Force 59 has done. If you actually look at that, the, the value in what they were doing was an operational need, right? This wasn't a luxury. This wasn't like, autonomy's cool, we'll experiment. <laughs> It is, I have more ocean than I have traditional assets to understand what is going on. My threat is getting more complex and all of my traditional systems are getting pulled in that large sucking sound into the Indo-PACOM region. Yeah. So I by necessity have to figure out how to do this differently. That is a perfect boundable problem that autonomous systems, families of systems are, are meant and sort of created to solve. Um, the challenge then is you have to then, having bounded that problem, experiment and iterate and learn and fail and develop quickly so that by the end of a rather bounded amount of time, you actually have fieldable capability and a, and, a, and a sort of platform on which you can build into the future, move into adjacent other problems. Mm -hmm. um, th that isn't something that I see often happening in the DOD. And I think a lot of it comes down to, you know, back to your question again about what can senior leaders do? They actually have to find the places where this is working and they have to 10x them. They have to give them the resources and the support to enable them to keep going. And to the point about Congress, um, I think Congress is completely prepared uh, to provide support and funding for these types of efforts. They are. Where they get frustrated is when the department you know, goes off in the wrong direction, has experiments without purpose, um, wastes money, wastes time, um, and doesn't actually produce a result. And, you know, Congress comes in for a lot of blame for wanting to hang on to the legacy systems that are built in their districts and by vendors in their states and what have you. And I think we're looking at this problem through the wrong end of the telescope, right? The problem is that the future that Congress is being promised never shows up. Um, it's always in the future. So, yes, they're going to hang on to the things that they have now. Um, I think, you know, an iterative approach where you're actually moving quickly to solve a bounded operational problem and then move on to something at scale uh, you know, I think is, is really where senior leaders can help drive the department in the right direction. Yeah, I have three points to that. The first is I think that um, it's incredible that folks like, um, you know, the group for Task Force 59 is putting together, but it, 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 it's because there's innovative leaders that are excited about that. Um, and unfortunately, it's really hard t to tie these programs with individuals who maybe after two or three years, there's going to be a new individual in that p particular position which means that you're tying innovation and really interesting autonomy projects with a time bound and focus on one particular person. So I think the way we could, or a leader in that particular space. So I think that there's a way that you could kind of expand innovation, um, which is, you know, for example, the MIT Air Force Accelerator Program, which gets senior leaders to understand what is autonomy. Um, I think so education at senior leadership is very, very important. And then the third thing is, um, at CrowdAI, what we do is, you know, we'll apply for Task Force 59, we'll apply for, um, you know, innovation things that are coming out of DHS or what have you. But frankly, it should probably be under one umbrella, right? Because, you know, we're sell selling an air order of battle set of algorithms for one particular region, another particular region, but it's fundamentally a very similar technology, which means that we're essentially asking taxpayers to pay double the price for pretty much a very similar you know, technology. So though, you know, it benefits us to, you know, to obviously um, present to Task Force 59 and present to Maven and present to Jake, I do think that in order for autonomy to go outside of experimentation and into programs of record and people being able to pull from one centralized pool of the DOD's autonomous sources, it needs to be under one umbrella. But um, Devaki, you couldn't possibly be uh, 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 advocating for central bureaucracy. <laughs> at the Department of Defense to make all the decisions about autonomy. I think that there is some kind of ne necessity around having certain access to resources in a centralized location, yeah. right? Data is streaming for sensor data and image data and satellite data and, you know, like uh, OCR and paper mm -hmm. data all mm -hmm. in one place. Training data is being created in large masses because, for example, if you could get training data off of, you know, the Yukon mm -hmm. region, and then, you know, a different Indo-PACOM wants to retrain it for their particular area, it's right. good to have that central location of data in one place. But then you're not actually starting things from scratch in a completely new. Location. No, that makes sense. I mean, 
in particular, it, it sounds like for being a small company, for you having to chase all of these contracts down, all of this data down, all of these compute instances. But it's not from a selfish perspective. It's really about how do you get the best value for the government in ways that are, you know, for example, we have, you know, a, a ship order of battle in, in the South China Sea that we are currently re retraining in um, the Atlantic Ocean, but like how do we, that shouldn't be a, a separate model that I'm selling for Task Force 59. Right. It, it should be very similar. It should be coming from the same resources right. so you're not starting from scratch and giving the same thing over and over again. I, I just have one counterpoint. I agree with your argument about efficiency, but this isn't the area where I would start with that. We need so desperately to move faster to get new technology in, do more things like Task, 50, Task Force 59 so we can see what the possibilities are or we're going to be strategically surprised because the Chinese have stolen the designs for our large platforms. They've seen how we go to war. They've watched it for 20 years. And so what element of surprise are we going to be bringing to a fight if we ever have to, mm. to fight? So we need to be thinking about what hedge are we making against these large platforms? And if we don't feel a sense of urgency about experimenting and getting more of the military, not just happening in one small corner, and even if we are inefficient because it's happening in four or five corners, we're going to be much better off to try and move faster. The key to this competition is speed, and we need to embrace that. Mm. And so many of our incentives are causing us to go slow. I'm going to push back a little bit, sorry. Um, but respectfully, the algorithms are already there in a different part of the DOD. So why not connect the two folks so then it's... Oh, like, I'm agreeing with you, okay. but I'm just saying my highest priority wouldn't be on efficiency here. No, but this will be speed, right? Because algorithms are already built. So why don't we just retrain it in this particular AOR and they'll I'm get with to you. the... I'm with Great. You. <laughs> so, um, no, this is fantastic. Thank you. I mean, just sort of abstracting this out. I mean, it, so we've been talking about sort of risk-taking, right? So risk-taking and because it is a law of large numbers problem, right? When we look at the venture capital industry, what we do is we seed a lot of different companies one of them or two or three are going to be successful, and the other 297 are going to get washed out. We understand how series investing works, right? Seed investing, series A, series B, series C, you lean into uh, different benchmarks and, and funding uh, amounts based on sort of that. Do we need to start thinking about more of a venture capital-based model in terms of funding and seeding these types of task forces and things here? So that, to your point, um, we assume out the gate that out of these 10 projects that we're going to fund, and the failure mode isn't we have $10 billion projects failing, we have 10 $10 million projects failing, and one of them will then turn into a unicorn at some point in time that we lean into over funding. But is it the problem that if we go to Congress or, or someone and say, listen, we're going to experiment here, we're going to get 100 million bucks, a fund, effectively try 15 of these. Statistically, as we know, 14 are going to fail, one is going to make it. Um, is anyone receptive to that? Is it going to be a front page news in the New York Times saying, you know, uh, DOD's out to waste, you know, $97 million of taxpayer money in failed projects versus the one $3 million project that made it to an IPO? I, Chris, I'll, you're, I'll you're representing you're representing Congress here. Um, <laughs> let, let me let me say one thing at the outset because this is like where I thought not. you were going. Um, if, if I say one thing and leave you with one thing only, this notion oh, okay. that the government should actually play venture capitalist and put invest, investment funding into companies like, please for the love no, of no, all no, things, yeah, holy. I didn't mean that. I didn't no, mean no, no, no. But I'm saying like projects, you know, yeah. people in the government have continued to say that this is a thing the government should do, and it just it makes no sense. I agree with that. Um, for reasons we can get into, but that's neither here nor there. Um, what, what I would much rather see, and I think this is to the point of your question, is the government think like venture capitalists. Yes. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily frame it around sort of you know, a multiplicity of projects. I would say, let's just step back and say over the past six years or so, thanks to DIU and AFWorks and a lot of other organizations that have made it easier for small companies to get contracts to get started on some project, there are now hundreds of these projects that are ongoing across the government. Um, what I would say is the problem, um, but eminently solvable, is the government has no ability, capacity, demonstrated will to actually figure out what is the 10% of these that need to get 10x and brought up to a larger scale based on the success that they have had 
doing a one or one and a half million dollar, $75,000 small project. Um, you know, so unless and until we actually have that kind of rigorous process in place, we're gonna have what we've always had over the past generation or two, which is taking the limited amount of money that the government has, breaking it up into very small pieces, giving it every kid a trophy, and then in two years saying, thank you for your interest in national security, right. and going and spending all that money on new people. Right. So we have to figure out how to kind of bring this through a venture stage of, of getting to scale quickly the best performers, the most disruptive capabilities, right. and I see no evidence that the government has that the, kind of process or capacity put in place to actually work that in a, in a rapid this way. Is, this is what I'd call sort of portfolio management, right? Yeah. It's, it's managing a portfolio of investments and tech projects, and even though we consider ourselves, we meaning the DOD, I'm no longer there, but is this idea of, of we, we, we're a monopsony, right? We're in many cases a buyer of one, yes. Uh, and therefore, we do need to act like we actually do develop products and stop kidding ourselves that we're a pure consumer. And, and could I just say, what I'm suggesting costs zero dollars. Congress would love it. Um, it Maybe. actually requires thinking and work. And that's the thing that has been absent thus far. Okay, so we are either almost out of time or um, have, oh, we're out of time. Oh my goodness. Well, this went fast. Um, <laughs> Thank you all very much. Uh, questions were great. And of course, can't thank the panelists enough. Thank you all so much. Uh, this is a fantastic conversation. Thank you. Thank you to our panel for that incredible discussion around commercial autonomy. The emphasis around producing efficient and effective systems, not just autonomous systems, is especially important for broader adoption of this kind of commercial technology. Now, please welcome the Honorable Michelle Flournoy, the founder of West Exec Advisors, for a fireside chat with Brennan McCord, the founding chief architect of the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen I'm Brennan McCord, and I have the honor of introducing somebody I admire um, quite a bit our keynote for, for the defense discussion at, at Nexus 22. Michelle has uh, the title that is revered most in the startup community, which is founder of both her current firm, West Exec Advisors, which she co-founded with now Secretary of State Tony Blinken, and of a leading bipartisan think tank, Center for a New American Security, where she's now chair. During the Obama administration, Michelle had the title of Under Secretary of Defense, where she brought supreme lucidity and foresight to a host of challenging strategy and policy topics. And many, perhaps some in the audience, um, some in the highest ranks of government even, also know her as mentor. Michelle's involved with many nonprofits, too numerous to, to mention, and she shaped the course of uh, innumerable careers in service. So here to discuss strategic topics at the intersection of defense and autonomy, please welcome Michelle Flournoy. Thank you very much. And I'm really uh, just sorry not to be there in person, but one of the lessons I'm learning as a parent of older children is sometimes the college kids come home and they bring COVID with them. So <laughs> I didn't want to uh, risk uh, passing my exposure on to all of you, but really happy to be able to join uh, with you virtually. We're glad you can make it. As we kick off here, um, reminder, send questions to asknexus22 at gmail.com and we will get to those um, towards, the, towards the latter portion of this discussion. So Michelle, let's start with Russia, Ukraine. When the history of this era is written at some distant point in the future, how will this war be remembered? What is at stake as we think about the next 100 years? Well, I think that first and foremost, it'll go down in history as a truly strategic miscalculation by Vladimir Putin um, and, and something that really um, hurt Russia and the Russian people in the longer term. I think that as long as Putin is in power, given the war crimes, given the illegal um, uh, aggression, um, the atrocities, um, I think he's going to be a pariah for the rest of his life. And as long as he's in power, I think Russia will suffer. A lot of the sanctions will be remain in place. We, I think it will have a devastating economic effect over time. Many economists are 
anticipating that Russia will drop out of the top 20 uh, economies. Um, they'll be isolated from international fora. Um, and ironically, it, you know, this is having exactly the effect that Putin most feared, which is he is going to have a larger, stronger, more uh, reinvigorated and purposeful NATO um, to, uh, you know, on his, on his border. So um, this is a real threat to the European order and frankly to the global order, because the, whatever, how this turns out affects not only the rules of the road in Europe, but the rules of the road around the world. So very high stakes, but I think ultimately this will go down as a major miscalculation by an authoritarian leader. You talked about a reinvigorated and more purposeful NATO. I know one of the things that Putin fears is um, more broadly a reinvigorated uh, West. Um, and uh, I'm curious if you're optimistic about a renaissance in the West, not just you know, the deployment of the international system to stop the acute challenges, but also to build something lasting, you know, some lasting cooperation uh, for the benefit of humanity over a long scale. You know, I do think the combination of Russia's aggression in Ukraine and China's more um, assertive, if not aggressive, behavior in the Indo-Pacific region um, have sort of awakened the transatlantic community to some some real challenges that we face. And I and I do think um, that there will be closer transatlantic cooperation um, on uh, particularly on uh, in tech competition. That's one of the major themes of this conference, but really seeing where can we combine our efforts, align our efforts to actually accelerate um, technology development that would keep our competitive edge as the West. Um, but I think we're, we're heading towards a more multipolar world. We're heading towards a less integrated global economy. And frankly, there are a lot of countries that are sitting on the sidelines that you know, have very heavy economic dependencies on um, Russia to a smaller extent, China to a greater extent. Um, and uh, they are very loath to take sides. Um, and they're sort of sitting and watching how this turns out. So um, uh, a, lot is, a lot is riding on this. You talked about new forms of transatlantic tech cooperation. Are you seeing any promising models emerge or is it too early to tell? I think this is definitely a conversation that's starting to happen, certainly in the transatlantic uh, US-EU context, uh, the NATO context but also in, in, organ, you know, in groupings like the Quad, which includes some of our key Asian allies like Japan and, and Australia. And so I think the, U, the US is looking for, you know, how do we form tech clusters around key technologies that could accelerate our efforts to keep our cutting edge, but also maybe uh, retard or hold back China's efforts. So for example, if you, know, if you were thinking about semiconductors, you would put together some combination of the US, Japan, Korea, possibly Taiwan, and the Netherlands. And you try to align your export controls. You try to align your investment to create a more robust um, ecosystem that would reduce dependence, any dependency on the Chinese market and also keep the Chinese several generations behind us. So I think it's that kind of thinking. People are talking about a T10, a T12, um, really um, formalizing a, a collaborative framework. But to your point, it's very early days, and I think the concept is still very much developing. On the subject of international order, um, on the one hand, it seems you are optimistic about transatlantic cooperation, transatlantic unity. On the other hand, you cited many countries still on the fence, not seeing it as their fight, not joining the coalition to isolate Russia. Um, the other question I have on the world order is, do sanctions and blockades push us in the direction of deglobalization? Do they make countries want to be sanction and blockade proof? Um, you know, a state of autarky in which they're competitively self-sufficient and moving away from global institutions. Yeah. I mean, in a situation where you want to take great care with your use of military force, 
sanctions become a very attractive um, uh, coercive instrument. Um, but there is a risk of, um, of the counter reaction. Um, we know that uh, the Chinese right now have begun a study of how would they insulate the Chinese economy from comparable sanctions in the event that they invaded Taiwan and the international community responded with, with sanctions or boycotts or what have you. Um, very, very different case um, than Russia, obviously. Much larger economy, much more diversified economy, much more integrated uh, economy, much more consequential to the global economy as a whole and to growth as a whole. So um, complicated um, for us, but also for them. And I do think they are looking at this. I think the other thing that, you know, some countries are looking at was, you know, it, uh, if you overuse sanctions, particularly secondary sanctions, um, you risk actually causing countries to start looking for alternatives to the dollar as the currency of global trade and transactions. And that would be a very negative thing. You know, the good thing right now is that, you know, given the Chinese renminbi is like, it's not convertible, it's not liquid, they don't have enough liquidity. I mean, they, they're very far from being able to seriously be considered as a, um, an alternative. But, you know, if they spent 20, 30 years working at it, you know, we could get there. And that would be a very negative development for the United States. So I think we have to be very strategic about when we use sanctions, how they're used, and, and how far we go with them, and how often we reach for that instrument. We, we've talked at the global strategic level about Russia, Ukraine. I want to also ask, what lessons should the U.S. military take away from Russia's performance in Ukraine? So I think there, there are several takeaways. The first is, um, I think militaries that exist within authoritarian systems um, are at much higher risk of being misused or being used in the context of uh, a whole host of miscalculations. You know, it's very clear that, you know, if you're working for Vladimir Putin, you know, the last thing you want to do is contradict him, dissent for him and him, question his assumptions. That's not a, a recipe for, you know, promotion or survival. Um, and so, but that's true in a lot of authoritarian systems where dissent is not tolerated or, you know, certainly not encouraged. And so I think that often sets them up for miscalculation at the strategic level. Um, I think you also see in cases, you know, uh, you can also be a, in a, a can also add to both some combination of incompetence and corruption. So when you look at the logistics problems that Russia has had, certainly in the first phase um, in, in the um, effort to reach Kyiv, but even more recently when they're operating right up against their own border, those challenges speak to either incompetence, poor planning, corruption that siphoned off resources away from sustainment and logistics, or some combination of all of those things. But um, my point is the larger systemic problems that affect Russia have an impact in terms of how, how these forces fight. The same can be said when you look at their training and their personnel. Uh, Russia has not figured out how to gain air superiority, despite a superior you know, air force in numbers and months now to do it. Um, they have not figured out how to conduct truly combined arms campaigns where air, air uh, air cover is provided to make ground forces more uh, effective. We even see the ground forces holding back, afraid of getting ahead of their own artillery barrages. Um, so that's a very significant um, vulnerability. So we, we have to be careful not to paint other militaries who are untested, who are existing in these authoritarian systems as 10 feet tall. Um, but I think that a lot of the credit actually goes to Ukrainian side, um, which you know we've seen the impact of the asymmetry of interests and resolve. Ukraine is fighting for its homeland, its freedom, its people, their people's families, you know their territory, and a lot of the you know from what we can tell on the Russian side, you have a number of conscripts mixed in. You have very poorly led forces. And that has affected the, the relative strength of the will to fight on the two sides, which has 
which counts for a lot um, in this kind of situation. So um, lots of lessons to be learned also in terms of how we've used, used intelligence, the US and shared it in this conflict, um, in terms of how we've really built a very strong coalition um, and uh, an aligned set of um, steps in terms of both security assistance, but also sanctions. So there, there's just a lot of lessons to be plumbed here and always dangerous to do it when the conflict is still unfolding. But I think we can see even now some of those lessons that will be important to, to examine in the future. You brought up the asymmetry of interest and resolve on the Ukrainian side. Often we hear the word asymmetry referring to technologies and new techniques, tactics and procedures, new concepts of operation that are enabled by technologies. Any perspective on the mix of old and new that you saw or are seeing in Ukraine or on the role of technology? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that after the invasion of Crimea um, in 2014, a number of NATO countries, the US, Canada, UK, um, brought in uh, a lot of our special operations forces to work with the Ukrainians and, and train them and develop operational concepts for asymmetric warfare against a, a superior conventional force like Russia. And, you know, I would, have, I would have loved to have seen us do even more, particularly on the equipping side before this crisis, but we did a lot with them on training and advising. And I think what you're seeing now is these very, um, we, the fruition of all of that work where they've done a lot of a very effective sabotage, a lot of very effective hit and run, you know, tar ambushes, you know, figuring out how to target the, the, the key leaders in the command and control chain, you know, taking out key C2 systems and so forth. So they have done exceedingly um, well. Um, and they've been remarkably good at integrating not only technologies they already knew how to use, but new tech, newer technologies. So um, whether that's been, you know, um, unclassified intel intelligence sources or um, new uh, analytic systems to help them target better or, or what have you. I mean, they've really been very, very agile um, in, in rapidly integrating new, new approaches and, and technologies. It's natural as we kind of wrap up the questions on Russia and Ukraine uh, for me to ask the question of where do we go from here? And I'm sure this is put to you daily. Um, the traditional diplomatic advice is to give your adversary an out. Here, the, the adversary has maximalist aims. They have a certain dogma for Slavic mysticism, and um, they're encased in an echo chamber. Um, should we give an off-ramp, what would that look like, um, and, and would it work? Easy question. This is the $64 million question at this point, and I'm sure that many people in the administration and, in, and other allied capitals are wrestling with this. Um, you know, I think I would, if I would still say the most likely scenario is some kind of frozen conflict in the East um, with, you know, a sort of line of control with skirmishing across it, um, but something that is, you know, a sort of long, hard slog for a while. But given the Russian failure to muster an effective offensive in the East um, in recent weeks, given the success that the Ukrainians have in, in pushing them back in some areas, it's at least plausible that you could have a scenario where the Ukrainians push them back enough such that Putin is truly uh, facing a defeat, not, not in terms of all, I'm not suggesting Ukraine can completely expel all Russian forces, but I define defeat for Putin as if he ends up having less control of territory, less than he had on the day one of the invasion. That is a defeat. That is something he cannot sell, dress up and sell to his population at home. Um, and so in that instance, I worry about Putin uh, escalating to de-escalate, as Russian doctrine suggests, whether it's a tactical nuclear demonstration shot, whether it's something else, but to sort of throw over the table and reset terms, you know, basically set the terms of negotiation according to his 
objectives. Um, so I do worry about that. But in terms of finding an off-ramp right now, I think we absolutely have to try, um, but we're grasping at straws. I mean, one of the few straws that I see uh, as something to, to explore is uh, President Zelensky has been very clear that neutrality for Ukraine is on the table. Um, if, 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 you know, the war could be ended on his terms, but large swaths of Ukrainian territory in Russian hands is not on the table. So, but we have to find the Venn diagram, but right now the overlap between the two circles is minimal to non-existent. And, and so we'll see how that changes as uh, this evolves over time. Let's shift the discussion to China. Um, 2012, you wrote defense strategic guidance that said, you know, we're a decade into a war in the Middle East, we need to pivot to Asia Pacific. 2018 NDS um, spoke about that. President Biden talked about it as foreign policy challenge number one, interlaced with the 2022 national defense strategy. And we have a rare bipartisan consensus on the threat technologically, militarily, economically, even ideologically of China. Um, but an old adversary went and did this. It wasn't supposed to, to be like this. How does Russia's invasion of Ukraine affect our rebalancing to China? Look, I think as a, a global power with global interests, we have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. We have to be able to focus on helping the Ukrainians uh, defend their homeland and beat back Russia at the same time that we need to be hyper-focused on um, strengthening deter our ability to deter Chinese aggression in the region more broadly, but specifically with regard to Taiwan in the future. And I think we, we have to be able to do both of those things at the same time. At the most senior levels, there is a bandwidth trade-off because they're, they're looking at both issues. But much of this work is being done by different people in the DOD, in the White House, in other in the State Department, and in other institutions. So we should be able to keep the ball rolling. And I think you see a concerted effort by the White House to do that. I mean, whether it's the Quad summits that have been happening, Biden's upcoming trip to Japan and Korea, the ASEAN meeting that was just hosted in the United States. I mean, there's a steady drumbeat of continuing to focus focus, focus, focus on the Indo-Pacific, on strengthening those alliance and partner relationships, and on building up our, our co collective capacity to deter China. But I'd also say there is a, you know, the China factor is also, you know, what, what is she gonna learn from what happens in Russia, Ukraine? I mean, if this is a terrible defeat and a clear miscalculation for Putin, that should be somewhat of a cautionary tale for Xi. Um, if it's a great victory for Putin in the end, which I think is unlikely, but if it is, then that is that could be emboldening. Uh, it could, could be reinforcing of a lot of the narratives that she promotes. You know, U.S. is in decline. You know, hit the allies. You know, the, those alliances fracture and fray over time. You know, now is our moment. Um, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, how, how Russia Ukraine ends up actually will have some impact, not determinative, but some impact on how she calculates his options, um, political, economic, and military vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan in the future. So you think the, the rebalance um, focus remains, it'll take some oxygen out of the National Security Council, not, not to trivialize the, the issue, but we are rebalancing, and you talked about how it impacts Xi's calculus um, as it concerns Taiwan. Do we have confidence that with the force we currently have or the force we have planned that we can deter and, if necessary, defeat China? I think most of the, the publicly reported war games and those that have been shared with Congress show that the planned force does not give us a comfortable margin, you know, in terms of risk vis-a-vis um, -vis deterring and defeating aggression, Chinese aggression in, you know, 10 years from now. So the message has been pretty consistent and pretty clear that we have to invest in additional capabilities and additional concepts if we're going to be successful against China in the future, that we cannot rest on our laurels, um, say, and tell ourselves, well, we have the best military in the world, 
um, and therefore we will naturally win against China. Um, China's investment in asymmetric capabilities uh, and um, their approach to warfare is going to challenge some of the basic premises that of how we've traditionally fought. Um, whether it's, you know, we're not going to be able to establish domain superiority early and then keep it and have freedom of action. We're going to, it's going to be contested. We're going to have to fight our way through it. There are just a whole lot of changes that we have to make conceptually. We have to think more like the underdog, more like the asymmetric power, um, because they will have huge, you know, home court advantage and huge quantitative advantage and a very prepared theater um, that we're going to project power into. So lots to be learned there. So you, you talked about the home court advantage, the quantitative advantage, the advantage of going to school on us for 20 years since the Gulf War to watch our way of warfare, um, albeit in counterterrorism focus. But you also talked about a conceptual shift. So I'm curious, do you think those are the right bases for competition or the right lens through which to view um, China um, deterrence, China conflict, those things, or, or should we be thinking about it differently? I think we have to, I, I think this, this focus on quantitative, you know, comparisons and attrition is the wrong focus. I think we have to be thinking about, you know, how can we hold at risk the assets they hold most dear as they begin an aggression to convince the Chinese that this is not going to be a walk in the park. You may not be successful, so we may, you know, deterrence by denial. Um, and even if you are, you know, somewhat successful, it's going to be exorbitantly costly, much more costly than you ever imagined. And so developing the capabilities to very early demonstrate um, that, that we can both be successful in denial and imposing costs, as well as I think having some surprises in our back pocket, some things that we reveal that really shake their confidence in the, in the early uh, moments of decision-making. Um, when they really are surprised that we didn't know they could do that, oh my goodness, what's happening? Um, reduce their confidence in their ability to command and control their own forces, reduce their com you know, confidence in their own, that they understand how this is gonna go. I, I think all of that has to be the focus um, for the near, mid, and, and long term. Um, it's a very different problem set, near term versus long term, but we, it's gotta be a consistent thread and focus. Much of the conference has touched on um, challenges associated with translating technology into decisions and impact. And one of the things that comes up a lot is acquisition. But it strikes me listening to you that, you know, buying the technology, integrating the technology is, is rather just the start in, in the sense that the surprising capabilities you're referring to are probably more in the realms of warfighting constructs. Um, are we you know, if we, if we have bottlenecks in the process of getting technology in, how are we experimenting to discover the techniques, tactics, and procedures and integrating those into concepts of operation? H how are we doing that at a rapid enough pace um, for a China competitor? So I think we are starting to do more of it, both experimentation and concept development, but um, if you think of it as a sandwich, um, the, we're kind of missing the, the meat in the middle. <laughs> we're, we have a lot of tactical, um, you know, unit level, community level experimentation and, and, you know, really tactical evolution of approaches, which is very healthy and very creative and solves real world problems at the tactical level. And that I think is, happening a lot across the services and, the, and some of the COCOMs. And then we have this sort of top-down joint staff led effort to, for a joint warfighting concept that's building on some of the service concepts, which is a useful framework to kind of align everyone on the problem set, the challenges, you know, how we have to approach things differently. But I think the real missing middle right now is the campaign level sort of theater level, okay, for Indo-PACOM or for a particular scenario like a Chinese invasion of Taiwan, 
what are the campaign level concepts and how is the joint force going to come in and, and do all of that? And where are we going to assign a task or an, a problem to a particular service? And where is it in our interest to have multiple different concepts for solving that problem and lots of resilience and redundancy? Those are the kind, that's the kind of work that I think is, again, I think Deputy Secretary Hicks has tried to create some new fora for uh, starting to do this and to actually incent those kinds of um, concepts to come forward and, and be, provide some additional funding for experimentation. But it's very, very early days and we need to do a lot, a uh, lot more of that. Last question on China. You brought up quantitative advantages as maybe the, not the, the right or not complete lens uh, through which to view competition. And I, I gather that you mean things like the number of ships, um, the number of planes. And um, certainly in, a, in an era where information is more important in the battlefield, those kinds of traditional magnitudes don't matter, you know, um, or don't matter as much. Um, matter, how many, but not, it, matter, but not as much. Um, you know, how many software engineers create the code for applied intuitions, you know, tools, doesn't matter as long as it works. Um, what should we measure instead? So I think um, uh, speed, accuracy, and resilience of decision making and command and control is number one. Um, and here is, you know, if we can make better decisions faster than the adversary, we will have tremendous advantage over and over and over again in, in the prosecution of the campaign. Um, and that means taking the what's mature and further maturing it, but you know, leveraging AI and, and machine learning and support of our as decision support tools to help us have a better picture of the battlefield, better picture of our own assets and their tar potential targets, better, better ability to make quick decisions and gain uh, advantage that way. Um, I also think it's uh, critical. We can buy back some of the quantitative um, capacity through human machine teaming. So, you know, if you have a, a U.S. attack sub that can control dozens, if not a hundred or more under, you know, undersea unmanned vehicles, that gives us a lot of capacity in undersea. Um, same in the air. Um, same, you know, for variety of, of purposes and concepts. So that is another place where I think there's low hanging fruit that again, within the next five to seven years, we could field a very different force if we put our mind to it. And I, I emphasize the five to seven because, you know, right now, President Xi, he's worried about COVID, which is out of control. He's worried about slowing economic growth. He's worried about the 20th party Congress and whether he'll just get one more term or be made, you know, party leader for life, looking more like the former now than the latter. Um, but at some point when he's through this period, he's going to focus on his legacy. And he's spoken over and over again about the reunification of Taiwan, kind of rogue province with mainland China as a legacy issue. He will start by continuing to political coercion, shrinking their international space, deepening the, the economic ties between Taiwan uh, and, and China, so sort of economic absorption into the Borg, if you will. But if after several years of that, that doesn't work, and he sees the United States and our allies actually setting this theater more successfully in a more robust manner, having new capabilities that could make his job much more difficult, there is a window in that five to seven year period, maybe not even five, where he could say, you know, I, I now is the best, my best, time is now not on my side. And now is the time to go. We have to use the next few years to work with what we have and work with what's most mature and emerging to fundamentally strengthen deterrence so that he thinks twice in that instance, if he's ever tempted. I'd like to shift to uh, talent and aut autonomy in the Department of Defense. And earlier today in a panel, Nick Sinai said something to the effect of, you know, if he had one policy change that he could make or one policy focus area, it would be talent management. Um, I'd love to get your perspective on things that we are, uh, that we should sort of start doing 
stop doing or keep doing in the world of talent management and with particular emphasis on technical talent? Yeah, well, first of all, amen to his comment. <laughs> um, so I think the first, there are several aspects to this. Number one is we have to make better use of the talent we have. And I'll give you two examples. One is when you think of the young officers coming out of the service academies, the ROTC, NROTC uh, programs, two thirds of them uh, to get the scholarship are STEM grads. They're studying STEM fields. Um, when they become officers of the line, there's no, they, they, all of that is forgotten. It's like, it's irrelevant, except if you're like a nuclear physicist in a nuclear Navy or something. But for the most part, um, the services do not manage STEM talent for STEM careers. There is no way to progress as an op officer to flag or general officer as a technologist. There is no career path um, that makes any sense. So we aren't using, and that's the same is true at an enlisted level. We give people all of these tests for acumen and affinity, and then we don't do anything with it. And so, you know, there's uh, the Army is doing an interesting experiment with the software factory out at Army Futures Command. They're taking those enlisted folks who tested as being very technical, astute, technically astute, and they're training them as in-house uh, software developers. Great initiative. So use the talent we have better means knowing what we've got, uh, creating career paths where people can ex excel as technology leaders and then allowing them to manage their careers to, to be that. Um, number two is bringing in more talent from the outside. And so I'd go to the first circle around those who are in service full time and say, you know, is there room for either leveraging digital talent that's already in our reserves more effectively or building out a truly digital reserve where people could, you know, hack for their country, contribute in some way as reservists on a very part-time basis. Here, the biggest problem right now is security clearances, um, and that whole system needs to be um, overhauled. Um, and talk about adopting, you know, leveraging technology to make that one more efficient and effective. There's huge opportunity there. Um, and then the last thing is building bridges with the commercial tech talent that's out there. Um, you know, it's one of our greatest strengths as a nation making it easier for people to take sabbatical time, come serve in government for a tour, come out, maybe come back at a more senior level down the road. People like Nant, who was just moderating the panel. We need to have a thousand uh, people like him serving in the DOD, not you know a handful. Um, so we need to really work on reducing the barriers to that kind of exchange. Um, and, um, and also, leverage those partnerships to put, send more of our military and civilian government workers to train in our cutting edge firms so that they really understand what does it look like to be a product manager? What does it look like to oversee an agile development process as an acquisition official? How do I do that in a way that fully leverages the flexible authorities that Congress has given me to get to, you know, to better adoption faster? So turning up the dial on technical acumen in the department through identifying, cultivating, bringing in new um, makes, makes all the sense in the world to me. Um, and I think you would agree that it, it goes beyond um, software development into acquisition and program management and other areas. I, I do want to kind of play the devil's advocate here just to texturize the discussion. Um, so if we have a lot of folks that we've identified who can write code or we bring in um, how do we mitigate the risk that A, we'll do what um, I think Jeff Bezos called undifferentiated heavy lifting, um, which is to say work that's very complex, doesn't always seem it at first, but is very complex and gives little advantage. And, and B, how do you um, mitigate the chance that we'll miss you know, the greatest strength of you know, America, which yeah. is the private sector? I think we have to, have a, it's a really good question. I think we have to have sort of clear guidelines of what we try to do in-house and what we, we go, what, where we need really cutting edge capability at scale and we need to go out of the outside DOD. So the in-house stuff is things like, and I think this is the army concept. It's like, you know, if you need um, someone to write an algorithm so that you can, you know, 
build a better dashboard to that, you know, or create better data analytics for your bosses to make better decision making, better decisions with the data they have. I mean, that, there's a certain amount of in-house tweaking or customization or it add addition. It's more of like an upskilling your workforce to start really leveraging the data that's at their fingertips and, and doing simple ML and, and, and uh, work to, to, to automate processes that can now be done by machines that don't have to be crunched through by human beings. Um, so that's the sort of thing, you know, if you've got the skills to do that in-house, that's great. You should, you should leverage those. If you're saying to me, you know, um, what do I need to do to do Project Maven? Or what do I need to do to build um, the, the best possible AI decision support tool for Indopaycom? That's not going to be something you do with in-house. You want the absolute best in our e innovation ecosystem to be focused on those cutting edge, high consequence problems. So I think we just need to differentiate between what's the, the smart, efficient, kind of upskilled approach to, to, to doing basic day-to-day -day functions in the department that in a digital world versus where do I need cutting edge capability to really give me an edge? And, and there you want to leverage that ecosystem we've talked about. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one more question, and uh, and then maybe a, a parting, a parting uh, small question. So Nick's number one policy, you know, focus was talent management. If we took that off the table for a second, um, and the question was, you know, we we sort of get the sense at conferences like this that the field is moving very fast. What's possible at the frontier um, is uh, it's, it's you know staggering. And yet, there's a large and growing gap between that and the things that are actually in use in the military. And so, if you could, you know, snap your fingers and enact a, a, a system-wide change to help with closing that gap between what's possible and what's actually in use in military operations, what what would you what would you recommend or what would you do? I would say a separate um, acquisition track focused on rapidly acquiring and scaling commercial defined technology or dual use technology and bringing it into the DOD at, at scale. Um, and that require, there, there may be some additional authorities, but it, I think we have a lot of the right authorities already in place. It is a bridge funding problem. You know, right now you, you I'm sure your previous panel talked about this, You you know, you're the darling of the demonstration or you win the prototype contest and then you're told, you know, well, we'll, we'll try to get you into the program of record maybe in 18 to 24 months. Well, that's not viable. That's gonna, not gonna keep that cutting edge commercial com company, especially if it's a startup or relatively small, uh, it's not gonna keep them in the game with defense. So we have got to figure out the, 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 some serious bridging funding and mechanisms to get companies across that. Uh, valley of death. Um, but we also have, it takes a fundamentally diff different set of skills and risk tolerance from the people overseeing the acquisition. And here I've, I've written about creating a sort of green berets of, uh, of acquisition where you really train people in agile development, um, procuring software defined systems, emerging technology systems. Um, and they, um, they understand how to, to do an agile process and, to under, and how to manage failure, learn from it quickly, ensure that, you, you know, that, that, that it informs the success going forward and, and, and to more rapidly scale capabilities into the hands of the warfighter. So it's all of those things and it's, it's, it's possible. It is possible with the right focus and attention and leadership and I think I would love to see the department pick a handful of areas to pilot this approach, show that it can be done. And then to, I think it was uh, Chris's, Chris used the, the term 10X as a verb. I love that, you know, and then 10X it, you know, really uh, as much as possible. Thank you very much, Michelle. We are, uh, we are about at time, but I appreciate um, the remarks and I know the audience does as well. Thank you. Well, good luck with the rest of the conference and thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Michelle and Brendan, for that phenomenal macro discussion, including how the U.S. should think about Russia and China, as it's not necessarily a hard trade-off between the two, and how we should think about making better decisions faster than the adversary to really cement a competitive advantage. And a, a piece of housekeeping as well, I've seen a lot of folks go into the hallway right outside this room and start talking. Uh, we request you, please do not do that. Go to Holman Lounge if you want to have a conversation, and that way we can actively hear the speakers and everyone tuning in virtually is also able to hear them effectively. Next up, I'd like to welcome Colin Carroll, the Director of Applied Intuition's Government Office, who will moderate a conversation on the state of defense and commercial autonomy. So uh, let's see if this thing works. It does work. So when I uh, told my boss I wanted to do this conference, I wanted to do it at the, the DC Culture House. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. It's very colorful. And we decided to do it here at the National Press Club instead. But Chris here definitely would have fit in well at the DC Culture House. Nailed it. Uh, best dressed of the day. Look at those shoes. So. Um, I left the DoD uh, after five years um, helping run some of the largest AI and autonomy programs at Project Maven and the Joint AI Center. Um, they don't typically, you know, my handlers, that some of whom are here on the stage earlier or out in the audience, you guys know who you are, they didn't typically let me um, talk in public. They, they kept me chained in a cave in the back actually working on all the systems and making sure everything works. But I got the chance to observe, you know, multiple panels like this. And a lot of times, you know, on the industry panel, it's like the kind of the usual suspects of traditional defense contractors. And in this case, I think we're, you know, we've got a unique opportunity to talk to really a full spectrum of um, industry performers here, some of whom, like Apexa on the, on the line from Gaddick, uh, the, the co-founder and chief engineer, work only in autonomous trucking in the, in the commercial space. Um, you know, we've got Ryan Seng here from uh, co-founder and CEO of Shield AI. They are kind of a dual-use uh, VC-backed startup that does defense and commercial. Um, Reagan from L3 Harris, the, the GM of autonomous and advanced naval platforms, definitely a major player in the prime space. And then uh, Chris Lynch, co-founder and CEO of Rebellion, which is a defense um, you know, software company that is primarily focused on defense, working a number of um, autonomy programs in the DOD. So I think we're, we're gonna try and tease out uh, you know, what is real, like what is hype, um, and how the department can learn from some of the commercial best practices. We might get a little more technical on this panel than some of the previous panels, but I think we'll, we'll keep it at a high level. Um, and we're really gonna try and see you know, how can the department learn from what's gone on in the last you know, five to 10 years in the commercial space in order to transition some of these autonomy programs that are in R&D now to uh, you know, fielding and sustainment in the future. Um, before I, I start, I'm gonna kind of set a, a framework here on what is the difference between commercial and defense autonomy, which is the subject of the panel today. So I've been on both sides of the fence now. I spent a long time in the DoD running um, autonomy programs and now I'm here in industry. Applied intuition, like we talked about at the beginning of the day, is primarily focused on the commercial sector, um, but we're growing in the defense space. And I, I, you know, when people ask me, like, what's the difference between commercial and defense autonomy, I, I kind of set it up this way. So the general concept of commercial autonomy is to move something from point A to point B, where point B is typically a known point. You're dropping off a person or a package or delivering a pizza. Um, and you know, the, the hard part there is a mobility problem. It's keeping things on the road, stopping at stop signs, not hitting a pedestrian. Um, on the defense side, you, know, you have that problem as well, but it's less of a mobility issue and you have like a higher level reasoning. So on the defense side, uh, typically point B is not a known point. You're putting an aircraft in an orbit or you're putting a vehicle on a route to optimize you know, longer range sensors, not your mobility sensors, but your longer range sensors to detect and classify a, uh, you know, a threat, basically, out of the myriad of other things that are out there. And then also trying to keep that, that vehicle out of the threat ring of other of bad guy stuff. 
Um, and so that kind of higher level reasoning is really where um, I've seen the applied engineers and, and others in this space that are, that are here today focusing. Um, so, how, so the way I look at it is, you know, my hypothesis is that the, the kind of foundational development pipeline is very similar for both problems. I think that's what we're going to try and tease out here today. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start by going out to Apexia in virtual land. Um, you know, at Gaddock, you've got uh, trucks driving on the road right now unmanned and with safety drivers. Very curious on your um, kind of current assessment of the state of autonomy in the commercial space, what you know well. Um, and then maybe you could talk to us a little bit about like what a well-designed development pipeline looks like for autonomy software. So over to you. Good job, Colin. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that great introduction and laying out the land. Um, I would start with a quick round of introduction. I'm a patient. I'm one of the co-founders and chief engineer at Gothic. Uh, at Gothic, what we have been up to is uh, building these autonomous box trucks specifically for middle mile B2B short haul use case. What this means is these vehicles are purpose built for delivering goods. Um, between known locations. So uh, something that Colin pointed out, uh, even within the commercial space, there are different kinds of, uh, I would say, use cases and applications uh, and a whole spectrum of uh, point A and point B, whether it's known or it's dynamic. Uh, for our use case, both the starting point, point A and point B, are essentially known and fixed. Uh, these are something like warehouses, distribution centers, retail fronts. Uh, for our customers like Walmart, Low Gloss, and many others for whom we have been deployed in commercial capacity for past several years, uh, doing multiple trips seven days a week. Uh, one of the key milestones that we achieved uh, last year with Walmart uh, was going fully driverless, uh, no one in the driver's seat uh, on these delivery routes uh, in Arkansas. Uh, beyond this, we are also deployed across several different states, uh, including Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, uh, as well as Greater Toronto area in Canada. Um, from here on, this, what we are essentially up to is expanding uh, with new and old customers, uh, both in scale in the number of vehicles and fleet size, uh, as well as uh, in terms of geographies and uh, states that we are essentially operating in. I think uh, looking at it more from an um, uh, I would say uh, operations standpoint, as well as like what does a well-defined process uh, looks like. I think uh, one of the key enablers for us uh, in achieving uh, these critical milestones, as well as uh, successful deployments across the different customer sites, um, have has been our extreme focus on structured autonomy. Uh, and when I say structured autonomy, it's the known routes or known locations where the vehicles start and where the vehicles end at. Uh, it has been a very key enabler in terms of achieving these milestones in this kind of like time frame. Uh, the other key aspect of it is our, uh, I would say more organized hybrid um, agile approach, as I say, towards uh, building systems and safety throughout the development and deployment processes at, or operations. So instead of thinking about it more from a more purely waterfall approach or a purely agile approach, um, I think it's um, uh, it's something hybrid version of like having multiple smaller Bs, B processes uh, with tighter and quicker feedback cycles between the requirements for the products, testing, verification, validation, fuel the fuel the uh, overall uh, development and deployment process. I think uh, there are several aspects of it, um, and there have been a lot of a lot of these items. I think we have been working very closely uh, with our partner like Applied uh, in terms of uh, evolving and adopting this. A lot of these include such as like, I would say targeted data collection and triaging from the field. Um, there are certain like, uh, I would say high fidelity simulations, both for software in loop as well as hardware in loop. Uh, there are certain aspects of re-simulation for the data captured in the real world and changing certain parameters and experimenting with it, um, as well as a very exhaustive scenario testing with fault injections uh, on closed ports, test tracks, uh, where we essentially test these vehicles before we roll these out uh, in operations on public road. So, um, in my perspective, I would the way I see it is a lot of these processes 
tools and standards, uh, if we look back a couple of years, um, did not exist for the level of automation or scale uh, of operations. Um, I think the one of the key strategies uh, that we have employed at Katek from the very, very early very, very early stages of the company is um, partner partnering with um, industry leaders such as applied who share our vision in terms of these kinds of innovations um, to create as well as adopt these processes to at the end of the day deliver on the safety efficiency and cost savings that we are promising our customers so i would say that's the overall um, uh, from an from an operations standpoint and from the uh, autonomy program standpoint those are some of the building blocks that uh, we think were key enablers for us Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like uh, a key kind of part of your strategy is you're you're choosing a manageable bite-sized piece to chew to to bite off first, and going after that. Yeah. And I'm sure that it's on your roadmap to expand out. I mean, Ryan, I I know you guys have been uh, doing this now for quite some time. Uh, can you talk about maybe how you started, you know, four or five years ago, and where you are now, and then what you see as the future in unmanned and autonomous from your perspective? Yeah, sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ryan Sang. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Shield AI. Shield AI exists to advance security and stability by building the world's best AI pilot. The company has been around for about seven years now. Uh, it was founded in 2015. My brother was a Navy SEAL. He was getting ready to transition, and I had been a technology founder that sold the company to Qualcomm, and so he came to me and felt like there was a great opportunity to bring the best in technology to the mission of national security. I felt like it was a great mission. Uh, it was something that I wanted to support, but I also felt like it was a really terrible business idea because conventional wisdom for so long had been that you never start a venture-backed company that's going to go after defense. But my brother, uh, you know, the trait that made him a SEAL, among others, is that he's a very persistent person. And so, he eventually wore me down. I agreed to, to join the company, and we, we started the company uh, with the mission of protecting service members and civilians with artificially intelligent systems. It took us a while to get people to uh, uh, believe that there might be an opening for success, uh, but fast forward to today, we've got about 400 people. Uh, I think uh, measured across many dimensions, we, we, we have what I think some would argue is the world's best AI pilot. And when we think about bringing the capability from the drawing board to the real world. Uh, some of the themes that were expressed uh, j just a second ago are, are things that we think about, which is how do you break down the problem into smaller pieces? How do you find a way to have um, a sustainable business model because you're going after things that can generate value early and often? How can you find ways to do deployments so you're actually closing the feedback loop between the development and the real world, which is something that's so important. I think one of the major lessons in autonomy has come from Tesla, a company which I think most people are familiar with. And I would say the thing that they have succeeded at doing where others have really struggled is to, number one, find a sustainable business model for autonomy. By leveraging the driver in the car, they were able to push out technology to a much lower level of maturity. And then number two, they, and, and therefore monetize it. And then number two, they found ways to optimize cycle time. And so uh, many people here are probably from defense who use the term OODA, but that's just, uh, that is equally relevant to engineering. If you can find ways to get your capability deployed, your engineers can conceive, develop, and test much faster, which makes them a much more effective team. And so when we think about taking something from conception to reality, uh, we think about the principles of uh, a sustainable business and the ability to have very fast cycle times. Chris, I'm going to throw it over to you. Uh, having worked on some of the, the DOD's autonomy programs now and then being, having been in the DOD, do you, uh, I guess, what do you see as the DOD's kind of biggest struggle to, to get to what Ryan and, and Apexa were saying? Sure. Hey, everybody. Chris Lynch. Um, <clears throat> I also am part of a group that decided to start a company focused exclusively on defense and national security, which is very very hard. And, and how do we and think modeling about sunglasses on your head? Yeah, well, that's the, because of the, 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 the bright burn. Um, the, there's a couple of things that I think about. So going back to just the list that you were laying out and kind of how to think about the current programs and what's happening, because um, we're in a piece of this. So what do we build? We build 
products that help with um, perception, understanding of battle space threats, things like that. So this is going to be how do we use computers to uh, analyze uh, sensor data and tell us where there are threats in an environment. And actually, Colin, you kind of started on that, right? D differentiating between commercial and military. Uh, we build things to connect platforms. Uh, as it turns out, the DoD is very, very large. And, you know, it's, what, a three million person organization, right? That includes military and civilians. So that's a lot of people who are doing a lot of things. That doesn't really even include contractors. So, you know, it's always helpful to think about any solution where somebody's like, oh, you know what the military should just do? They should just do this. You have to remember that it's like kind of a, it's like either a really large city or a, or a small country at any given moment. So um, anything that, you know, that you're going to change actually takes a little bit of work. Um, and then, you know, I, I think of this last little bit here, which is that when we think about what's happening and what we're building, we're also thinking about how do we secure this because software and technology is going to ultimately define advantage uh, in the battlefield, right? And we think about sort of where things have come from. You think of big, heavy machines that are sitting out a, on a runway or floating in the ocean. We think about those, but software and what we're talking about here today are ultimately going to provide key advantages, right? And if we can understand what the battle space is and we have information advantage, then we can lead to decision advantage. So we think a lot about how do we secure those things and provide both information decision advantage. Now, all that being said, uh, when you talk about, let's talk about different things that are going on in the department, what does it actually look like? Well, it, what I, there's good and there's not so good, right? There's good and there's bad here. Um, when you look at what's actually happening in the department, there's an unbelievable desire to lead on all of these technologies, everything that we're talking about here. I can't go through a, a meeting with the, the Department of Defense or the, the uh, intelligence community without somebody bringing up any one of these technologies, AI, autonomy, computer vision. I can't go through a single meeting where people are not bringing those things up. What we're seeing, however, is that there's a lot of things that are fundamentally missing, right? Some of the things, actually, I was going to say, I have a different way to look at commercial versus military, and it's a little bit more pragmatic. What are some of the things that are missing that are just given that anybody who's starting a company in commercial is going to be thinking about? Well, you're probably going to be like, hey, we can go ahead and drop a bunch of this data into a commercial cloud environment. We can run a bunch of things, build out our models, and then easily redeploy that, and we have instant connectivity to all of our things. You brought up Tesla. Well, they got you know, LTE or 5G that's available in cars. Well, what if you don't have any of those things? Well, that's a little bit harder, right? So in the military, because of the, the fact that it's very fragmented, a lot of those things are missing, right? So you don't have the ubiquitous compute connectivity, and you don't necessarily have the ubiquitous amount of storage. So some of that, that is going to be missing. So that's a challenge. And I think a lot of the groups that are early adopters are trying to push forward the the idea of how we do this in a, in, a, in a way that's at scale, I think that you're going to find that those, those groups are running into substantial challenges. How do we deploy this stuff, right? And oh, by the way, the Department of Defense is really good at buying big, heavy, industrial things, right? Well, what does it mean when it's software? Like, how does that work? What if that wasn't the thing that you cared about 30 years ago, but we're really good at buying a new tank? But we want to use all these technologies. So, you know, there's a lot of like, well, does it, is a tank that uses artificial intelligence and autonomy, if we delivered that tomorrow, what happens if those models need to be updated, right? Going back to your Tesla example, what if the models are wrong and you need to actually, you know, do something different? How do you deploy that? How does that get out to the battlefield? How does it get out, out to a place where there's no connectivity? These are real challenges. So all these things have to be solved in lockstep. You can't just ignore them. Right? So not only do we have to be able to have some place to like figure out what we're doing and what we're training models against, then we have to figure out like, cool, how to buy that stuff, and we tend to be really good at buying the big heavy metal things, and then we also have to deploy it. So uh, not, those are all substantial challenges. So, you know, it, it's a lot of hard work, and it's being done in pieces. But again, it's like it's a, it's a small country of people who are trying to make this happen, and it's going to take some time. It's not going to just happen because, you know, one company or one group is working on it. And I'm sure you saw the same thing. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. <laughs> definitely. So, so Reagan, having um, been a PM in the Department of the Navy and having heard kind of Chris lay out, here's some of the, the issues, um, 
how do you how do you kind of view is it the PM's role to then kind of own that whole thing? Like I'm making a, a you know autonomous unmanned service vessel. Do I need to own the 5G connectivity out to the, to the vessel as well? Or like where does the PM's role end? Yeah, interesting question. So hi everyone, Regan Campbell. I am uh, currently the general manager for autonomous and advanced naval platforms. As uh, just alluded to, I previously was a uh, program manager on the Navy side for the next frigate program, so Constellation class, for those of you who enjoy uh, uh, Navy work. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting question in terms of what is the PM's responsibility. So, so a lot of the things that we're talking about that, that these folks are working on, and, and really even some of my own team are working on, are the science and technology, the research and development, the OTA type work, right? That future work that isn't necessarily ready for a program of record. Um, of course, as you start to get into the PM's role and bringing technology forward into a program of record, you face a number of challenges, right? How are we going to bridge that gap? What's the right technology? You know, are you going through all the acquisition processes, which yes, can be um, lengthy and challenging, but it's how we buy things. Um, so we have to help navigate um, both from an industry side and from uh, really from, you know, in my case, Navy on the fleet side, right? We have to be pulling that technology, setting the requirement, drawing in the acquisition community as well. So there are a number of things that we can do to help that. Uh, as a PM, right, engaging with the fleet, understanding what the need is, engaging uh, with industry and understanding what industry knows. I think there is a, um, particularly in this space, there is a desire by the Department of Defense to try to own it and, and be the, the font of knowledge, um, but really they don't fully understand what um, AI companies can bring to the table. They don't understand how mature the technology is, and they don't understand all the use cases or, or capabilities that we can bring to bear for their problems. So, the PM has to be willing to reach out and understand exactly the maturity levels that are out there, the potential, and then really be willing to work with, um, with the fleet to understand how they could use this technology, right? It has, to be a, it has to be a conversation. It has to be a learning environment. And it has to be um, a transition, but also a what are the future capabilities that we're going to bring to bear. So for instance, in, in my world, right, I build autonomous surface vehicles. So there's a near-term mission set that we're headed after. But there are so many more missions that it's capable of. Uh, as you start introducing, for instance, autonomous payloads, you start growing the capability, the fleet gets their hands on it, they start to realize there are different things it can do. Um, the, the PM has to, has to have a transition path for future technologies built into a life cycle plan. So a lot of, a lot of exciting stuff there. I will follow up on that in a second. Ryan, go ahead. Yeah, can I comment? So, so there are a lot of discussions um, and, and great points made about what government could do differently to acquire you know, AI and software. But kind of in, in my journey, I've, I've arrived at kind of a simple thing that I've known for a long time which is, you know, accountability matters, find a way to win. A company is accountable for its survival, a company is accountable for its success, and I don't think anybody in industry should be planning on the government changing. For, for the first five years, I attended so many conferences and I had high hopes that the government would suddenly change and figure out how to buy software, and a couple years ago, I decided that that just wasn't gonna happen. But that doesn't mean that we can't find a way to get the best software and best AI in the hands of government customers. You just have to hold yourself accountable as the business, and you have to hold yourself as accountable as a team and a person to find a way to win. I was having a conversation with my executive team a couple years ago on this very topic, and I said, look, here, here are our choices. Either we don't like the rules, we're going to create a new system, we're going to set up the XFL, or we're going to accept the rules as they are. 
and we're going to build the New England Patriots, and we're going to be the best damn AI provider the government or the world has ever seen, and we're going to figure it out. And so that's where Shield AI is at this point, and I would advise anybody that's thinking about starting a company that wants to transact with government. And, and I have great optimism that the government will change and find ways to, to acquire software more easily, but that cannot be part of your business plan if you want to find success in this market. Yeah, so we, there were multiple panels earlier. So I, like, a lot of times when you get industry on a panel, it's just like a, it's a bitch fest, right? Everyone's complaining. <laughs> Deputy Hicks was no out. No excuses. Like, <laughs> Deputy Hicks was out in Silicon Valley. They had like an industry day, 17 companies. This was about a month ago, and it was just continuous bombardment on her from everyone complaining about how they don't know how to work with DoD. So I, I tend to agree with you. However, you've got your brother who was a, a, you know, in the DoD, speaks the language. We all kind of have some DoD background here. There are lots of companies that don't. I, I think that, I mean, that's the key thing, though, right? It's not just my brother who, who you know, enables us to, to find ways to get our software in the hands of the right people. We have an entire organization set up to transact with government because we recognize the complexity of the programs, we recognize the knowledge gap, and we recognize that if we want to be the tip of the spear driving new technology, you know, again, we have to hold ourselves accountable for finding a way to speak the language of the customer, to transact in a way that the customer understands. And of course, I'm happy to participate in panels like this and enumerate, you know, maybe in a sidebar, all the things that could be done differently that would make our life easier. But challenge also creates opportunity, right? And, and when you're competing in business, which I think is a good thing in general because it drives forward technology, it drives forward capability, um, when you're competing in business, you just can't afford to wait. I mean, and, and, and when you are up against a hard challenge, whether it be the technology challenge of AI or the procurement challenges of government, it creates opportunity. It means that countless others are going to slam into the wall and fail. And if you're durable enough, gritty enough, and clever enough, you're going to find that hole in the wall and everybody else is going to bounce off. I have maybe somewhat moving to a to a slightly different uh, direction on this, which is you brought up the the maturity of the technology, and and I'll actually call out a few other things. Um, I do agree that you have to go to where you see the easiest way to uh, to play a part in a role in the military and the business. I I say this a lot, and I think that it's important. You you can't just be enamored with the complexity and the difficulty of the problem ahead. However, I do think that for those of us who are in this space and are there, in our building, one of the, the comments that, uh, that you had that kind of made me think about it was the maturity of the technology. I actually think if I'm in the Department of Defense and I'm thinking about these technologies and where to go, I actually wouldn't get too caught up in the fantastical uses of artificial intelligence and machine learning and computer vision. And, you know, I kind of laid out a few steps that I hope that is... That, that people in the department, I and mean, I know that people in the department are working through, right? Getting ubiquitous compute and storage, having an ability to deploy software, having an ability to update things. Those are all gonna be, they're gonna be key, especially if we're gonna have conflict with technologically advanced adversaries, right? Um, but one of the things that I think that people actually get, get lost in is, I have a lot of discussions where I just wanna get people level set to where things are. My entire house is run from a whole series of smart assistants and technologies and everything's automated and it's great when it works. Most of the time I ask for the damn lights to be turned on and they don't turn on and I ask for my coffee machine to be turned on at a certain time and it doesn't and half the lights will not ever be triggered by the automations that are working. And this is with everything being 100% state of the art. So I actually find that I'm kind of not enamored with the current state when we think about the fantastic uses of how all these things might do or might be used. And I think that that's actually very helpful, right? The reality is, is that when we talk about self-driving cars and we talk about Tesla and going back down to it, let's not kid ourselves. There's not a bunch of Teslas that are driving around them streets autonomously doing everything 100% by themselves. And when you look at the Gaddick example, that's a really good example. We understand where we're going. We have a lot of knowns in order to make that happen. The military deals a lot in unknowns. The difference is that we might actually set something as a destination and it might not exist when we get there. I think that that's important. That's a huge difference. It might actually be gone. We're seeing that happen right now with Russia attacking Ukraine, right? That's the type of stuff that's actually unfolding in front of our eyes. So when we think about this, we should think about, let, let's not actually try to set the examples that it's all the fantastical uses of computer vision, 
artificial intelligence and machine learning, let's actually talk about the things that we can do. Because I find that we spend way too much time talking about all the shit that doesn't actually exist and we want it to exist. And we've seen in every science fiction movie and I have every belief in my heart that it is gonna be there at some point in the future. And I'm super excited for it. Because I'm waiting for my coffee machine to turn on it when I tell it to. And I'm waiting for the lights to be triggered at the right time and to be at the right color and all that kind of stuff. But they're not, right? Now that doesn't mean that it's not useful technology because it absolutely is, right? But let's make sure that we're bringing everybody along on the journey. And so when I think about like uh, the, the talking about building a business and you think about how to participate in the, in the mission of defense and national security, know that it is hard. It is hard. It's just a reality. Don't be caught up in how difficult it is because you still have to build a business. I totally agree with that. But on the same end, it is incredibly important and it needs people like us. It needs people like you. It needs people like me and it needs others to come into the mission. It needs people like us to help guide and direct and build that path into the future. But they're gonna also have to be a good partner. That's just the reality, right? And that's gonna be the key thing about how I think about advantage in the future and how software, artificial intelligence, autonomy is gonna ultimately play an incredible role in providing those key advantages that I was uh, talking about earlier. Yeah, I'd like to, so I'd like to go back out to Apexha so, you know, from what Chris said, hey, here's the kind of baseline truth on, on autonomy. You're at the forefront there. Just curious, you've got some experience working in a startup. You've got some experience working at a large automotive manufacturer. It, to me, large automotive manufacturer sounds very much like Department of Defense when I picture them. Um, could you kind of talk about your experiences there and the difference and maybe uh, what you've learned? For sure, Chris, I, uh, Colin, I think uh, one of the things that uh, uh, during this discussion, uh, I think uh, not uh, coming from uh, more of a uh, defense side, but more on the commercial side, like one of the key things that uh, at Gatik that we essentially held very dearly when we started the company uh, and something that I have learned over uh, my previous experiences as well as um, obviously the technology and uh, the state of the art would take some time to mature, but there are some uh, use cases and applications which are very near term and quite achievable, uh, uh, feasible, even from a technology standpoint. Uh, one of the key things that uh, we had in mind and the focus at Gatik uh, of having uh, structured autonomy use case of having these known route use case uh, was essentially to have these some of the unknowns as well as being able to address those unknowns in a more tangible manner right so if we if we look at the overall commercial landscape there is a huge amount of like even in the logistics space there is like a landscape of a spectrum of different use cases all the way from long haul to uh, b2c deliveries going from retail fronts to customer doorsteps right um, what Gatik is uh, focusing on is the middle mile, the uh, uh, B2B, where we're essentially delivering from warehouses, distribution centers to other warehouses. Um, I think uh, uh, there is a need in terms of like, uh, I would say more frontier technology. Uh, and this is what uh, like I believe, uh, very truly believe in is uh, what's possible, what's feasible and finding out those uh, use cases and. Uh, I would say the segments where the technology can be actually useful uh, in terms of like the efficiency as well as safety uh, and a lot of different benefits that can be found in other markets and other segments as well. Uh, but that has been a key learning uh, at, uh, while forming and uh, 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 growing Gatek is um, the focus on uh, tangible use cases that can actually see the light uh, in the commercial space. Um, I think the other aspect, uh, more from more from the OEMs and uh, I would say more well-established organizations. I think the key uh, thing that uh, that that we see uh, across these industries is um, we are still thinking about these solutions. Uh, I would say that these companies are still thinking about the solutions more from the traditional automotive perspective. Uh, a lot of the processes and standards and tools are still uh, aligned to those traditional automotive perspective. Uh, the applications that uh, essentially what Gatik is working on are autonomy of like L3 or L4 plus level autonomy. 
it's a it's a very interesting combination of traditional automotive space as well as uh, the more advanced complex software systems including ai and machine learning right so just thinking about uh, these processes uh, and adopting it from one single industry uh, it's it's not enough uh, we we really need um, there's a necessity to evolve these processes, adopt these uh, as part of the overall organization uh, from get-go. So I think um, it, it's it's not just about the safety that we are delivering on, it's also the predictability in the timelines of delivering the solution um, is also important. So I think uh, there, is, there is a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, confusion around the maturity of the technology and uh, its application to the different use cases. Um, even in the autonomy space, but I think uh, what what we need to realize is there are certain use cases, there are certain applications uh, where this technology is very feasible and can be uh, applied um, in the near future, uh, and we should recognize and address those. Yeah, if I could, if I could add it um, along to that. So, absolutely, same experience on the ASV side of the house, right? So. From a platform perspective, right, coal regs compliance or, or navigation compliance uh, from a shipbuilding side is really hugely important, right? And it's the rules of the road associated with navigation. Um, a lot of the same principles, right? Proving that you can do that as a first stepping stone. Then, you know, some of the simpler, less sexy um, applications such as condition-based maintenance, right, where you're assessing what's going on from a hm and &E, uh, sorry, whole mechanical and electrical perspective, sorry, I don't wanna to use too many acronyms here, um, where you understand what's going on, hey, I, I need to flush a valve, I need to turn something on, I need to change a filter, et cetera, to actually be able to uh, do those longer term missions that have specific maintenance requirements associated with them where you previously relied on somebody to do it for you, now the system is is taking care of those, those uh, opportunities themselves. So growing from a navigation, which is which is in some ways a little bit more rules-based to a conditions-based maintenance where you have a, uh, a little bit more complexity to now looking at things like contact event identification, where you have machine learning coming into play, some level of AI uh, also coming into play before you start tackling, for instance, hey, let's weaponize it and let's see where we're headed. So really doing those building block steps before you get to that kind of uh, really challenging, exquisite mission uh, that people aren't ready for yet. And in all of those initial steps, building the trust associated with that, whether that be through modeling and simulation, whether that be through demonstration, whether that be certification, of the autonomy of the AIML and really working through those steps uh, alongside the department. So we're all headed the same direction and we've built the confidence and the capabilities. So uh, I think, Chris, your nirvana of lights turning on, coffee being ready when you wake up in the morning, I think we've, we've heard kind of the, the state of where we are. Um, I guess my question to the panel here, especially the, the people working on the defense side is, do we see any autonomy program in the DOD that's well designed to kind of deliver the iterative solution now, but also the long-term kind of continuously updating the, the, the example you brought up of a machine learning model that needs to be updated you know, weekly or monthly based on new inputs, new adversary action, et cetera. Is anything out there well designed? I, we're participants in, in many programs, and I, I find that the vast majority of them um, are well-structured. Um, just by way of context, so we, we created an AI pilot, and we put an AI pilot on a quadcopter to search buildings and clear threats. It's completely autonomous. The communication link goes out. It will search a building like this, look for any opening, map it, and try to find people, and then when it thinks it's dumb, it comes back and talks to people. It is extremely sophisticated artificial intelligence well above and beyond what would go into a Tesla autonomous vehicle in terms of the complexity of the mission being presented to it. So when we think about kind of, th there's this trade-off I would say between capability and dependability, or maybe they're not trade-offs, but the more capability you add, the harder it is to make it 
dependable because the complexity of the system just keeps going up. And so Shield AI's approach has been to climb and conquer the aviation food chain, as we call it. We look for the applications where the capability of an AI pilot is well matched to its dependability. And so when you think about putting in a very capable AI pilot that occasionally makes terrible choices onto an aircraft, you don't want to target the Joint Strike Fighter as the first thing that you do, right? But you can, you can put it on a quadcopter. And importantly, when you put it on a quadcopter, you're delivering mission value. You're able to iterate very quickly. And, by, and we use the same AI core at Shield AI for work on mid-size aircraft. So we have a plane called the VBAT. It weighs about 125 pounds. It's sweet. Takes off and lands like a, a SpaceX rocket. I love it a lot. And, uh, but it flies around for about 12 hours. But, you know, very different aircraft, but same autonomy core applied to it. And then we also do work. We'll, we'll, be, we'll have our first flight in a jet uh, later this year, which I'm also very excited about. I think it'll be that first AI pilot in a proper jet uh, in, in history. And um, we're leveraging the same AI backbone that we use for a tiny quadcopter that we're leveraging for our mid-sized aircraft, now applying it to uh, some of the most capable assets uh, in the DoD. And, and, and what we're doing is we're driving up the dependability of it. We're sort of kind of recognizing that the capability is the first thing to yield. You can show incredible results most of the time and then, you know, really terrible results occasionally. Um, but, you know, finding the applications where failure is okay is something uh, that we focus a lot on and when we think about kind of, you know, simplifying the problem, driving the capability out to the field. I feel, I'll jump in. So I feel like, though, everything you described there is kind of like in-house. You control the full management of the data, the development, the testing. You're fielding a full product. I'm curious, if you, are you seeing that on the, on the DUD side, though, from a program perspective where maybe there's more players than, you know, more performers than just one? We partner with others, so it's not just us, um, especially when you think about large aviation assets. Like, we cannot build them. I, I guess maybe conceptually we could, but you know, others would probably be much better at it. Um, so, so it's essential for us to partner with people that have deep experience in these areas. Um, when I think about the, the, the government side, um, I think th th there has been a long history of trying to open up interfaces in a way that has created some openings for, for companies like ours uh, to come in. I think recently it was announced that the, uh, I forget the name of the Air Force Squadron, but they pushed an operational flight program update uh, for the F-16. And it was done in-house, right, as opposed to having to go through Lockheed Martin as the prime contractor. And, and, and so it seems like a small thing, but the fact that the government was able to update flight software on an F-16 Kind of then therefore means that companies like ours can push software onto those aircraft. Of course, kind of in partnership with the, with the prime contractors. Now, we do do a lot in-house, and we vertically integrate a lot, because getting back to my uh, you know, New England Patriot XS XFL thing, right? Uh, it, it, we get a little bit nervous if we can't control you know, our destiny. Chris? Yeah, I, I want to hit a, a few things here. Um, I think that there are great examples of how all this technology can be used, and I think that we see a lot of examples of that. And you know, um, even with our own products, we will we will we are part of a mission set where we will be orders and orders and orders of magnitude faster, or. Uh, than, than how it's currently being done in a, in a particular mission. But I, I took the question a little bit different, which isn't so much just what we're building, it's what's happening in the department. And if, and if I'm looking at the Department of Defense and I'm looking at the broad uh, set of things that are occurring, on one end you've got large programs, right? Now a lot of those have been around for a long time. And, uh, and in some cases, there are companies who are uh, very good at building the big metal thing that you just called out, right? Um, and I think that that's important. Uh, they may not necessarily be great, in all cases, at building software. And, and we work with a number of those companies. Um, they, it isn't necessarily their bread and butter, and it's not that they're a, a bad company. It's just that they grew up building jets or things like that, and I don't know anything about jets. Don't come to me if you want to build a jet. I don't know. Um, 
But we do know about building software, and, we, and I think that the magic is going to come over time to where you can just name a bunch of very big, incredible outcomes that come from large existing programs in autonomous systems. When you tell those stories, you already know the answer to your question. And I think that I would challenge everybody here to say, well, why did Chris focus at the beginning so much on these big infrastructural pieces that the department has to go? Because there's a roadmap that mirrors how commercial got ahead at actually getting some of these things fielded. Now, it isn't that they can't come to me or they can't come to Shield or L3 to buy solutions and put them together and then try to push them out in their missions. But I think that really what we're looking for here is an incredible story that doesn't exist yet of how one of these systems had an incredible impact that would not have been possible without autonomy or artificial intelligence or computer vision. And it's not that the technology made it as much as we couldn't have been able to accomplish those things before and we have a story that we can tell. I don't think that that's there yet. I don't know of that team. I know of lots of different places where individual missions and things like that have, have great uses of, of technologies and commercial technologies that they're bringing in. But the large programs, um, it's just gonna take a little bit of time and it's gonna take a little bit of effort to get there. Um, but somebody asked me the other day, they were like, hey, what's your favorite like big existing AI platform uh, that's you know, it, sort of a, a key part of the DoD? And I, I don't really know. Now, I know the Jake, I know Maven, and I, we know these different groups, and they're all fantastic. Um, but they're also fighting to push those things into the operational mission set. That's really where the, the next big thing will be, where they aren't just in the R&D side. They're not just in the um, how we envision how this might go together, but they're part of a big program. How does a big program that's designed to field big metal things on a block upgrade basis also incorporate like a continuous R&D software cycle that's tied to that? And I, I have not seen that anywhere, but maybe it does exist. But maybe that's what, you know, the example of pushing an update to the F-16. Having a more technical workforce is another piece of it. I didn't cover that. But in many ways, you know, in a previous life before Rebellion, I started a team called Defense Digital Service, originally under Ash Carter. And we just had this idea of let's bring incredibly technical people into the mission of defense. And, and in some ways, I think that that's just as important. And, and that's why I say that the, this, all these things are going to happen in two different ways. You have to have companies like mine. You have to have companies like Shield. Those all have to exist. But you also are going to have things that are going to start to occur within the department itself. Uh, some of it is foundational. Some of it is workforce related. Um, but a technical workforce that knows what a continuous integration, continuous delivery pipeline is, wow, that would be amazing. That's awesome, right? You have people who are talking about DevOps and DevSecOps and CICD pipelines. Like, that's going to be incredible. But if you don't have those things, eh, it's going to be really hard. So we've got about two minutes left here. Um, I'll take one from the audience here, it's very quick. We'll, we'll do a round robin. We'll start with you, Apexa. So if you had to give, in this case it's the DOD, but in your case I think maybe just generally, uh, you know, the autonomy development sector, a report card on its autonomous development practices, what would your grade be? Yeah, I think there is a whole spectrum to that in terms of even uh, uh, in the commercial sector. Uh, I think uh, we, we talked briefly about uh, some of the more traditional perspectives that some of the companies, uh, more established companies have. But I, the way I see it is there is a whole spectrum. Uh, I think we talked uh, a lot about uh, some of the references to Tesla. I think um, uh, from a more technology standpoint, um, it's it's a different level of automation. It's it's. Uh, what we consider ourselves like at Gothic and some of the other companies, that's L4 plus or L5, which is like true autonomy, but no one in the driving seat. Um, if you look at the overall spectrum, there is uh, the whole traditional automotive perspective of approaching uh, system development, uh, validations and deployment. And then you have on the other end where, where companies are essentially releasing these alpha and beta versions of this, these uh, highly complicated systems out there on the 
public road for untrained customers to test out. So I think that is uh, a bit of like, uh, it, it's skewed in terms of the, the way uh, different companies are approaching it. But I think um, there are certain uh, very serious players in this market uh, and uh, it's, it's of utmost importance to have those uh, processes and uh, uh, more innovative and evolved processes for actually addressing uh, the application of autonomy uh, in a more incremental approach. Uh, that, that, that's how I see it. And yep. So mixed spectrum here, very rapidly. DoD report card. No excuses. We'll figure it out. <laughs> but A plus. F. F. Wow. All right. Yeah. I'll go a little better. I'll, I'll go with a C um, because I think there are, there are a lot of fits and starts, but they are making progress. Okay, Chris. Forty-two, but I'm not telling you what that's that is, out of. That is Fifty. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I appreciate your time today. Um, we'll uh, step off here right now. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you to our panel. We've definitely now seen some of the core similarities and differences between commercial and defense autonomy and across different autonomy domains, as well as dived into accountability and reliability of these types of autonomous systems for them to be widely adopted. So up next, we're actually gonna have our keynote addressed. So for any of those people standing on the sidelines, please take a seat, as well as if you happen to come in a bit late afterwards, please do take a seat instead of standing on the sidelines. But next up, we have Mark Andreessen, co-founder of Andreessen Horowitz on the venture landscape for autonomy in defense. Please welcome to the stage, Mark Andreessen and Kasser Yunus. All right. So uh, I think uh, Mark needs no introduction, but I will, do a, uh, I will do a short introduction for the folks who don't know. Um, Mark first actually uh, entered the scene as the co-creator of the first internet browser uh, and co-founder Netscape, uh, which later sold for $4.2 billion to a company called AOL, which used to be a big dominant company at the time. Um, and then he also co <laughs> you can go ahead. <laughs> no, it was, and it's, it was a specifically a big dominant company here in, in Virginia. Yeah, the yeah. DC complex. So exactly. Everybody here knows it well. Um, and you co-founded uh, LoudCloud, which uh, sold to HP uh, for $1.6 billion, where you ultimately were on the board. Uh, most uh, recently, uh, recently being 2009, you co-founded Andreessen Horowitz and uh, a venture fund now that manages over $30 billion in capital. Um, and he's been a long-term board member at Meta and also Applied Intuition. Uh, so let's welcome Mark. So uh, we, we have some time here. We want to really dive into three specific sections uh, of the conversation today. Uh, first, uh, American dynamism. Uh, it's a concept that uh, uh, your firm has, has created, and, and we want to talk a little bit about that. Number two, uh, Silicon Valley and the government. Uh, you guys have been investing, and you're quite close to the uh, DC ecosystem as well. And then third, Outside of all this, the markets today and what's happening, the markets have been quite volatile, so we want to get your, your thoughts on those as well. So uh, first and foremost, uh, what, is, uh, what is the American dy dynamism thesis, uh, just so everyone's on the same page? Yeah, so the idea of American dynamism, it's a, it's a whole investment program effort we have, um, and, and, it, and it cuts heavily into national, a big part of it is national security, defense, uh, intelligence, and, and helping to build companies that directly address the defense and intelligence community. Um, you know, the, the basic thesis is very straightforward, which is just, <laughs> it's a, I get emotional. This used to be a country that built things, right? Like this used to be a country that built big dramatic things, right? You know, giant dams, you know, the Hoover Dam and the, you know, giant, you know, the Golden Gate Bridge and the Apollo Project and the, uh, the Manhattan Project and, and so forth. Uh, and, and by the way, we built we built cities, right? It's just, I was just reminded, you know, driving in driving into DC from the airport today. It's just like you know all these just like giant buildings that have been there for you know I don't know how long, the 150, 200 years, and will be there for another, you know, probably thousand years. Um, you know, this city was a startup at one point, right? Um, uh, you know, where I am, San Francisco was a startup at one point. Uh, all, all the all the all, all American cities were, were startups at one point. The whole country was a you know was a startup. You know, not that long ago, um, and so, and, and it's a, it's a country that always prided itself on production. Um, and, and this this almost sounds heretical. Uh, I'm just going to say something out loud that just sounds like almost like sacrilegious these days. Production as a social good, like <laughs> like we are going to build things and make things, and we are going to consume raw materials, and we are going to use energy. 
um, and we are going to have factories and plants, and we are going to produce things, and those things are going to make you know, going to make the country better and going to make make the world better. And it's like, in, in, in you know, sort of like the you know the immediate reaction that you kind of have to that, even if you're you know kind of maybe a little bit more politically on the right, it's like, ooh, like, is that environmentally friendly? Right, like you just get this like immediate like I don't know if we're supposed to be doing that kind of thing anymore, right? And and, and sure enough, it's like you know what do you see in the U.S.? No more cities, right? When when was the last time a new city was created in the U.S.? It was actually in the it's, I think it was all the way back in the 1950s. Um, you know when you know when, when's the last time we built a you know supersonic uh, you know air transport, right? Yep. It's like well we've we've actually been climbing down from supersonic air travel, right? We decided that apparently that's you know it's too fast, um, and so we we just we basically have decided. And I think basically what happened was we, we decided sort of starting in the 1960s, we, we decided as a society and as a culture, and let's just say to deprioritize building uh, and deprioritize production and maybe start to, you know, Do ask. you think that was conscious or, uh, or why, why did that happen? So I think there's a couple of things. So I think there's a, there was a cultural political change that happened, and I'll, I'll probably avoid the, there's a big political discussion you could have on this because there was, you know, a big kind of political social revolution in the 60s that I think was the, the origin of a lot of this. But I'll, I'll try to sidestep that because I want to, you know, this is a big tent uh, <laughs> audience. I don't want to alienate anybody. Um, uh, but but I think also there's like a systems design kind of aspect to it, um, right? Which is basically we we decided societally and culturally that we were going to implement what I what I some people refer to as a vetocracy, which is basically you know basically a system in which a lot of people get a veto, right? And so if you just if, if you think well, this comes up all the time in the uh, you know both both uh, parties propose these infrastructure bills, right? Every time somebody gets in the White House, they propose an infrastructure bill, and it's like you know wow we're going to have funding to build all these new dams and factories and chip fabs and you know all these all these amazing amazing things. And it's like, oh, it's illegal to build all those things, right? Like, try to build a new dam or a new toll road or a new, I mean, try to build a housing complex in San Francisco, right? Like, it's basically, like, completely <laughs> illegal. San, San Francisco this year has authorized 70 new housing units for the entire city, right? <laughs> Seven zero, right? The, the estimates are that the Bay Area is missing up to 2 million housing units, right, as compared to the number of people who actually economically, like, want to live in the Bay Area. And so San Francisco is San Francisco going to build 70. Um, and so we, we've created a basically a set of systems in which a lot of people have the ability to basically say, no, that's not going to happen. Uh, you know, another example is, you know, try to build a new hospital, right? And, and it turns out, like, there's a process for building new hospitals. Uh, hospitals have to get accredited. They have to get accredited by the Association of whatever hospital accreditation, you know, that's got some big acronym that I'm sure has some big office downtown here. Um, you know, guess who runs the hospital accreditation, you know, committee, right, is the existing hospitals, right? Guess how excited they are at authorizing the, you know, the construction of a new hospital, right, right down the street that's going to compete with them. And so you just have example after example after example, right, of, of, of how basically de decisions could be stopped. You know, obviously in, in Washington, this, this plays out very visibly in, in you know, obviously in, in, in Congress, um, you know, with, with, you know, oversight, right? Uh, like, who could argue with oversight? Well, you know, oversight is a wonderful process for, for, for preventing things from happening, right, from new, new programs getting funded or, or new approaches being taken. And so we, we've just, we've decided culturally, societally, that we just basically don't, don't want the kind of forward motion we used to have to happen. Um, so for me, what happened was, what, what led us to this investment program was, for me, I had a particular moment where I, I kind of snapped. Um, and I couldn't, I had my, my, my uh, if you remember the movie Network, my Howard Beale moment where I screamed out the window, I can't take it anymore. Um, it was at the height of COVID. It was at the height of COVID. It was the height of the first big wave of, of COVID in America. And if and remember, COVID in the U.S. hit New York City particularly hard, right? In the in the so it was the summer of 2020, like really hard. Um, there was you know a lot, a lot of suffering. Um, and so there there was this huge crisis at the time. There was a shortage of of all this stuff. And at the time, people were very worried about the shortage of ventilators, which turned out to be less of an issue. But um, they're worried about the shortage of so-called personal protective equipment, right? And it's like, okay, man, there was big, you know, concern. People were hoarding masks, and remember, we civilians were not supposed to wear masks, right? Up until wearing masks became absolutely mandatory, <laughs> right? Like when when uh, when, when the, the experts did a 180. But you know, there was all this concern about whether you know people working in hospitals, doctors and nurses would be able to have masks, they, whether they'd have surgical gloves. Um, and then there was this call. The mayor of the city at the time put out a call, and he said, "We're out of surgical gowns." Uh, would people in New York City please bring your trash bags and rain ponchos and drop them off at your nearest hospital uh, for, for, for use as, as surgical counts uh, in, in, the, in the ORs and in the intensive care units? And, and, and that, was like, that was my moment where I'm just like, okay, like, we need to be able to make surgical gowns. Yeah. We need to be able to make masks. <laughs> we need to be able to make right gloves. We need to be able to make ventilators. Right, um, uh, which again at the time we, we thought we need. We need to be able to make. By the way, we need to be able to make vaccines. It actually turned out we had the ability to make vaccines. Right, so that that was like a, a, a huge kind of bright spot. But there was just this moment where it's like, okay, what you know, what has happened to us? And then of course, 
the strategic backdrop behind that, which was really kicking in right around that time, was like, okay, to what extent is a very broad range of goods and services produced in America very dependent on parts and components and inputs right from overseas? And so there was big concern right at that moment that the supply chain, the drug supply chain, which is heavily based in India, was going to break down. And then, of course, there's all the geopolitical issues involving the supply chain coming in from China. And in fact, you know, here we sit today, and a lot of car companies, including American car companies, can't actually make cars today because they can't get the parts from China, right? So then there's this whole re, you know, kind of reshoring thing that, that, that start, that's finally starting to happen. But it's like, okay, like, what, how did we get in this position? Like, why don't we have production capacity for all the things that we need? And it's like, oh, because we chose to stop yep. making things. Um, and, so, and so basically, like, it, 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 I think it's time to, to re-examine that. And, uh, and r roughly, uh, how, do you, how do we find our way out of that, uh, out of that hole? Yeah, so the first thing I did, so I wrote a, uh, I wrote a, uh, I started with, with, wrote an essay called It's Time to Build uh, at the time. Um, and, and, and basically what I said was, look, like a, a big part of it, it's, it's a very complex, <laughs> it took 50 years to get in this situation. It's going to take a long time to get out and there, there are no easy answers. But, you know, the first thing for sure is to kind of decide on what the goals are, right? And, and, and which is why I kind of start, start this the way that I do, which is like, if, is the goal to build things, right? Is the goal to build new things? Is the goal to build new factories? Is the goal to build new infrastructure, new products, like whatever, whatever? Whatever it is, is the goal to build it. And then we have, you know, we in our system have, you know, lots of different points of view. People have lots of different points of view. And again, you know, this gets into politics very fast because people on the left have, you know, a lot of strong points of view about what the government should be doing versus what businesses should be doing. People on the right are very, you know, proud of what businesses do. Um, you know, my cr critique of people on the right with this is there, there's, a, there's a distinction between the idea of, of being pro-business and being pro-market. And sometimes maybe people on the right get a little bit more focused on pro-business versus pro-market. Pro-business meaning basically supportive incumbents. Right, uh, as opposed to open market competition. Um, and so, you know, you kind of get in these arguments about how things should work, but the, the, the big thing should, regardless of where you sit on that, the big thing is like, okay, how are we going to score the results, right? If, if you're on the left and you want the government to do more, then how do we score the results of all the government work? If you're on the right and you think the free market should be doing more of this, how do we score those results, right? And it shouldn't just be more of the same. It shouldn't be these programs that run for a very long time and chew lots of money. I mean, the stories, you know, Calif I'll pick on California again, because it, I live in California, I pay for all this. It's, it's so easy it's, to do. It's endlessly both frustrating and, and entertaining to pick on California, but, you know, we, we have a high-speed rail project, right, under development in California. It's been under development for like a decade, you know, between, it's, you know, here's a radical idea. Let's connect the Northern California and Southern California, right? Like, this is like, this is like a radical, like, breakthrough thinking idea, like infrastructure. Let's have, like, a high-speed train that connects. A bunch of records stopped in California right now, and uh, they scratched when you said that. Yeah, exactly. So, so so, so, well, the, politi the good news is the politicians agree that this is the goal. I think they're, it's like they're $10 billion or something into the project, and they still haven't laid the first piece of track, right? And it's just like, okay, what on earth, like, what, it's like, where is, like, how does that much money flush, right, right out, out of a system? And, like, where is the high-speed rail, right? And this is where, and, and, and I should say, like, I, a lot of people at this point in the, the discussion kind of start to say, well, China knows how to do everything. We know how to do nothing. And I, I don't quite agree with that. But... However, in this case, if this were China, like, that train would be running today. Uh, um, and so it, it's clearly, like, we have the technology to build trains. Yeah. Like, uh, quantum yeah. computing we're still working on, <laughs> like, train, trains we know how to build. Um, and, 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 and so it, it, that should be the scorecard, is, like, is, is the train actually running? Uh, and it's, it, it is still astonishing to me how often with these programs you'll have these incredibly long conversations about process. Um, and almost nobody will ever actually ask the I mean, is the solution, the uh, you know, more market intervention, for the lack of better words? I mean, really what you've seen in the last 20, 25 years is the emergence of the venture industry in the powerhouse that it is now in terms of providing, I think, some of these solutions. Do you think that's all the solution, or do you think it's some of the solution? How do you think about that? Yeah, so look, and again, this gets, people have lots of opinions on, on this. So, um, so our, you know, we're in the venture capital business, the, the startup business. And so, yeah, so our view is like there is a general solution to a lot of this, not necessarily a solution to the train, but like to, to, to a lot of things, which is like, okay, if there's a, if, if, if a certain kind of product isn't getting made, let's just start a company and fund a company that, that is going to make that thing. Um, it, there's a huge opportunity for that in, in a, across a lot of markets, including the really big and thorny markets like healthcare and education. And, and the reason is just because, a big part of what's happened based in this country is we actually don't have a free market system per se. We, we have this sort of oligopolistic government entangled, mixed, they call a mixed economy, right? And so basically if you look across like lots of industries in the U.S., basically what, what you see is this pattern where it basically people will tell you it's a free market system, but it's actually not. Let's take banking as an example, right? So you've got the, you've got the, three, you've got the three really big banks that became famous in the, you know, in the financial crisis and the, you know, the, the great book, Too Big to Fail, and they made a movie about it. And so everybody identified there's these three big banks, J.P. Morgan, Citibank, Bank, Bank of America, um, and they're too big to fail, and they, they, have to, they have to get bailed out, as it turns out, repeatedly, 
Um, and then basically every time they're bailed out, and this happened in 2008, there's a big backlash to the bailout, right? Um, and then everybody says, well, we can never let this happen again. Um, and so therefore, too big to fail banks cannot be allowed to exist anymore. We need a larger number of smaller banks. We need to disassemble these conglomerates and we need to get to a larger number of smaller banks so we have redundancy and resiliency in the system. Um, sitting here today, 12 years later, right, um, the, all those three banks are much larger than, than they were in 2008. They're much bigger. Um, and they've actually rolled up a lot of market share in the banking uh, sector. And then, by the way, new bank charters in the U.S. have dropped to essentially zero. There's like a couple of Amish banks. <laughs> and like, I'm in favor of Amish banks. They're just not likely to go for market share. Um, and there's a couple of other banks. But like, new bank charters actually were running pretty high up until 2008, and then they dropped to zero. And so... Whatever happened in banking reform and regulation and all these bills and everything, you know, these thousand-page bills that pass, it's not clear if anybody ever reads them, um, right, is, is somehow the result of all that has been these, these two big to fail banks are much larger. And then they've, they've gotten intertwined with the Treasury Department in this very interesting way. And part of it is like regulatory cap, so-called regulatory capture, which is when you have these monopolies and oligopolies, you know, they attach themselves to their regulators, yeah. right? And then, and then you have this sort of revolving door, right, kind of process where kind of people know they have jobs in the future. But there's another side to it, which is if you talk to those bank CEOs, which I do, they'll tell you that the Treasury Department now just like runs the banks. They just like give them orders on how to operate as if they're units of the federal government, and they just tell them what they can and can't do. So, so what you've got is a, structurally what you've got is an oligopoly attached to a regulatory agency yeah. in a sort of an octopus, right? And so like in some sort of death grip, right? Um, and so the good news with that, the good news when that, and by the way, that is our education system, right? That is our healthcare system. That is, you know, that is our transportation system. That's our airline industry. Like the, what so I just is, is the solution: tons of smaller companies that are that that are uh, competing at a at a level playing field. So, the, so the, the opportunity that just jumps off the you know jumps off the page for us, the opportunity is like okay, the, the consequence of an oligopoly attached to the government like that is they're going to stop innovating. Like they're they're just not going to do new things, and they're not going to do new things in part because their regulators don't want them to, and then also just because the culture that gets built inside those companies or evolves inside those companies becomes based on compliance, you know, based on conformity and, and politics, and so the the sort of energy, life, spirit of innovation and creativity kind of drains drains out of those companies, and so on the one hand, you're like, wow, that's a great opportunity. Because like there's all these technology changes, there should be all these new online banks, all these new online banking services. You know, there's this whole fin it's called so-called fintech wave to so start all these new online financial services. And there are lots of startups kind of going after this, and we, we we fund a lot of those. So the good news is there's a big opportunity that opens up to go do all the innovation that that oligopoly can no longer do. The problem is that oligopoly with its associated regulatory apparatus is very strong and good at shutting down new competition, right? Which is why the new bank charters have dropped to zero. Like the, the first thing they did was they just literally said there will be no more no new banks in the U.S. Right, uh, is like a very basic thing. And so they, they have a lot of power uh, to be able to squash this new competition. So, I, I've, so I've, sometimes used, I've sometimes used the metaphor that what we do in Silicon Valley is a little bit like the, the climax of Star Wars, which is like we're running X-Wing fighters up against the Death Star, right? <laughs> right. And, and the X-Wing fighters are the startups, right? And then the Death Star is this mega, mega monolith thing, which is this sort of conjoined government oligopoly kind of thing. Um, and, you know, we know there's an exhaust pipe, right? We, we know there's yeah. a vulnerability, like, we, we, because they're not innovating. So we know that there's a way to kind of go in and fire a torpedo, you know, down their smokestack. But, like, boy, the Death Star actually has pretty good defenses. Yeah. And an awful <laughs> lot of TIE fighters, and, you know, a lot of the X-Wing fighters don't make it through. So, I mean, uh, so. in, the, in the room, you have tons of policy folks, you have tons of uh, uh, press, and I think pretty consistently everybody in the room, you know, wants us to win. It wants our, our families to do well uh, and wants us to, to promote this democratic system. Uh, can policymakers, I mean, is the best contribution to say, hey, let's support these young companies? Or what, what, what's the action item if, you know, in, in, the, in the board meeting uh, sense of the word, what's the action item for folks who, who, who are maybe believe this or agree with some of the premise uh, in terms of changing the direction? Yeah, so again here, you, it, it, the prescription depends on where you fall in the political spectrum. Um, and I, and I want to respect that because people have different points of view. Um, for sure, I would say, I would come back to the distinction I made between pro-business and pro-market, um, is there, there, there's a temptation to speak, you see this all the time, there's a temptation to speak in terms of like the American business sector or like you know, the American economy or the American you know, whatever industry uh, in a certain category. And it's, it's just basically like, okay, you just talk about industry structures. There's monopoly, and we kind of all know monopoly is bad. Um, then there's oligopoly, and that, you know, one is it's like the word's harder to spell. Um, it's harder to pronounce. Um, it's more complicated. It sounds like oligarchy. makes people nervous. Um, uh, but there's oligopoly, which is, which is really what we tend to have. We don't tend to have monopolies. We tend to have oligopolies. An oligopoly is, you know, three or four, two or three or four kind of dominant companies that kind of lock up a market. Like the car industry in the U.S. was an oligopoly for 60 years, right, uh, under GM, Ford, and Chrysler until, you know, we, we finally got, you know, a successful new entrant with Tesla. 
So, so, so that's like the classic thing. And then, and, 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 and so what, what happens is sort of pro-business becomes pro-oligopoly, um, and it sort of yeah. becomes the support of kind of, of kind of these incumbents. Well, it's actually kind of funny, because it's like there's, there's a lot, like in the press or in, the, in, in politics right now, there's a lot of people who are like really mad at, for, for, some, for some reason, I, I won't cop to anything, but for some reason people are really mad at tech startups, they're really mad at venture capital, they're really mad at disruption, they're really mad at innovation. And, and actually it's funny, they're really mad at tech startups and, and at venture capital. What they're doing when they get mad at us and try to restrict what we can do is they're actually defending the entrenched corporate power of these oligopolies, which is, which is weird because these are not, big company CEOs usually don't get a lot of people defending them, <laughs> right? But that, that's somehow kind of where, where, where all this stuff ends up. And so the, the, the alternative to an oligopoly and a pro-business policy in support of the oligopoly in whatever industry you're talking about is an actual free market, right? With actual free market competition where the customers actually have a choice and where the, where the providers of the product or service are, actually have to compete to be able to get the business. Um, and so, you know, being a free market person, I would say, like, you're, you're just, you're almost always going to get better results. Uh, when you open this up. Can I tell you my favorite example of this? Yeah. Favorite example, healthcare. So health, healthcare is like the monster, you know, it's like the oligopoly cubed or something. It's, yeah. you know, healthcare is now, healthcare is now 20% of the American economy, right, on its way to 50%, right? And everybody's just like tremendously furious about this. Everybody just hates this. And then if you look at the price curves on healthcare, like why is it becoming so much the economy? Well, the price curves, you know, the price of everything keeps rising. And there's, you know, been endless studies of, you know, why, do, why does insulin cost $800, not $8? And, you know, why are we having, you know, kind of all, all these issues around, you know, why does heart surgery cost so much? and so forth. Um, well, it's, it's actually interesting. There are a category of surgical procedures that actually are on the complete opposite price curve. Um, they're on the sort of tech price curve where the price of the procedure is falling every year and the quality of the procedure is getting much, much better as the price falls. Um, and the classic example of this other category of procedure is uh, laser eye surgery. Um, and if you, if you look at the price curve on laser eye surgery, it looks like the price curve on like computer chips or on like television sets or something. It's just like, it's just, it gets cheaper all the time. And then, and then the, the a lot, I mean, this is advanced, you know, these laser eye surgery on your eye, they do like real time 3D mapping of your eyeball. So if you flinch during the procedure, which I did, um, you know, it's still like the, the laser tracks, like it's really sophisticated stuff. And yet the price of that procedure is falling. Why is it falling? The reason it's falling is because it's an elective procedure. It's not covered by insurance, right? It's, it's, it's something that consumers choose to buy. And because consumers choose to buy it, right, it's, it's a direct interaction between a willing provider and a willing customer, and then there's actual competition, yeah. right? And so, and again, this is a long, this is a giant complicated topic, and it's not like you can just wave your hand and make everything like that. But like, if you can make like laser eye surgery super cheap and super good, there is going to be a way to do that in the rest of healthcare. It's putting buyers and sellers closer together. Well, that's one of, that's one of the answers. One, you know, one, there's a lot of things that screw up there's a lot of things that make the healthcare market dysfunctional. You know, the, the fact that there's indirect payers, right, is, is a big part of it. The fact that the products or services are very complicated um, is another thing. The fact that people hate the topic because when you're in the hospital about to get heart surgery, you're maybe not at your best <laughs> when it comes to trying to figure out. The you're not looking for a discount. The technical details, right, or, or right, or maybe in a, in a position to do price comparison shopping yeah. uh, at that moment, <laughs> maybe, maybe not the best idea. Um, and so it, it's a complicated thing, but if, it, put it this way, if we don't like the track we're on, right, we, 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 we should look at these cases in which we're actually seeing the, the behavior that we want, and we should figure out how to get inside those industries uh, and make, make things more like that. And we, and we could choose to do that. Generally speaking, we're not choosing to do that. We're choosing to go the other way. We're choosing to entrench the existing systems and the existing dynamics that are kind of driving the outcomes we don't like. And so I would say I'm not optimistic on this point, but we're going to, you know, we, we try. We're, we're trying. My firm has a big healthcare push. We're going to try to do this in more aspects of healthcare. Uh, fantastic. T t today, uh, we're focusing specifically on uh, autonomy and, and defense. Um, what do you believe that uh, other folks would debate quite vigorously uh, with you about? Okay, so here's where I can set hair on fire. I'm excited. This is good. This is one I, uh, this is one I've been looking forward to. So people um, like to debate here. So uh. yeah. So the thing about autonomy that gets everybody right in in, in the national security world kind of the most nervous right is is sort of the the, the decision maker who's making the decision, particularly who's making the decision to fire the weapon. Um, and so and you know there's been this you know big kind of assumption from you know the very beginning of these drone programs and so forth that you know it it, it always has to be human in the loop. Um, it often, by the way, has to not just be a human in the loop, it has to be like a very specific, like, you know, Air Force officer, for example, um, you know, to be able to make these decisions. And I, and I think that, that was obviously the right starting point, and, there, and there's a lot, lot in favor of that. And, and by the way, I think there's a legitimate argument that basically the decision to, to kill somebody um, is so important that maybe it should always be human in the loop. Like, maybe from an ethical standpoint, maybe that's just simply required. So let me say, like, I, I have respect for that point of view. Um, Having said that, here's what I really believe. Uh, what I really believe is humans are terrible decision makers. Like, we are freaking awful um, at making decisions. And this comes up all the time, I'll, I'll take a parallel market, this comes up all the time in self-driving cars, right? The, yeah. whole, the whole dispute around you know, civilian self-driving cars. 
right? Which is it's like, okay, should you know, should the car? You know, and it's actually really funny. People pose these like ethical conundrums, right, when they're talking about self-driving cars, and it's they call these the trolley problems, and it's like, okay, the self-driving car, it's in a situation <laughs> in which like it's either going to hit a car filled with like five grandmas, or like you know one six-year-old, right, and like you know is the car going to make like the morally correct decision of who to kill? And it's like, okay, that's great, but like I just was driving in from, you know, and I'm looking at the past, I'm looking at the drivers in the cars, you know, next to us driving in, and I'm like, you know, one, one guy's on his phone texting, you know, somebody else is drinking a milkshake, somebody else is putting makeup on in the mirror, you know, somebody else is kind of dozing off, you know, getting a little bit drowsy. Like, people are terrible drivers. Yeah. And, and people are terrible drivers, and people are actually getting worse at driving because they've got more distractions, right? Um, and the statistics show it. I mean, how many people die every year? Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and it's actually funny watching the, the car companies, the older car companies, uh, you know, kind of pre-Tesla. The older car companies aren't so good at autonomy, but they've gotten really good at the entertainment systems that go inside the, uh, inside the, 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 the cab. <laughs> And so they've got, you know, you buy a car and it's got like all these amazing videos and it's got internet radio and it's got like all these different, all these different, well, and to give credit to Tesla, Tesla actually has video games on the center <laughs> screen, which is a little bit disconcerting. Um, and so there's like all these things that you can do, but then it's like there's these, there's these things where like if the car's in motion, it locks out certain functions, right? So like the navigation system won't let you punch in an address or whatever. And so I don't know about you, but like, you know, I, I have now explored that system at great length sitting in traffic trying to figure out what it will let me do. Yeah when I'm supposed to be paying attention, yeah. right? And so we're just, we're distracted, we're distracted. We get tired, we get drunk, we get high, we get, we get, we get distracted. We get important text messages. So what if I'm going 70 miles an hour? Like I have to answer this text message. Um, and so it's just quite clear that the car, right? And, and what, is the, what does the car have the human doesn't? Well, one is it doesn't have any of that, right? But also it has comprehensive knowledge of what's going on around it. Like it sees a lot more, right? Because among other things, the computer sees 360 degrees all the time, whereas no human being does. Um, and then the car is processing all this data, you know, at, at, at an incredibly fast and ferocious rate, and then it, it's just able to be kind of very crisp and methodical about how it makes these decisions. And so I, th I, th I think that's the underlying truth for autonomous weapons, which is we are going to have serious, we are probably forever going to have serious ethical concerns with turning over the decisions to the, to the, to the algorithms. On the other hand, I, it, it will prove, I think, in the fullness of time that the machines make much better decisions. Uh, and, and in the fullness of time, we will look back on having put, uh, there will come a time, I don't know how fast it happens, there will come a time we will look back at the idea that we put a gun in a human being's hand and then put them in a situation where their adrenaline spiked off the charts. Who's very young and maybe not fully trained. And scared out of his mind, yeah. right? And, and, and put it, and, and, and literally just, adre just adrenaline, like just the impact of adrenaline in the decision making, right? It can just like really screw you up, right? Um, and so that we put somebody in that situation and expected them to make that decision, right? Or the same thing in a cockpit or the same thing in a submarine. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'll look back and say, uh, you know, were we out of our minds? How, how did we ever let, you know, basically our, you know, yeah. <laughs> animal evolved brains ever make that decision? Uh, it will take us a long time to get there, but, uh, you know, in, in the long run, I, I think there's no question. The logic tells you that's what will happen. Yeah. Now, whether we'll get all the way there and whether that's the ethical thing, I think that's the big debate. Um, uh, changing gears a little bit about uh, just kind of Silicon Valley and, and, and the government and the defense uh, universe. Um, one of the things that I, I feel like I've, I've uh, noticed living in Silicon Valley is uh, we live in a pretty violent world globally. But if you live in Mountain View, you live in a pretty great life, and you, you, you're kind of under this blanket of security. And one of the downstream impacts is people don't realize that. And you start living in this bubble. And so sometimes when dis discussions about Silicon Valley and defense come up, they're, they're weirdly emotional. Um, and uh, so how do you, uh, number one, not live in that bubble? Um, you know, if you've, you're, you're born in a healthy family and, uh, that, 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 has, that, has, uh, that has means to realize that the world is beyond you. And, and maybe even a bigger question, it's happening kind of in, in society where you have these bubbles of ideas. So how do you get out of your own bubble uh, to, to experience, you know, perhaps uh, someone else's viewpoints to, to make more informed decisions? Yeah, and so maybe everybody knows what, what Kessler's referring to is in particular is like there was this basically movement in the Valley probably starting 15 years. So it's interesting, actually. The, the Valley got, the, a lot of the origins of the Valley actually are, are in work with the military, right? Yeah. So and a classic example is or, or Oracle, the, the company Oracle, is named after the CIA project, CIA yeah. project codename Oracle in the 1970s that Larry Ellison worked on as a consultant and then tur turned it ultimately into, into a product and a company. Um, and so, you know, the deep origins of Silicon Valley have a lot to do with military and, and intelligence work, actually going back to like the 1920s. Um, and so there, there's a long tra tradition. And then actually, uh, you know, I'm, I'm now old enough where I've, I've got, I've seen multiple eras. And, and actually in the 90s, that spirit was actually still somewhat alive. And in fact, my company, Netscape, in the, in the 90s actually worked, had a lot of actual work with the federal government and with defense and intelligence agencies. Um, we did, among other things, we did the first public key encryption infrastructure for DOD in the, in the 90s. So we were, we were pretty tight in. 
So, so we, we kind of always took it for granted. Um, starting about 20 years ago, there was like a culture, it's kind of post the dot-com crash, there was this culture shift that sort of developed where, yeah, there was like this growing level of abstraction and there were more and more people and companies and founders and, and investors who basically said, we don't want our companies involved in anything even remotely close to defense or intelligence. And it was, it, it was this weird thing, which is it was sort of like a cultural, social, almost like, I don't know, a Vietnam War, Vietnam War hangover maybe a little bit, but then also like when the Iraq War didn't go well and there weren't WMD, I think that also made it easier to kind of say, you know, yeah. the military is a bad idea. Um, and so, and then the Snowden stuff like made it worse again, and this like, I don't know whether we should work with intelligence agencies. And I think you have this uh, situation where commercial starts leading, like the most yeah. advanced tech ends up now being in the commercial space, whereas you could look up, and if you're in the 60s and 70s, you're kind of wowed by what the, what the DOD is doing. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's actually a big inversion. It actually used to, the way technology used to flow actually was it started in the government, particularly in defense and intelligence, and then it worked its way into companies after that. And then after that, it went to consumers, right? And then, right, about 20, 25 years ago, that flipped, and then new technology started to hit consumers first, then companies, and then, and then government, which is, you know, a big problem out, out here. Um, and so, so that really happened. And then, of course, you know, another weird thing happened, right, which has been well covered, but which is important, which was a lot of the same companies that didn't want to work with the U.S. government ended up working with the Chinese government, um, yeah. right? And, 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 or, or, and either, like, explicitly cutting deals with the Chinese government to be able to operate in China, um, or indirectly working with the Chinese government by having, let's just say, research partnerships was the term that was often used. Um, you know, so you have an AI lab in Beijing, and it is associated with a, you know, company that is, you know, uh, you know 30% staffed by CCP members, and all companies in China are under yeah. control by the party, <laughs> and the party, you know, has total authority, and by the way, the military, you know, co cooperation with the military is mandatory, yeah. right? And before you know it, you're in business with the Chinese military, and you're not in business with the American military. And so, so that developed, it's very much a bubble phenomenon. I, I think it's very much a bubble phenomenon. On. It's, it's very much, by, by bubble, I mean it's very much a, it's the kind of attitude that you can have if you think that you are completely safe in the world and that there's never going to be any more threats, which is certainly not what I believe. Now, this Russia-Ukraine thing is interesting because the same people who were the most opposed to working with the U.S. military before Russia-Ukraine are now, they all have Ukraine flag emojis <laughs> on their Twitter profiles. And so there's... They, By Ukraine flags, they are they uh, they're hate, going up to the they right. They hate... There are so many people in California who will hang Ukraine flags outside their house and not American flags. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the craziest thing. Um, they just, they hate Putin so much. Um, and so there's a little bit of a swing here. There's a little bit of a, of a swing here. But, but by and large, what's happened is you, you ended up in this, in this sort of culture that got two, two kind of sideways on this. But then that opened up an opportunity, right? And then, and then that's the opportunity that, that you guys are in. That's the opportunity that we're going after with our, with our programs. It's the opportunity that, you know, Andrew is another famous example, you know, kind of going after this, which is like, okay, like, you know, if Google's not going to do this kind of thing, then let's start new companies that are going to do it, right? It's, 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 it's the opportunity that opens up. It's the, it's the exhaust port and the Death Star uh, that, that opens up. Um, and so there, there, is, there, there, there are no opportunities emerging that are coming out the other side. There are people like us and like, like me that think about this very differently. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that's just really happened, I think, is that the divergence, the divergence between what technology has now made possible uh, for defense and intelligence um, and what they're getting from their traditional suppliers has just never been, I don't think it's ever been wider. Yeah. Like, just, you, 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 there, there are so many things now that are possible with all these new technologies, um, and, you, you know, you, you see a lot of it, a lot of the discussion here. Um, and they're, they're just, they're just not going to get provided by the established vendors. Like it's just like that ship has sailed. Those companies don't do things like this anymore. Um, and so the, the actual substantive opportunity, need, requirement, challenge, right, is really opening up. And, and actually, the gov you know, the government is sort of famously a difficult customer in this era. But you know, they are starting to. The government is starting to unlock, you know, serious buying power here, and starting to really vote with their dollars. Um, and so that's causing, I think, more entrepreneurs to get pretty excited. So uh, let's uh, shift gears uh, 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 once again. Um, talk a little bit about the markets uh, and, and, and kind of a little away from the DC ecosystem. Um, Buffett has this very famous line that, uh, you know, when, when, when people are greedy, be fearful, and when people are fearful, be greedy. And there's a lot of fear in the markets right now. There's a lot of volatility in the markets right now. Um, number one, what, you know, what's your view on the public markets? Uh, I, I know you guys are a venture capital fund, but would love to hear that. And then what's the downstream impact to you know, this very important part of our economy, which is creating wealth and creating new companies, which is like, you know, seed stage startups of two to three people in, in a handful of geographies in, in the U.S.? Yeah, so this has been a weird three years. I don't know if people have noticed. This has been an unusual time. Um, but um, I, I would kind of put in that context, which is, Rewind back to December of 2019, which was not that long ago. Um, December 2019, the U.S. economy was the best economy in America in 70 years. 
on basically any metric that you could pick. And like what, one of the metrics that you look at for the health economy is actually interesting. It's employment rate among um, teenage males without a high school diploma. Um, and and that tradition, this is sort of the hardest part of the workforce ultimately when you kind of get all the way through it. Like that, that's the group that always has the highest unemployment. Um, and it's the hard, hardest group to get to. Um, and that metric was the best in 70 years in December 2019. So like the, the, the economy was going like really well. And in fact, actually it's interesting, right? We had very low inflation, very low interest rates. And actually we had, you know, there was a complaint for a long time we didn't have wage growth, but wage growth was starting to, you know, to tick up and, and things were going really well. And then obviously COVID happened. Um, and then of course, you may recall COVID, there was this weird thing, which is we all immediately knew that COVID was the end of the world. In addition to being a huge public health problem, it was also the end of the world economically. The stock market crashed. It resulted literally in, you know, people screaming and crying on CNBC, which by the way, is always a really good indicator. Um, <laughs> at least that something is going on when there's like, when there's, when there's, when there's yelling and cry tears. per hour ratio. Cry, the cries per hour, cries per hour is a good, uh, you have to correct for the increased rate of crying in the entire society, but you, when you when you distill that down, you can you can you measure that as a, an indicator. So um, you know people get you know the, the stock market collapsed. It looked like the end of the economic world, and then this just incredibly bizarre thing happened, which is the stock market did a, a V shape, right, and it just went to the moon, right, and there was just this like incredible rush of enthusiasm. Uh, for owning stocks like straight into the face of a pandemic, which I was just like completely, I was just like stunned and amazed. Um, it was just like, I, and it was actually really funny. It was actually not funny. It was, it was not, as they say, it wasn't funny, haha. Um, <laughs> it was funny kind of as if I was going to start crying. Um, we thought coming out, of, we caught coming into COVID, we thought we might lose an entire generation of startups, right? Because we thought business might just freeze across the board and it might be impossible for companies to raise money. Um, and then all of a sudden, it's just like stock prices take off and all of a sudden Silicon Valley just goes into this like hyper boom. It was, and it just got incredibly easy to raise money, and, and people were so thrilled to be able to like invest money in things. There was a whole retail frenzy. Um, you know, VC. A funny thing happened in venture venture land in our world, investor land, which is, you know, in a given you know given venture capitalist or public investor or whatever, you know, they normally work like an eight hour day and whatever. They do meetings with 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 management teams and they come through, and then everybody goes on Zoom and it's like, well, you know, I can't go out, I can't visit my family, right? I can't like visit my sick relatives in the hospital. Yeah, I might as well just take more meetings over video. <laughs> and so people started like taking 12 hours a day of video meetings. And then of course there's no travel time. So that's the equivalent of like 16 hours of real life meetings. And so it, all of a sudden there was just this like huge surge of uh, business activity and everybody got And super did you see that in seeds, the series A, uh, all we, the way up? We saw it at every stage. And then by the way, the other thing we saw was like a lot of tech related things took off. Like, uh, so e-commerce like took off like a banshee. Like e-commerce accelerated dramatically, you know, online streaming, online gaming, online education, you know, um, a, just like a huge online grocery delivery delivery, you know, food delivery, like a lot of internet-based services, just like, you know, the, the, the actual businesses took off, and, which of course compounded, got everybody super excited. Um, and so the, the weirdest thing, it's like maybe the weirdest thing I've ever seen, which is like the, in the, the pandemic was fantastic, which is just like not, <laughs> <Yeah>. not <laughs> supposed to happen. And so of course, you know, now that I've seen something that weird, now I'm seeing the equivalently weird thing, which is now that we're coming out of the pandemic, it's horrible, right? And everything's, yeah. everything, everybody's in a terrible mood. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a, I would say it's a weird reaction. It's not the reaction I would have expected uh, coming out of the pandemic with things returning to normal. Um, I think there's two possibilities for what's happening right now. Um, you know, one possibility is that basically all of the headlines are right. Um, and basically what the headlines tell you is it's the end of the world. It's inflation. It's hyperinflation. Like we're back to the 1970s. Uh, we've kicked off a process of inflation. All the money printing that the government's been doing for the last, you know, 20 years is, is going to finally, you know, bite us. Um, interest rates are going to the moon, um, you know. Going to the moon as in 18.5% uh, uh, that we had in the late 70s or going to the moon, like, you know, much more rationally? So I just reread because I, I remember as, I remember I remember inflation as a little kid, but like it's it's been 40 years of falling inflation and falling interest rates, and so I just went back and I read. There's two books on Paul Volcker, uh, one that he wrote and a, a biography that kind of go through the sort of the whole thing because you know he's the guy who cracked inflation and interest rates 40 years ago when it was a big crisis, and it it was really interesting. The big the big thing in the books was like, and, and this is the big danger, and this this is and this scenario may be, may be playing out. The big danger is once an inflationary spiral starts, like it's hard to it's hard to stop because it because inflation changes psychology. Right, and if and if people think that money is becoming less valuable, they start to behave in really different ways as if as compared to when they think that money's flat. And then the fact that they behave in those ways causes inflation to to, to rise even faster. And so there there's this, and you know, and when it goes really bad, you get you know Germany in the 1920s or something with hyperinflation, right, which is which is really bad. Um, and and this is why the central banks are always focused on containing inflation because like things can really run away when, when that happens. And then you know, and then interest rates have to chase inflation all the way up because money's getting less valuable. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it's yeah, 15, 20 percent mortgage rates. Nobody can buy a house and and then you know you get the 1970s all over again. So, 
So it's possible that that's what's happening, you know, and it's possible that there's going to be a big recession and a big crash in consumer demand and all these tech companies that were, you know, were selling all these goods and services, all of a sudden nobody wants to buy their stuff. And so, you know, e-commerce is way down and Netflix is in trouble and like all these, all these things have reversed. You know, Zoom stock has crashed. Um, Peloton, Peloton's down to is it, uh, three months, of, so they're down to three quarters of cash. Um, so, you know, even, and they were like, you know, the superstar of the, uh, we're not involved in Peloton, they were the superstar of the, uh, pandemic and now they're, you know, they were worth like $50 billion and now they, you know, just say they have to raise money. Um, and so like, it's possible that this is gonna be a really bad, you know, kind of event. It's also possible this is kind of the mirror image of what happened entering the pandemic and, and, and there the possibility is just, it's, this, is, this is a temporary phenomenon. This is a temporary phenomenon caused by mismatches of supply and demand in the economy. Um, and in particular, the, 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 the stuff that's happening in China right now, right? So if, if, if China shuts down, if China has shut down production of lots of parts, right, for things because of their own COVID policies, then a lot of American manufacturers can't make things because everybody relies on parts from overseas. Um, and then all of a sudden, it sort of looks like the economy is like artificially depressed. It, lo it looks like you have too much, right, one of the ways to describe inflation is too much demand chasing too few goods, right? And, so, and you see this with cars, right? If you go buy, try to buy a car off the lot, like they'll charge you a premium for it today, which is not like a normal thing that happens in the car industry. It's because they just can't make enough cars. Um, and so it's possible there's this short-term issue of kind of getting supply and demand back into alignment in the economy, and then basically once that's, ha once that's happened, we will rediscover that we actually still have the best economy in 70 years. We just went through this weird kind of COVID moment. That said, I have no idea which way this goes. Um, uh, if there's a continuing pullback, um, how, how do you, you know, what's the partner meeting inside of A16Z, and uh, what's the, uh, you know, the guidance to companies like us? Yeah, so the, the sort of mainstream activity in the Valley, like the, the main thing that happens that sort of determines whether, well, there's two things that determine whether a startup happens or not. One is whether there's a founder that wants to, is qualified and wants to actually build a company. Um, and then the other is sort of the, it's, this, it's really the Series A round, right? There's this early seed financing, but it's really like the Series A round is like where basically a company is like anointed and, and basically is like green lit for lots of people to come to work for it and for, um, you know, for be able to raise more money, more money down the road. Um, and, and then basically the, the math is when you make a Series A investment as a venture firm, you basically assume it's going to be a seven to ten year period before that company eventually either goes public or gets bought, right? So you've kind of got this, you sort of light a seven to ten year fuse for the companies that work. And so one, one argument should be whatever's happening in the public market today shouldn't matter at all for startups yep. and for Series A rounds because who knows what the market's going to be doing in seven to ten years. Whatever's happening now will be long gone. There will be some other set of crazy things that are happening. Um, and, and we can't forecast what's going to happen seven to ten years from now, and so we should just ignore what's happening today. It has no, has no bearing on anything. That's a good argument. Um, the other argument is, well, the thing is, the Series A companies, they're going to need to raise more money. Um, and they're, need to, they're going to need to go back out in 18, 24 months to raise a Series B. Um, are those investors going to be willing to invest? Well, the problem those investors have when they do a Series B is that that company is going to need to go raise money a Series C in 18 to 24 months. Well, those investors will invest, and, and then you kind of spin that forward all the way to the public markets, and then it basically, and that's why the public markets basically have this big impact earlier on, because you, you basically get worried. Yes, I can fund the company today, but it will die because the because of this kind of chain of events that are that are unfolding. It won't be able to raise more money, and it, it won't be able to succeed. Um, and so, so that's how these changes in these public markets kind of ricochet all the way back to the early stage. Um, that's definitely happening right now. Um, whether that continues to happen is a question of what happens in the You're public market. You're seeing prices fall in the A market and, and, and seed or no? So right now, so my, my favorite, right now, so my favorite cartoon when I was a kid was the uh, Wiley e. Coyote and the Roadrunner, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and the, the Roadrunner's chasing the Coyote and the Coyote goes off the edge of the cliff, right? And he hangs there in midair, right? And he holds up the <laughs> sign and he says, oops. Yeah. Right, and then he falls, right? But there's that moment where he's like hanging yeah. in midair. Um, and we're kind, of, we're kind of in that moment a little bit where basically, because it's like, look, if this, if this is what happened in the spring of 2020 and the market is just in this weird downward thing right now, but it's gonna come roaring back as sort of normality yeah. resumes, then this would be a terrible time to stop investing. On the other hand, if this is a sustained economic downturn and a sustained stock market crash, then it would be a bad idea to get too, too enthusiastic about investing. Because, by the way, if it's a sustained downturn, we need to husband cash to be able to support the existing yeah. companies and, and help keep them, keep them in business. Um, and so actually what's happening right now is rounds are either getting done at the old prices or they're not getting done at all. Yeah, very bimodal. 
Right, bimodal. And so that's, that's Wile E. Coyote kind of hanging, hanging in the air. And then basically the next six or nine months will sort of determine which way this goes. And, you yeah. know, look, we like to, look, I like to get up here and give speeches on how great venture capital is and all that. I will tell you, like, we are a small little gnat on yeah. the fringe. I mean, we're tiny. Like, There's probably some sub-debt market, which is bigger than that. Yeah, we're <laughs> tiny. Yeah, exactly. That Right, you're, you know, whatever. Yeah, the third slice of whatever mortgage tranching on your house is bigger <laughs> than we are. Like, it, we are a tiny little adjunct to the yeah. financial markets. Um, we, we, are, we are part of this much, much broader, you know, kind of, kind of phenomenon. I mean, Venture capital, the, the, the S&P 500, 500 biggest companies in the U.S. Uh, return in the form of buybacks and dividends more than a trillion dollars a year uh, wow. to their shareholders. Um, all of venture capital is like $50 billion a year, right? And so all of a sudden, $50 billion is like a big number, absolutely, but like it's a 20th of just the money coming out of the incumbents right, yeah. who, who aren't innovating because um, that's how they give all the cash back. They don't do new things. Um, <laughs> and so we're just, unfortunately, we're small, and, we, and this is where we're, we're, we're the tail, not the dog, yeah. maybe to yeah. use the metaphor. Like we're not actually in charge of this, and so we, we do have to let a little time pass here to kind of see, kind of see how, yeah. how, how things change. So uh, last question. We covered a lot today uh, from, you know, from the markets to, uh, to, to defense. Uh, we're, but all the topics are really around America, right? And so if America is a security, it's a stock, Series A comes to your desk, uh, are you buy, sell, hold, uh, uh, and why and why not? Yeah. So in my bad moods, um, <laughs> in my bad moods, what I say is uh, we're the best house in a bad neighborhood, um, which is if you don't like our problems, uh, don't go anywhere else. Yeah because everywhere else is worse. Um, and I probably should not give my big speech about how everybody else is worse, because that'll piss everybody off. But um, everybody, else has, everybody else has problems. Um, and, and by the way, China, I mean, God knows China. Actually, this is actually interesting. China, China has problems. A couple years ago, it was actually hard to find like American business people who would admit that China has problems. All of yeah. a sudden, they're all, all the China boosters in the US are very, very quiet. They're not <laughs> saying much. They're not volunteering a lot at the dinner parties, because uh, you know China's got this like just incredible lockdown happening right now, like way beyond anything that we, that that we did, um, and so um, like we have our issues, but like we, we have a, like a, just a tremendous portfolio of strengths, um, uh, you know, kind of even against that. And so I, you know, and this is always the question. Like the, the question is, would you would you trade would you trade places, right? Would, yeah. you, you know, if you were the, if you were the, if you're in charge of the U.S., would you trade places with China or with Sweden or with Singapore or with you know take your pick of India or any country, Germany, whatever? And I, I just I just think the answer to that is pretty clearly no. Um, you know, every every election cycle, there are some set of celebrities that declare loudly that they're going to leave the U.S. <laughs> right? And I guess still waiting. Some of them go to I don't know, maybe Canada or something, but like they don't they don't tend to venture out very far. Um, so so best house in a bad neighborhood. In in my in my optimistic moments, um, which which is most most of the time. I mean, it's just that there's no there's no Reagan line I always liked, which is there's nothing wrong with America that can't be fixed by what's right with America. Um, and so there's just so much latent capability. The people, you know, are, are, the, the, our people are so smart and so strong. I mean, look, we're, we're the result of 250 years of positive selection of immigration, right? We're like the, the most aggressive, smartest, most capable, most determined immigrants, right? Got, got from where they, and they came here, right? And so we are a, we are a ferocious, we don't think of ourselves this way, but like we are a ferocious, like uh, um, uh, a beast when it comes to being like a very competent people. Um, and, uh, and very tough and very strong and very resilient. Uh, it sometimes takes us a while. Um, you know, it's the old, what is it, the old Churchill thing. America always does the right thing after it's exhausted all the alternatives, <laughs> right? So, like, it, it takes us a while to rise to the occasion, but, like, we, we, we do tend to come roaring back, and it's just that the, the inherent strengths are, are so powerful. And then there's all the other kind of more tangible things, you know, which is, like, we have, tr you know, our territory is, like, very easy to defend. You know, it's very hard to invade, very much unlike a lot of others. Um, you know, our natural resources are off the charts. We have the, here's a, here's a, here's a build thing. Uh, we have the ability to be fully energy independent anytime we want to, yeah. right? China doesn't have that, right? They, they actually can't do that. We, we can do that. Um, they don't have the resources. We do have the resources. Now, <laughs> we are choosing not to, um, but we could. Um, and so we, we have all the raw materials, both literally and figuratively, that we need to be, you know, by far not just the best country in the world, but the best country the planet's ever seen. And, and, and so from there, it, it just gets to a matter of choice, you know, which is do we, do we want to be? That sounds like a strong buy. Yes. <laughs> Thank yes. you so much. Fascinating conversation. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Hello. So I guess the only appropriate way to end that is saying that it is time to build. Thank you, Mark and Kasser, for diving into American dynamism, the relationship between the Valley and the government, and the broader markets. Finally, for our last segment, please welcome to the stage Congressman James Langevin, 
who will share his perspective in a conversation with Nicholas Kazvini Gore, the Director of Federal Affairs at Applied Intuition. Good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, my name is Nick Kazvini Gore, and I serve as uh, Director of Federal Affairs at Applied Intuition. It is my great honor and pleasure to moderate this congressional keynote with uh, Congressman Jim Langevin. I realize that we've reached the last session, but um, this is really an exciting uh, panel with a truly distinguished uh, leader in the national security space. So I'm grateful for, uh, for, for you all. Um, uh, before I begin, I'd like to, uh, we'll have 10 to 15 minutes of moderated discussion following with the audience Q&A. So I really encourage you all to uh, submit your questions uh, in, into the portal. Uh, Congressman Langevin has a long and distinguished career, which I'll summarize briefly. He is a senior member of the House Armed Services Committee and chairs the Cyber, Innovative Technologies, and Information Systems Subcommittee. He also chairs and was the co-founder of the uh, Congressional Cyber Caucus. He's also authored dozens of pieces of legislation to enhance our national security through robust innovation, including the recent National Cyber Director Act. Congressman Langevin, thank you so much for joining. Over to you for your opening remarks. Nicholas, thank you very much. And, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it really is uh, great to be here with you, uh, uh, albeit virtually. And uh, let me just say how disappointed I couldn't be there in person because I'd obviously much rather be with everyone there in person. But I'm in Rhode Island uh, uh, this week right now uh, because of COVID protocols. So, uh, but, but I do want to just begin by thanking both the Atlantic Council and uh, Applied uh, uh, institution, uh, uh, intuition rather, for, uh, for hosting uh, the Nexus 22 Symposium. Uh, I'll start off by saying uh, you are, are both shining a light uh, on the need for, for greater innovation at the Department of Defense, and I'm always excited uh, to speak alongside other bipartisan uh, leading voices who uh, have, have worked uh, so hard uh, to encourage innovation across the, the DOD. We, we need it uh, so robustly right now. So I've, uh, I, I've begun by saying I, I dedicated my career uh, pioneering adoption of cutting edge technology within the, the department. Uh, and uh, as the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, uh, subcommittee on cyber innovative technologies and information systems, uh, I know that uh, this work will continue long after my departure from Congress uh, at the end of this term, after 22 years, I should, I should mention. Uh, so it's been both uh, the honor of a lifetime to serve uh, in U.S. House of Representatives, and I'm uh, really encouraged by the, the Department of Defense's efforts uh, in this space uh, thus far. I'll say that uh, organizations like DIU uh, and AFWorks and uh, the uh, Silicon Valley uh, Defense Group uh, and, and DARPA have made incredible strides when it comes to pushing the envelope and developing groundbreaking technologies uh, to support future generations of U.S. warfighters. It's also important to recognize the, the critical role, of course, of the private sector in the development of emerging technologies in support of national defense and their significant contributions. Many private sector partners uh, to DOD are small companies that are moving fast and transforming quickly, and uh, that agility is just so important, and we need to harness it, take advantage of it, and uh, just by way of example, I was out in uh, Silicon Valley just a couple of weeks ago and was incredibly impressed by the small companies that I visited and the progress that they are making. Uh, just by way of example, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing private sector entities uh, developing game-changing uh, uh, solutions uh, for applications of things like artificial intelligence uh, to our national security. So here, I believe that we must absolutely support and leverage these innovations because uh, whichever nation uh, achieves primacy in the development and deployment of AI uh, and quantum will enjoy almost insurmountable advantages over other nations. And that's why I work to establish the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, uh, review their recommendations and champion provisions in must pass legislation uh, like the annual National Defense Authorization Act. Much like AI, Autonomous vehicles are a critical emerging technology that have the potential to revolutionize the battlefield 
beneath the waves, on the ground, and in the air, keeping our warfighters at a greater physical distance from the fight while delivering results. So these are just a handful of the types of technologies that we should be focusing on. And I am certainly proud to have played uh, a, a role in, in, in these efforts and bringing them to maturity. I'm also proud of the contributions that I've been able to make in the field, in the field of cyber, because I believe the, the investments in our national cybersecurity and critical infrastructure resilience go hand in hand with our efforts to develop and to deploy emerging technologies. Simply put, the cyber threats facing our country have never uh, been greater and uh, American technological leadership uh, will depend significantly on our ability to defend, to defend against those threats and recover quickly from uh, disruptions to critical infrastructure. To that, uh, to that effect, one of my uh, proudest accomplishments, as Nicholas mentioned, was authoring legislation to create the Office of the National Cyber Director uh, within the Executive Office uh, of the President. Uh, within the White House. Of course, th there's still a lot of work to be done on many levels in cyber, but uh, we're going to continue that, uh, that effort, I promise. I've said before that uh, it, science fiction is fast becoming fact and reality. And to stay ahead of our adversaries, we must innovate faster, streamline uh, our acquisition pro uh, processes and policies, and encourage a culture a change within the, the federal government. I believe was push the limits of innovation uh, and we can't be afraid to fail. Uh, I like the whole, the, the Elon Musk philosophy that uh, if we're not failing, we're not trying hard enough. Well, leaders from Capitol Hill to the upper echelons of the Pentagon absolutely must embrace this mindset and set the tone for the rest of the department. By changing the culture of the Pentagon and our acquisition processes, we can scratch, uh, we can stretch beyond uh, research development, a test and evaluation, and transition to the most promising technologies across the valley of death so that frequently that so frequently plagues our efforts. So here, uh, we, we harness the innovation already happening in the private sector. We must cultivate the digital workforce and educate more senior leaders on the benefits of, of autonomy and we must fast track critical technologies to get them into the hands of the warfighters where they are needed the most. Here, we cannot sit on our laurels. We know our adversaries certainly are not. And uh, I'm worried that here we're actually uh, losing ground to countries like China on emerging te technologies like artificial intelligence by way of example. So uh, as we've seen uh, over the last several months, uh, also Russia is unafraid to put their advanced technologies like hypersonics uh, into use in the battlefield. It's critical now more than ever that we make the necessary investments to maintain the technological edge over our adversary and prepare for the economic and national security challenges of both today and tomorrow. So with that, let me just say thank you again for having me today and thank you for the critical work that you are all doing in this space. Uh, I also hope that uh, you'll view my office as a, as a resource going forward on these issues. While this may be my final year in Congress, I certainly will be working to my very last day uh, to support this community. So with that, thank you. And uh, certainly look forward to our uh, discussion and to your questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Chairman Landrevin, for your robust remarks. The perfect capstone to a, a day with many voices. I want to pick up on one theme you mentioned, that we have a lot of bipartisan voices here. And uh, certainly your, your career has really been distinguished by your ability to work across the aisle to advance so many national security issues. So on one hand, you have um, issues like Ukraine, which have brought together a lot of Republicans and Democrats, Democrats together uh, to counter Russian aggression. But then on the other hand, you have issues like the January 6th event, where there's increased polarization. So the question I have is, how, how do you recommend up, up and coming members of Congress to maintain that bipartisanship focused on, on um, all these issues, because without bipartisanship, we can't implement any of the recommendations that we have, have discussed today. Yeah, great question. I'll start off by saying that, look, we need bipartisanship for the big things to happen, right? It's really the way we collectively solve our nation's challenges, and we really do need to come together now more than ever. It's one of the reasons why I love my national security work, uh, because if you're ever going to find bipartisanship, 
it's going to come in the national security space. And on balance, that's mostly what I what I see and what I experience on the, on the House Armed Services Committee. It doesn't mean we're not going to have disagreements uh, from time to time on, uh, on specific areas, but overall, I really do believe that my colleagues uh, on both sides of the aisle are really dedicated to doing all we can to protect our nation, uh, defend us on the many against the many threats that we face. Uh, that we we come together in a bipartisan way to to support our war fighters, our men and women in uniform who are in the field, putting themselves in harm's way to protect all of us and. We want to do everything we can in our power, as I've so often said, to make sure that our warfighters never enter a fair fight. We want to make sure that we're giving them absolutely every advantage. And so that is my goal, and that's how I operate uh, on the committee, and, uh, whether it's armed services, whether it's Homeland Security uh, Committee, where I also serve, or uh, in the issue of, of, of cyber. Again, I won't see, you know, there's, there's certainly going to be, you know, areas of, some areas of disagreement, but overall, I think there's more agreement when it comes to national security than there is division. That's great. And I, um, to build on that point, um, you know, a lot of these issues that we're talking about reform around acquisition, uh, talent, you know, workforce development issues where you've also been a leader, these don't often make the headlines, right? Um, often, you know, folks making outlandish statements uh, or people appealing to the, the both sides of the aisle or the, uh, the fringes of, of the spectrum are getting all the press attention. Do you think it's possible that we can uh, work to tackle these um, these difficult challenges, uh, even though they may not make the headlines every day. Sure, I do. You know, and you know, having dialogue is always important. Uh, again, whether it's events like this, whether it's uh, you know, working groups within Congress, uh, you know, these types of uh, discussions are are really important to have. So, you know, I believe in the you know in the politics is still the art of the possible and. You know, we need to get back to those those core principles. Great. I, I want to dig. You also mentioned in your opening remarks your recent trip to Silicon Valley, and given that the 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 theme of this conference is linking the divide and serving as the nexus between innovation and the national security enterprise, I'd love to learn. You know, what what were some of your lessons learned from your trip, um, and do you think that it's possible to bridge this east-west divide? Sure it is, and that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about uh, organizations like DIU, uh, AFWorks, and as I mentioned, also the uh, the Silicon Valley Defense Group that are working with small, innovative companies and trying to help them cut through uh, government red tape, government red tape within the acquisition processes at the at the Pentagon, and make sure that we're helping them to get across the uh, the uh, the valley of death. So there's still more work to be done there, and we need both resources and time and effort to be to be laser focused on supporting uh, these small, innovative companies. But you know, I'm so impressed uh, when you look at uh, the work that's being done in artificial intelligence or quantum um, uh, things like developing uh, unmanned aerial systems, uh, uh, VTOL uh, technologies. Uh, these are these are exciting, cutting edge uh, companies that are producing. Amazing products, and we want to make sure that uh, we're we're helping them to get over this this valley of death, and uh, that's going to be a continued ongoing focus for both me and for the committee. Well, one of the things you mentioned is that, you know the innovation happening in Silicon Valley, and what's interesting is in Ukraine now you see the war fighters that we've trained. I know you serve as a member of the Ukraine Caucus in Congress, are actually innovating on the battlefield now. So some observers will say that. The war in Ukraine right now is like a 20th century uh, war, right? Where you've got, um, you know, you've got uh, javelins blowing up Russian tanks, and this is some. These are technologies that you know have been uh, around for many years. On the other hand, you see the Ukrainian forces using drones very innovatively uh, and asymmetrically to counter, uh, you know, the invasion on their territory. So how do you, how do you as, a, as a leader on innovation in, in the Congress, uh, what lessons do you take from the war in Ukraine uh, that we, at our national security enterprise, can also take as well? Sure. Well, I'm excited to see how the Ukrainians have adapted. Uh, they're certainly making the most of the, the weapons that we're able to put uh, in their hands, uh, everything from stingers to javelins to 
these uh, these drones that are also themselves a uh, a weapon that uh, can be used to target Russian uh, uh, mechanized units and equipment, and uh, it, they've been they've been highly effective. Most, of course, especially is the the resilience and the tenacity of uh, uh, and the commitment of the Ukrainian people to fight for their own country. Uh, you know, unlike we saw in in Afghanistan, uh, that uh, the, uh, the Ukrainians have really stepped up and they are uh, confronting the Russians head on. And we uh, in the United States and our European partners are standing behind them. President Biden and, and uh, his administration are doing everything they can to get them uh, the, the tools and resources so that they can defend their, their own country. But I've been incredibly impressed with how the Ukrainians have uh, have adapted and they're using innovative technologies like drones, uh, both for ISR and, and also for, for targeting Russian forces. And we need to continue to support them in their effort. Thank you. And we'll really miss your leadership. You mentioned your, your retirement. Of course, we wish you, you well in your, into your retirement. I'm curious, you know, you've been in the, in the industry for so, or not the industry, the, uh, the field uh, for so long. And what what inf unfinished projects, you know, if you're in Congress another 10 years, like what, what are, you know, what are the unfinished projects that we as a community should carry on um, to, you know, to ensure that our national security has all the innovation that, that it needs? Sure. Well, continued focus on, on the areas that I've already been very highly involved with um, in Congress. I want to continue to encourage my colleagues and both uh, in Congress, but also people outside of government and, and key uh, technology companies uh, to continue to focus on things like cybersecurity, on artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, quantum computing, uh, electronic warfare, another area that is uh, important both on the offensive and the uh, defensive side. Uh, you know, I've been working on these issues for uh, a very long time, and uh, I, I do so because they're they're critically important to our country and to the warfighter, uh, and cannot, Congress cannot let them fall by the, uh, the wayside uh, in the future. And so I'm hoping that, uh, that other colleagues and uh, new members of Congress and current members of Congress will take these issues up and uh, continue the, the, the passionate fight to see that they grow to maturity. One of the other themes I'd love to pick up and, on and certainly, is... Surely private sector has a big role. Yeah, definitely. And I think one of the other themes I'd like to pick on is pick up on is, um, you know, the United States, our ability to deter our adversaries like Russia and China is our ability to field and, and accelerate the deployment of innovative technologies, right? Um, but on the other hand, we're a democratic power, right? And the Congress has um, a really important role to provide checks and balances over the Department of Defense to make sure that there's ethics in AI, trust in, auto in, in autonomous vehicles. So how do we strike that balance where we're, you know, as you, as, as you said in, in, uh, in your remarks, and as you, you helped co-found the, the, the National Security Commission on AI, which one of the findings was is we are falling behind China. So how do we strike that balance of maintaining the cutting edge while also staying true to our democratic values? Yeah, the, the great question. And you know, this is going to be a priority for us as a country. It needs to be, and we need to stay focused on that. Even though we recognize, unfortunately, you know, ex the ethics and morals in, in programming and use of data sets uh, are not going to be a priority for places like China and, uh, and, and Russia. Uh, we need to be true to our values, working with our partners and allies, being very forward-leaning as uh, AI uh, and machine learning technologies are develop to make sure that in the, in the programming uh, and the, the data sets, the use of data sets, that it's done ethically, responsibly, morally. We have an obligation to lead in this area. It needs to be uh, a, 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 a forethought rather than afterthought. It needs to be a priority and stated as such, and we need to really put our money where our mouths are. And of course, that's true where, where congressional oversight will just be uh, critically important. But again, I believe that the, the private sector has a has a critically important role to play here in, in partnering with us in that effort. One of the other issues that came up in previous panels is the, um, and it's well known, is the reform of the legacy DOD acquisition process. So to dig deeper into the JSIDS process, 
um, what recommendations are there to provide flexibility for dealing with um, non-traditional hardware or potentially software solutions uh, would you have, potentially if you're looking in the NDAA or I know USICA right now is being um, uh, conference, are there any opportunities there to reform certain processes to ease um, the engagement of small businesses in uh, the national security enterprise? Yeah, absolutely. I'm not sure what's going to come out of USICA and, uh, and the Competes Act that's in conference right now. Uh, hopefully we'd have some good things in there to bring down uh, barriers for allowing small businesses to be able to, uh, to do uh, business more easily with the, uh, with the federal government. But uh, yeah, the acquisition process uh, is, is cumbersome. Uh, it, it doesn't have the agility to move with the speed that we need to, but we need to make sure that going forward that it is much more uh, software centric as opposed to hardware centric. Uh, you know, I often think of, uh, you know, the F-35 is not, we shouldn't be looking at it as an airplane uh, that happened to have some computers on it. We need to look at it as a, uh, almost like a, a flying computer, uh, software focused, software centric, that happens to be wrapped in an airplane. And, uh, and that's the, the, the model that we're, we're moving toward and, and future acquisition will, I believe, be much more uh, uh, nimble. It'll, it'll be more uh, focused on, on open architecture and getting away from just the, you know, the big crimes uh, driving this, but also as upgrades come, as more, as numerous innovations, cutting edge innovations come about, uh, that will be more uh, easily able to integrate those uh, those changes, and they'll be done uh, quicker and uh, again less cumbersome, and he, again continue to give the the warfighter uh, every advantage that that they need. In, in the past, it was very difficult to do software upgrades, uh, for example, to major weapon systems. I can tell you that I was just on the phone. Uh, with one of the, uh, the the key leaders from Stratcom, uh, we were talking about uh, uh, the the, um, uh, the the ground-based uh, strategic uh, deterrent, as well as uh, the upcoming B21, and and it is much more uh, centric, software-centric, and it's going to be more open architecture, allowing for upgrades to happen uh, much more rapidly, and you're not going to be uh, stuck with the you know the expensive, cumbersome process that existed. Uh, in, in other major weapon systems. Yeah, and part of that integration, constant integration of software into these systems is closely linked to the, our abil the ability of Silicon Valley and, and innovators across the country to recruit the best talent. And interestingly, you know, China has really worked hard to, to keep you know, students that are studying here to come back, often through coercive measures or, or, or otherwise through you know, high, high salaries, right? And so we're now competing to, for as a nation to keep the best talent here um, in the United States. So as a leader on workforce development issues in the STEM field, I know you've, you've co-authored um, co and, and co-sponsored many amendments in, in the NDAA related to that. What is the congressional role in, in strengthening defense innovation workforce? And then how can we as the private sector help policymakers in that effort? Yeah, really critically important, right? And going forward, uh, it, it, we have all the uh, great, uh, you know, the best policies in place and uh, the right changes to say acquisition reform and uh, and and having you know both uh, the software and hardware innovations uh, bring them to maturity. But at the end of the day, it all comes down to people. And if we don't have the right people in place to develop the technologies to implement the policies, then we have already lost. So I've been working hard to make sure that uh, we're developing that talent. Uh, very big supporter of uh, STEM to STEAM initiatives, uh, especially starting with our, uh, our young people, young next generation, uh, encouraging our young people to think about a field and, uh, and working in the, in the STEM fields. But then also looking at you know, how uh, we're at our education system. You, you hit on a really key point where we educate so many people from around the world here and then we send them back home. It, it, we need to have a comprehensive immigration reform so that when people graduate, uh, if they want to stay here in the United States, they're going to go into key uh, critical national security fields and, and say STEM fields. Uh, they want to stay here and, and, and grow jobs here. We should be encouraging that and creating policies that will facilitate uh, that type of a transition. Uh, one of the things that, that I have, uh, am trying to do just by way of example 
the director of the CIA currently has the ability to grant a path to citizenship to people working in critical national security fields, as, uh, according to the way the, the, the director sees it. I want to give that same authority to the Secretary of Defense. There's no reason why we should be educating the best and the brightest and then sending them back to, uh, to foreign countries, particularly uh, in China, if, if, uh, if those individuals want to stay here and uh, we can offer them a path to citizenship. Uh, we should look for ways to do so. As long as we're not uh, uh, changing uh, the, the, the national security background checks and, and all the, you know, the dotting the I's and crossing the T's, uh, we, we want to make sure that if there's a way and it's in our national security interest to allow individuals to stay here, that there's a pathway to do so. Thank you so much, Chairman Langevin, for your, um, your comments and, and remarks. As I said before, this is the perfect capstone to a um, a very um, informative day, uh, so I really want to thank you for taking the time. I know you've got votes coming up, um, and so um, thank you again, Chairman Langevin. Thank you to our audience for your great questions. Uh, we wish you the best in your retirement, sir, uh, but first, uh, before that, we know there's a lot of work to do. Uh, NDAA is coming up, so wish you best of luck in that, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman and Nick. It's a great note to end the final session around bipartisanship for addressing concerns around national security and pushing forward initiatives for incorporating smaller, innovative companies into government projects. I know folks are a bit antsy to leave, but we're almost done with a final note coming up. To wrap up our program, please welcome back to the stage the co-founders of Applied Intuition, Kasser Yunus and Peter Ludwig. All right, uh, well. Oh, just Kasser. Great day. Uh, we're, we're, we're basically done here. Just two very quick uh, housekeeping points. First, the uh, Atlantic Council is going to do a number of thought pieces based on the material today. So keep a lookout on that. Uh, all of these conversations will be kind of uh, 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 broken down. And secondly, we're having a reception uh, at SPIN. Uh, the, uh, so please join us there. Uh, you can use your badge to, uh, to, to get in. But uh, thank you all for coming.